I got to make sure I can see everything. Hey, this is Troy Taylor, and this is the Championship Football Coaches Clinic to raise money for the uh, family initiative in Florida. Um, Coach Strollo is on here, and Coach, this is going to be uh, available for everybody to watch for many years later. And we're excited to have you on, Coach. How do you feel? Oh, I'm uh, I'm uh, honored to be uh, part of this, uh, you know, this effort. Uh, you know, at first when you asked me, I said, "Nah, I don't want to do another podcast because uh, you know I run. Out, I only got a couple of tricks, but when I heard it was uh, for a worthy cause, I I was honored to uh, be asked and uh, you know to to be the uh, lead batter. I guess I just got to get on first base and get this thing rolling. We got it, Coach. You want me to present the film? Well, I think uh, I think that if you just put that, can you get that sc- that first screen on there? Yes, sir. Okay. I got it up there right now. Fundamentals, Coach. Okay, and I'm just going to talk a little bit because you know me; I like to talk. Okay, but I promise you, it won't be it won't be much. Okay, and uh, these are just things that I've said to coaches and players over the over the years. Uh, the first thing I want to want to share is. Teachers teach ideas, but coaches teach habits. Mm. Okay, and uh, I ha- a habit is something you do without thinking about it, and uh, that's what we want to establish. Okay, we have these these drills, and I want to show you not only uh, not only practice tape. Now, this thing is this video I put together seven years ago. Okay, it's only thirteen minutes long, but I can stretch it out to about four or five hours if you need me to. <laughs> OK, uh, but, you know, we're, we're trying to establish habits. OK, and, and our habits are very particular. W- one thing I want to say is don't tell me about it. Show me. OK, mm. and, and that's why that's why we uh, we look at the video and we see if we're if we're using these so-called habits. We call our habits fundamentals. Do you have that fundamentals thing? OK, you have yes, that sir. screen. Yes, sir. OK. So our fundamentals have evolved over the years. I used to talk about having a big chest and all this. But right now, where it's been uh, probably for the last three or four years, and I haven't coached but for a while. (laughs) I haven't coached in three years, but people call me all the time. The number one fundamental is to protect your own chest, okay? Don't allow an opponent to get inside your hands to your chest or your armpits, okay? That's very important. Because he can, he can only apply force to a surface. If one of the surfaces is the ground, the other one is you. And if you if you deny him a, a good circuit surface to anchor himself against, he can't he can't develop any force, or he can't develop force that can affect you. So it's very important that we protect our chest. The next fundamental. Can you hear me, okay, Coach? Because yes, sir, you're great. I know I'm a little spitty sometimes, but. The next fundamental is we call it condensing, okay? And what that means is we want to have short arms and short legs to shorten up. Our arms and legs are levers, okay? Any wrestler will tell you that. And and levers, uh, the, the, the basic idea of a, a lever, a lever exchanges length for strength, okay? Or length for torque, okay? So when you have long arms and long legs, you, you lose some ability to generate torque. Now, you know, you can go look it up yourself or whatever, but I'm just telling you, and you'll see it on the video, what we're talking about. And the third fundamental we talk about all the time is traction. We want, we want to make sure that our feet get on the ground. And we're very, we're very particular about how our feet get on the ground. Okay. I'm one of these guys that, uh, is, is a toes out, knees out guy. And I'll show you our guys doing that. Hey, Coach. Yes, sir. I'm going to add Bro Scott on here, Coach, in case he has any questions. Well, <laughs> hey, Bro, you're, you're on here with us. You got your mic, you got your mic uh, silenced. So if you have any I'm questions. On, I'm on. You guys hear me? Yo. Yeah. How Special you doing? Special guest, Coach, for you. I'm doing good. We're at, we're, at our, uh, we're at our golf tournament right now. So That's dedication, ain't it? Coach Strollo, are you proud of them? I, I, I tell you what, I'll guarantee you they're all drinking beer. <laughs> we are all drinking beer, coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, 
It's probably Labatt's too, or something like that. <laughs> I, I know it didn't bun light. <laughs> hey guys, this is the greatest O line coach in the history of football yeah. at any level. <laughs> this guy taught me. I'm you know, I was a quarterback my, back a hundred years ago, and this guy taught me everything I know about football. I, I'm sitting in my underwear. I just finished cleaning the house. There, there you go. <laughs> that doesn't tell you everything about me. <laughs> well, oh God. Well, good. I tell you what, you shocked the hell out of me the other day when you guys called. I'm like, who the heck is this with the beard and all that? What you know? That's a it's a good look though. Yeah, I'm old now. How old are you? How old are you? 46. Oh, God, you're almost done. Hey, and Coach, tell everybody how good of a sander I am and did your hardwood floors the one year. We still talk about that. You were incredible. Yeah. It was you and Dave, right? Yeah, I believe it was. Yeah, and what, I, I, I gave you like a, a six-pack of beer and, a, and 10 bucks or something. It was great. I think it was just the six-pack. So just a six pack. I I'm a cheap son of a gun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Well, how about that? Hey, that was I tell you what, you guys, I learned so much from you guys. You know, I just to this day I can't, you know, I can't thank you enough. I tr I try to stay in contact with Kaz and uh you know, I, I just thought he was wonderful. But uh not to get not to get into history here, but you know, it was just that was a great time in my life. And uh, I don't know. It saved, me, it saved my career, I'll tell you that, just being there. So whatever career I've had, it's part well, of it was well, there. It, 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 I can't hear you, man. It made my career, Coach. It made my career. I said well, it made my thank, career coaching with you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's 100% true, but uh, – you know, thank you for the compliment. But uh, let me get back to this here clinic thing. I, I wrote all. I, I was up till eleven o'clock last night practicing this this, this uh, thirteen minute tape. So I'm going to get through it. But uh, all right, going back to the fundamentals, we talked about protect the chest, condense, which means just make yourself tighter. You know, like a like a ice skater. She she brings her her hands in together. She the tighter her hands get, the faster she spins. We believe that that a condensed body uh, maximizes the the ability to accelerate. And this game and every other game you can think of, including golf, the game is about acceleration. How fast you can start, how fast you can stop, and how fast you can change direction. As a matter of fact, Keith Gaither sent me an article about a, an NFL coach that uh, wants to know he, he, he's uh, grading receivers. He wants to know how quickly they can stop. And I'm just telling you, the game is about acceleration. And when you condense, you accelerate easier. Okay. Now these fundamentals establish a blocking integrity. Now I know I'm, I, if McNally hears this, he's going to yell at me, but he used to call, blocking integrity a demeanor he had bigger steps and all that we're, we're really we're really concerned with acceleration so everything we do is tight smaller uh, you know we'll extend our arms at times uh, as a matter of fact quite often but we do it for a reason a specific reason but we we want to maximize acceleration by ex establishing a blocking integrity and let me give you an example of an integrity. I use a uh, an analogy called splash. Okay, and and splash. Uh, I want you to think of a water balloon, a five pound water balloon, and a five pound rock. They both have weight. They both weigh five pounds. When you throw them against the wall, the water balloon bursts. And why is that? Because it doesn't have integrity. The rock does. The rock will bounce. It might break. If you throw it hard enough, it might break the wall. And that's what we want it to do. We want the wall to lose its integrity. Okay. So these drills, they develop a blocking integrity. Now, let me go to, um, let me start this thing going. Okay. So, so you just learned fundamentals, acceleration, and integrity, everybody. Hopefully the five guys that are listening to this thing, will, <laughs> hopefully will, will continue. Okay, so we're going here. Now this, 
is a chorus line drill. And I got this idea from Bob Wiley. He said, make Ooh. everybody do everything all the time at the same time and watch the good ones. Just coach mm. the good ones. Let the other ones – I put the other ones in the back here. Can you see this uh, stylus moving around? Yes. Okay. So these are not the good ones. Okay. <laughs> these, these are These are the good ones, okay? And what you're looking at – now the footwork patterns don't really matter in this in this particular footwork pattern. We're trying to keep an open leg. We're turning left. We're practicing arc blocking, and we're trying to keep an open leg. What really matters is this: that they stay in that integrity, condensed with their hands protecting their chest, okay, and getting their feet slammed into the ground, okay. So. You see them plant to turn. They're turning their shoulders. Here's a good shot of those hands. Now, we used to use uh, tennis balls. We called them meatballs. And I got the idea from watching my wife make meatballs. I, literally, I swear, swear to goodness, I was sitting there. So, uh, you know, we started using tennis balls. But I got kind of tired of them rolling around all over the place. So we said, okay, we're just going to hook our thumbs together. And that, that hooking of the thumbs is a little passive, but it's not too passive. But I had some of these knuckleheads that would – they'd hold the ball in one hand and they'd make believe they were rolling it, okay? And if you know anything about my, my videos and drills, you know that we use this uh, meatball idea, okay? But if you watch these guys, what they're doing, they're staying in that integrity. They're staying – they're maintaining that fundamental, okay? And uh, – Okay, now this is uh, Gronkowski, and this is DeMarcus Ware. They both have talent, okay? They're both probably as good as it gets. This was, this was a good 10 years ago, maybe longer. And Ware just, just thumps uh, Gronkowski. And what I want to know is why. Was it the talent? Was it what? When you watch him, he's, he's going to get harpooned here. He gets driven back. Okay, and, and where it gets off of him. And, you know, hey, maybe Gronkowski didn't hear the snap count. Maybe he's, his foot hurt. Maybe he was thinking about his girlfriend. I don't know. All I know is what I see on the video. And I don't really care how he's, what's, you know, what he's thinking or how he feels. All I know is, is where it just killed her back. Okay, I don't like man blocking, uh, especially for tight ends. And, and you, if you look at this, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to man block the nine technique and get outside of it. Now, I don't mind man blocking the nine technique and getting inside of it, but I don't, you know, I, I don't mean to tell Bill Belichick what he's doing, but I think it's, I think it's, we're pissing up a rope uh, with this thing. And in this particular case, I'm right. Uh, you know, they don't, I don't think Bill Belichick really gives a hoot, but uh, we'll go back. And now we're just, we're just talking about stomping. And again, you see those here. You can see the hook thumbs right here. This guy's got his elbows out. You know, he's down the line or this guy was, I don't know. He was dazed and confused. These three were pretty good. All three of them are walk-ons. They all wound up full scholarships. This might be the best player I ever coached, but they were all walk-ons. Nobody wanted them but me. Okay. And there we're just stomping and we accelerate. And there we go. We're just trying to maintain that integrity. Okay, here's a side shot of Gronkowski. He's got plenty of time here to, to get into some sort of an integrity. But if you watch this thing very carefully, see if it, he's, he's flopping around with his hands. I can't quite get it to freeze where I want it. Okay, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to try and get it to freeze where I want it. Coach, if you, use the air, if you use the arrow keys on your keyboard, it'll go back in four, ten seconds. Oh, yeah? What, how do I do that? Let me see. On your keyboard, yeah, and then and then the space the space bar will pause it. The kids taught me that, Coach. That's how I watch film on YouTube. All right, let's see. Oh, okay, ten seconds, and then we'll. Yeah, the problem is it went it went back yeah, a little too far. far, but but that's all right. Let's let's. Uh, does it go forward ten seconds? All right, yeah, we'll just run this thing right a little here. bit. Okay, there's nothing wrong with watching it twice. Well, let's let's just watch and see if I can get this this Gronkowski character. Okay, I can't ca I can't catch it right, but maybe I can just catch it with this this bar right here. Yeah. Okay. No. All 
He's he's got his hands in a pretty good position, but he they're spread. Okay, and Ware is locked out, and they both have teeter, and Ware gets into his chest. And, and if you watch his hands, Gronkowski's hands, and everybody can get this video and watch it on, on YouTube. But he's you can see him, he's activating his hands, he's making circles. Okay, and that's reminiscent of, of uh, a pretty good video I saw that Bill Callahan did. But in this particular instance, he he doesn't protect his chest and he gets he gets driven back he gets harpooned okay and i i don't want to know how good he is i don't want to know how good where is all i want to know is what happened i'm kind of like one of those democrat politicians i don't care who won i don't care why they won all i want to do is win and watching the thing over and over and over again it it, it made me think that if gronkowski had protected his chest a little better uh, he would execute better. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the uh, to the chorus. Okay, and now we're going to work. Which is unfortunately they were coaches that I, that was paying my salaries, and they you know some of them liked it when it worked, when it didn't work they complained about it. But the problem I will admit about skipping is it's hard to stay condensed. You can see these guys are popped up a little bit. OK, but it, it gets you look at this guy, but it gets you further on two steps than than it will uh, than taking three steps with a shuffle or any kind of lead step. It's just the way it is. OK, um, but again, we're trying to control our hands more than anything. We're trying to stay fundamental so you can use any any footwork you want. The point I'm trying to make is just skip I, skipping. I have a soft spot for skipping and I, I like it. But, you know, I made a, I made a, uh, a statement that uh, this integrity and acceleration is the key to all sport. I'm talking golf. Baseball guys up at bat, his arms aren't straight. He's that, bat, he, that bat's on his shoulder and his arms are bent. Now, he straightens it on the full swing, but first he accelerates it, and he can accelerate that long bat easier with short arms. Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to go to one of my Penn State guys. Now, th this guy right here played pro football. Uh, he was a freshman All-American. And what he's going to run is a stick route off of this, uh, off of this linebacker. And we, we try to talk about no straight lines. We want to accelerate. We want to zigzag. We want to attack this guy the whole bit. But watch his hands and feet, okay? And he comes rolling off the – this is practice, obviously. He comes – there's about there's about eight uh, NFL players in this – in this uh, you know, Donovan, uh, this guy started, this guy played. I mean, there's a bunch of NFL guys uh, playing in this thing. Uh, I don't even know who all these defensive guys are, but, but trust me, there's some starters in there. So this is no joke, okay? Our practices were very interesting. You can see him burst, okay, his arms are longer. He's sort of sprinting, but then he comes under control. Okay. And he tightens up his hands and his feet and comes out of the break. Now he's going to drift a little bit, which I don't, you know, I don't, I don't like that he's doing this to me. Okay. Back to Gronkowski getting murdered. Okay, and more, more, more. Why, why is this skipping all of a sudden? Can I lose everybody? Uh, you, you were, um, you were pausing a little bit, Coach. It's because of the internet, but it's okay. Okay, all right. You see him. You can see his body position integrity here he's going to use his hands and his feet and, and the shortness of his limbs to change direction he's going to plant that foot and snap those shoulders and he gets undercut here a little bit okay uh, which is not good he should be coming downhill here but he catches the ball and as soon as he catches it he tries to plant and get upfield he's he's everything he's doing is very very concise and we practice this, okay? We practice this. We don't – this isn't just him going out there and having fun, okay? And I didn't know – I didn't know, 
you know, very much about running routes and, you know, opening windows and all that other stuff. But I knew about acceleration and I knew enough to, to coach this, uh, this type of, of movement, this concise integrity of, uh, and fundamental movement to get a maximum out of the talent that we had. Now, now this next guy uh, started for the Steelers. He's six seven. He's I don't know who he's playing for now. He's playing for somebody. He's six seven. He's two sixty, and he's going to run a juke route. But what I want you to watch. This is six seven two sixty. This guy, the, you know, he he's amazing. He he tightens up his hands. He's planting his feet. He's shrinking himself down. Now I'm six three. He's six seven. What do you think his height wise is right here? Maybe uh, four feet, five feet, five feet probably. Okay, and he's coming out of the break and planting and catching the ball. And now I didn't like the way he finished, but he I didn't tell him very much. He was only a sophomore here, but I didn't tell him very much because, you know, he he was going to be a millionaire and I knew it. He did, he lasted three years at Penn State and went into the draft. Okay, so. This is this is Adam Brenneman, who who uh, was a true freshman here, okay. And I want you to really study this thing. How am I doing here? You're doing great, Coach. Keep it up. Okay. Well, I'm screwing. This you only up. got at least an hour and a half left, Coach. You're good. We got plenty of time. Okay. Well, I'm screwing this up. I I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, okay. you're at just, you're at three minutes. This whole thing. No, nah, Coach, you're fine. You're right there. Okay. Well, this my internet is messing up. I did this all night last night, and it worked great. Okay. So, do what I want to do. It's just sad. Okay. Here's Jesse again running the juke. I got yelled at, by the way, because tight ends don't run jukes. And I just said that I'm, I'm, I'm going to coach this thing up and run it. Okay, so here's Adam. He's going to run his juke. Now watch his – ah, shit. Sorry, guys. I don't mean to cuss, but it's, – it's, it's damn frustrating. I probably have this stuff on need, some hard drive somewhere. We need to invent a cowboy clicker for YouTube. Yeah, no doubt. But anyway, so Adam Brenneman, he's running a stick route, and you can't see it. I'm not going to run it back, but he puts his hand right in this guy's chest. And you can see him come downhill out of the break. Okay, and these are just scout guys, but they're pretty good. This guy played pro football too, and so did he. But they were just freshmen. These are all three freshmen. I got some guy throwing him the ball. Watch him plant. OK, and lower his shoulders and come out of the break. And that's all coached. That's all being coached. And it's fundamental. He is trying to maintain that fundamental integrity. OK, now here he is doing it in a game against Georgia Tech. We lost the damn game, but we shouldn't have. We had the freshman quarterback. He should have ran for first down. He he uh, decided to throw it. But run the same same thing. Stick right off the linebacker. Okay, comes out, puts a hand in the chest, pushes off. Okay, I'm told that that's not legal, but we did it. I don't care. And he come downhill, nice downhill. He's way downhill, never going to get undercut. And he accelerates upfield and he gets us. He gets us a penalty too. That was good. Okay, all right. So what I'm saying to you is that that's route running. You say, well, what's that got to do with blocking? I say it's got everything to do with blocking. It's just the way it is. Now, here's the ubiquitous scoot. And I I don't like to blow my own horn. I'm, I'm laughing here, but I invented this. I didn't actually invent it. A kid that played for me at Elon invented it, and I stole it from him. But if, you, if you're if you using it, it came from me. <laughs> All right. So, and what it is, is, is how do you get in front of somebody who's not in front of you? Okay. And if you watch, watch here, this is Jake, who's a pretty good player. And he will... Um, he will show you everything there is to know about, about the scoot. Okay. Uh, I'm just – do we lose you again? Okay. Yeah, you, okay. You see I the feet? I ain't falling asleep yet, Coach. All right. The feet are stepping deep. 
and he's going to go into what we call a teeter. But I want you to notice that line. See where his head is? He is moving his feet. He is not moving his weight backwards. Do not coach this technique without hitting somebody or something. And that somebody should be moving. Okay, he should be attacking him. You can see this guy's moving a little bit. But what he what what this is where the concept of playing long came in. I used to be um, I used to let them play with low hands. Okay, and um, got that term from Paul Alexander at one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, cool clinics, the, the fi- Friday night undercard, and. Uh, he was he was talking about low hands and when when I went to Penn State I had these six foot seven guys and I said you know what sometimes they get locked out like Gronkowski I'm not going to let them play with low hands anymore I'm let, I'm going to let them play what we called long at the time and this is actually one long arm and one sh- strong arm so one arm is longer and one arm is bent and stronger one hand has got its thumb in the long arm and the elbow out. And one hand has got his thumb out and elbow in. And what we found that we would protect our chest better, okay, using this technique. And you can see he got he got pretty good contact with that hand right away. And it it didn't allow it didn't allow the defender to to intrude in his chest. Okay, now that defender's holding the ball, but now look at look at the feet. You can see the whole foot is on the ground. The toe is out. The knees are out. If he was climbing a tree, his dick would be right up against that tree. When you put your toes straight ahead and your knees straight ahead, your butt comes away from that tree. This is a line of force, okay? It's actually the force is being applied here. So the line of force is where his feet are hitting the ground and where he's hitting that ball. That's a pretty damn straight line. We want to get those hips as close as we can to that line of force. We do that because we have good integrity with the hands, the feet, and the limbs. And he gets pretty good jack on this kid's, kid's three hundred pound kid. He gets pretty good jack on him, you know. And we're we're a little we're a little uh, unrealistic here with this, you know, letting them drive that thing that far. Anybody that drives it that far, hell, that's all we're going to do. Now here's big boy with low hands, okay, and I wasn't coaching low hands at this point. I had given up on it, okay, but he, you know, he, I was gone for two years, and, and uh, you know, low hands was something that, that we had done earlier when I was there, and uh, he's, you can see him get intruded here, believe it or not, you know, to me, that, that is a, uh, Okay, Jake, he's got he's got full control of that ball. That ball is hitting him right in the face. Okay, and he looks good. It looks good. He lifts the guy off the ground, all that. But and he's got his hands tight, so he he's got a good chance. But this it illustrates the problem with using hooked arms. We call them hooks. Okay, they're short. They're strong, but they're short. Okay, it's just the way it is. So what we did was we started using one long and one strong, and that was better. And we use we stopped using low hands. We started using high hands, okay. And I didn't use the term high hands at the time, okay. But that's what that's what what it is. That's high hands. And that's low hands. Looks good, but it ain't the same, okay. Now here he goes back here. Now watch this. He's going to use the low hands again. He's going to get stalled. He's going to get stalled and. and by stalled means he's he's lost his ability to deliver force. He's he's you could almost argue that he's getting splashed here. Okay, he just runs out of gas. He can't he can't generate enough force. Okay, and to me again, you know what we're talking about now. Here he is, the same kid, and this time he's going to use the long and the strong, the mixed hands. It's the exact, exact same kid. What's the difference? Okay, he's got control of that thing. He's protecting himself. Now, you could say, well, his face mask is still hitting the ball. That may be, but he has got control of that defender. Okay, he's not going to stall. And you can see it now. He switches back to two low, two low hands, which is fine with me. And I like that. Now, here we go with uh, with Jesse, number 18. This is this is the big, the big, fresh, uh, big tight end. 
And what he's going to do, we're, we're playing Wisconsin, and there's that there's that tight defense that you were talking about. I, I got, believe me when I tell you, they were playing two four eyes and a zero. And maybe this, because this was the cage guy that he was playing a little wider, but they were giving us fits with this thing. And I was only coaching the tackle and the tight end, so don't don't look at me. Uh, but it was it's a, this is a tough front uh, to run zone against. I, I'd rather run Grace. But what 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 Jesse's doing here because this guy's in a cage, he's going to plow him, okay? And, and we're saying that the back is going to go right right where Jesse was lined up, and he's got. In a way, and I got this from Paul Alexander too, but he's blocking down to the outside. Look at his hands and look at look at Donovan's hands. This is this guy's been starting for Tampa Bay for like the last 10 years. Okay. But you can see his hands. And now, of course, Donovan's got, you know, a beast here, and, and Jesse's got a weenie, but he puts him, puts him right. And we call this plowing. It's just like plowing snow. He keeps both hands on. He tries to drive the guy to the sideline to give the back the path. Okay. And we're not going to try and cross this guy. Okay. And, and you know, there was some, there was some controversy about that, but we're not going to try and cross a nine technique. That's, that's, that's caging us. We're just not going to do it. It's, it's a waste of time. But to me, okay, there, there we go again. To me, who cares? All all that running back is going about one, what, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six yards off the hash mark. Let's see if we deliver it to him. Why do we got to get outside of 36? Here's the, here's the six yards of the hash mark. He, he damn near crosses it. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about read spot. We want the back to bring the linebackers to the blockers, not vice versa. We don't. We want the back to be very concise and, you know, we he has to have integrity too. But anyway, plowing that guy to the sideline, it opened up the inside. Now, you can argue and say that, uh, well, if we got it outside, blah, blah, blah. And I say, yeah, if you can get it outside of Jet 9 that's Cajun, why, why don't we do that every down? Okay, we just saw uh, a couple minutes ago Gronkowski trying to get it outside the Marcus Ware. Uh, I don't know. I ain't doing it. Okay. But here we go. Now here's Jesse with a, with a nine, not really a jet nine. This is practice. And he's going to, what we call match. He's not going to cross the, the helmet. He's not covering here. He's not trying to get on the outside of this guy. He's going to match him and try to plow him to give the back. We want the back to run right there. Okay. And what happens is because his hand placement is so good. Okay. Uh, he he gets a pretty good uh, flip on this guy, and you can see his toes are out, and he's doing doing it the way we want. I'd like to see him a little more condensed, but that's one of the problems with flipping is sometimes you uncondense. Um, it's just the way it is. Let's see if I can get it, get it again. Uh, I don't. I went too far. Okay. So here he is again. Pretty good. He's got his toe out. He's got his knee out. He's got his knee in, knee over his toe in that direction. Okay, we're not going straight ahead. We think that this, we call this the big tree. We think these this is easier to establish roots and gives us better integrity. Okay, there's the flip. We jacked this guy up pretty good. We got a nice, uh, a nice forward lean, and he's trying to bring his feet now and lift him out of there, and he gets slung a little bit because he doesn't bring his feet. Okay. All right. Now uh, that was a nine technique. Now I'm gonna watch. I'm, uh, we're gonna watch 62, and 62 should be. We're running C gap here. <coughs> Almost every one of these plays is a C gap play. I can't think. I, I don't think there's one play that's not a C gap. And C gap to us is butt of the tight end somewhere out here. We're trying to get to this guy, and we say that these guys are in the stovepipe. He's a match blocker. These guys are all Apaches, and by Apaches, we want to encircle the defense. Now, this guy's supposed to encircle. He's supposed to – we let him. We let these guys skip, but we, we, we think the center's too close to the line of scrimmage to skip. Now, he'll skip when he's 
was in the, when he's in red light. But right now, his gap is green light. He's got a guy in his gap. He's got to go. And instead of encircling, he goes to cover. Okay? And he winds up, this guy, he, he makes contact. What I'm saying is too quickly. And now he's caught, this guy is trying to shed him to the outside, and he's got to go into the plow, and he forces the back back over here. And it's a problem because that guy didn't get cover either. He's supposed to get Apache. And we're arcing this guy and reading him, by the way. Okay. So we got a problem there, and we send the ball back to this guy and that guy because we didn't get the Apache. Okay. Is everybody following me? Yes, sir. Okay. So we, we you know, even though it looks good, we don't like it. Now, he's got a plow. This guy's Cajun. He's got a plow. We got a problem there, okay? But we, we need an Apache. We need this guy to vanish. And we got the, the guard backing him up if the guy cuts the other way. But you can see the back's got his – he's like, oh, man, geez, I got to cut up in here and I get blasted by this dude. And, you know, it's a mess. But, you know, we get a couple of yards out of it. So what are you supposed to do? Look good, though. Okay, now circular force – is something I want to talk about. We we started studying Tai Chi. Now, don't, you know, everybody else does karate, whatever. We started studying Tai Chi because of the word circular force. Okay, in Tai Chi, uh, they everything they do is in circles. Okay, they circle their hands. And we started to realize that by circling, we could develop force by torquing our trunk and that force would keep us rooted and condensed. Okay, so I'm just we just started developing some drills for this. Okay, and here's the first drill. This is just we're 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 literally throwing a box or hook. Okay, but notice we're condensed, we're rooted. Our hands we got one hand on the man, a long hand, and we got a strong hand. Okay, so we're in in, in this sense we're practicing torque and possibly throwing the man sideways. But watch watch who gets splashed and who stays rooted. And to me, now this guy's getting moved. He ain't, these guys, not one of these guys is splashed. Every one of them. The knee is down, the feet are rooted, and it's all from torque. And that torque is developed from pulling the shoulder. Okay? We're pulling the shoulder back and pushing this shoulder forward, it's a seesaw, and it's centering us. It's making us go into the ground, okay? You can see, I mean, you can call it whatever you want. You can tell me I'm full of shit, but I'm not, okay? Uh, and you can see it on video, okay? You can see they don't move. These guys are getting splashed, okay? They're staying condensed. They're staying, their, their knees are bent. This, the, this knee is rolling down. This knee is rolling down. And they're pulling that shoulder as hard as they can, this shoulder. And what we learned is it's called synchronized diagonal antagonists. So we're using the back of the right arm, the lat. The lat's the prime mover. And the front, you know, the uh, the uh, abdominals, the pecs, the, the deltoids. And I, I was talking to a, a martial arts guy, and he says, no, it's the hips. It's the hips. It don't, the hips are part of the integrity. They have to be a rock, but it's the torque of that trunk, okay? Now, here, this guy, we start higher, okay? And we're going to try – now, we're, Now here we're doing a, a little bit more of a throw, okay? And, again, we're in the match area. This is 65. He, this kid is six foot six and about 340, but he's he's about six foot three and about 300, and he benches 500. Okay, these guys are really remarkable players. But we're throwing. We Again, we like to do this on the run in the match area or in pass protection. We don't like to do it in the stovepipe because we don't, we don't give enough options to the running back. You can see him pulling that arm off. Okay. He winds up taking a little step, which I don't mind. And he gets us pretty good. He doesn't even have to plow because he throws the guy so hard. He just throws him. Okay. And we know that in order to maintain contact, because in the run game, you've got to maintain contact. You can throw and let it go in the pass. 
In the run game, you got to maintain contact because that guy will back, he'll backtrack on you. He goes to one hand because he knows one hand's longer than two. Okay? I hope that makes sense to you. Now, here's me and Aaron, and we're just fooling around. And, you know, obviously we're, we're making this video. Uh, and what we're talking about is a braced two-handed strike. Okay? And the, the difference between a braced two-handed strike and a uh, – and a, uh, you know, sort of like what we would call a hammer and the uh, the one handed or or circular force. OK, so this is this is linear force. Now, all these are torques, but we're not torquing the trunk. You know, the, the arms are torquing the whole bit. This is all torque, but the trunk is not torquing. OK, so it felt pretty good. You know, he splashed me, but he needed a brace. OK. And, or he'd knock himself back. Now I say, okay, let's forget about the brace. Let's go to a, to a circular force, okay? And he, he kind of surprised me. I say, look, we can condense more, get down, okay? Now he's going to give me a quick, a quick six-inch punch. And watch my – don't even watch him. Just watch me, okay? Boom. He splashes me just a little with that little six-inch punch. That is the – what is that guy, the, the famous Bruce Lee? That's yeah, the six-inch yeah. – that's it right yeah, there. Yeah. I've been and studying if you, him. If you, if you take that – one of those Bruce Lee uh, uh, YouTube things, there's a guy I – I think I sent it to you. Uh, the guy talks about the six-inch punch. Well, he talks about shoulder rotation, and that condensing – and rooting and staying in, in fundamental, staying with integrity, it develops a lot, lot of force, man. It's a watch hand and shoulder. Not this one. Watch this one. Boom. He pulls it back, and the knee goes forward. Now, that this second one, he shocks me a little bit because, you know, he, he – He's giving me the long arm now. Okay. So here's the shot. Now watch this thing. Look at me. And he ain't moving an inch. He's not being splashed. He's pulling that arm and shoulder back. He's hitting this thing radiant, concentric to the ball. Look what it does to me. My, my teeth rattle. I mean, I'm like, oh, my God. You know, I'm splashed. And you know, I, I right there, I was probably weighing about 270. And he doesn't even move, okay? And, you know, you say, well, I'm not condensed. Well, no shit I'm not condensed. He is. By him being condensed, <clears throat> and I don't like to say low man wins because he can lay on the floor and be lower than me. He ain't going to win anything. I like to say condensed because it's precise, okay, and fundamental. But he's got that integrity, okay? He gives me another one. And I'm, I'm laughing because literally my teeth are chattering. Okay, I'm like, oh, I wish I had a mouthpiece in. Okay, he shocks the hell out of me. Now, now here, he hits it off center, and this is again why we want a quiet, high hands because we don't want to miss the target. But he misses off center, and it's sort of like hitting a slice in golf. It doesn't, it doesn't move me quite as much. It, it induces a rotation on me. Okay, but here's going to land a good one. Bing. And, and I'm like, you, I'm like, you little prick. He's my friggin' G8. And I'm like, you little bastard. You're, you're, you're jacking, you know, you're fooling around and trying to, you know, rough me up. I said, okay, you know, now we're, now you've had enough fun. So let's, let's, let's change. Now here, he's not as condensed. Okay. If you look at him, he, he's not as condensed. I mean, you, you want me to go back? I'll show you the, the, the Okay, he came out of that a little bit. But see him here? He's condensed. He's got everything in, in line. And, and if you go look over here in the dress shirt, he's, his butt's a little high, and he doesn't have that, that power line. He doesn't have it. Okay? Oop. So because he's not condensed, 
Okay, see the butt's out. The knee is behind the toe. Uh, this one's almost straight. He's even got a little bit of a stagger going. He's just not going to be able to do it. Okay, he's going to watch it. Watch him recoil a little bit. He gets condemned. He gets splashed a little bit. Now here's me just doing it slow. I'm not even. I'm not even striking him. I'm just pushing. Okay. Sometimes we'll do that. We'll push rather than strike. Okay. But I'm just sort of rotating, and I just I move them. I move them again. I don't move. My knee goes down. I go a little harder. I'm splashing him all over the place. Now I'm saying, okay, when I'm not condensed, I'm not going to have – it's going to require more strength. So now I'm going get, to get that condensed, and I'm getting that nice posture. I look pretty good there, huh? Give me a scholarship. What do you think, bro? Are you still there, bro? You look yeah, like a Boston just, College guy, Coach. I, 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 I would – would give you two scholarships, oh. Coach. Two? Two I just, scholarships. Oh, I, oh, as a matter of fact, I'd walk on if you give me a meal ticket. How's that? Oh, the calf's great up here in New Hampshire. I, I'll bet you. I'll bet you this. Yeah, all those you get a lot of them fat boys. I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing though. New Hampshire. What a great, what a great program over the hundred hundred years when Bill started with Bill Bowes, and what a great program, man. I tell you. You, you should see the culture up here. It's freaking unbelievable. And I wanted to see, you know, I was down in Virginia for so long, and these guys kept winning up here, and I wanted to see it and how, how they do it. And it, it's unbelievable, Coach. Unbelievable. And it's wor hard work, and it's there's no secret formula. It's just hard work every day. It's, it's unbelievable. Those, those, and I, I got to attest now, after I got fired at Northeastern, well, we all got fired. I hate to say me. We all got fired. I asked Coach Booz, uh, if I could come to one of their practices and, you know, I was, first thing I was impressed is they were tremendous size, but the discipline and the integrity and the work ethic was incredible. And we, we had good kids at Northeastern. We had, and they worked, and, but coach Bose, he just started something and, you know, coach McDonald and, and, you know, so many great coaches come out of that thing. Uh, and now we got another one. We got bro Scott, but, you know, it, it just – I can't say enough about that place. But anyway, getting back, back to me. Okay, I'm just pulling that shoulder back. We call this the seesaw, okay? It's a class one lever. We're, we're literally – this is a lever, okay? You pull back on this, this goes forward. You push forward on this, this goes backward. We're doing it at the same time. It's just like two fat kids on a seesaw. Okay, going up and down. The knee goes down. We stay condensed. All right, boom, there's another one. I'm just pushing. I'm not really slamming it. I don't move. He does. There I go. Okay. And I'm just talking. Now, watch this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a brace stagger, okay, without any shoulder torque, no circular force here. And what I wind up doing is teetering forward, I'm doing what we call falling in the pool, okay? Uh, let me see. I've kind of lost my spot here on my uh, – hang on a second. Okay. And I'm falling – what we call falling in the pool. You know, like you guys, I know you pool pests. You, you walk over and you, you push some girl into the pool, okay? If you push her with circular force, you won't fall in, Okay. But if you push her like this, she'll grab you and pull you in with her. And that's how you get slung. This is where we sort of stop pushing with two hands um, way back when. And, you know, there's still a there's still a, a place for that. But we, we want to have an angle when we do that, okay? Uh, you know, we want to be plowing the guy or, or hammering him when he's tied up with somebody else. Uh, we don't like blocking like this, okay? But anyway um, – Going, I'm falling in the pool, and I, you know, I, of course I know what I'm doing, and I don't fall in the pool. There ain't no swimming pool here anyway. But uh, I go back now. Now here's this is plain old. This is plain old man hook. I buy the man hook. Okay, I don't buy the man zone. I buy the man hook. And these are pretty good players now. And one of these guys is over here, and this is me giving directions. These are pretty good players. I think this is this is our GA. Tim Kelly's over here. He's he's now the offensive coordinator for the Titans. 
And he was coaching these guys in this drill. And uh, so we just we just get our hands on this dude and walk around the block and twist them, and there we go. That's what it is, okay? And now we've now we're essentially blocking down to the inside. The problem is the back can't go here; he has to go outside. Okay, that's that's the difference between zone and and plain old hook. Okay, so now we got same same thing. And in this drill, we always had to face a six technique. I, you know, it just was such a pain in the ass. You know, because the six technique will dominate tight ends should, um, but when we we did a two on two. It, it, it was usually a different story. This guy started five years for the Seahawks. And I think this guy was drafted. I'm not sure. This might, this guy, I think played for, uh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Okay. So what's going to happen here is 18 and the defensive end gets stalemated and they create a four legged animal. Okay. Here's one leg, two legs. Here's three legs, four legs. They create a four legged animal. And to me, that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good matchup, a stalemate with this guy. We'd like to run him off the ball and all that, but if we could do that every down, that's all we would do, okay? But he gets stalemated, and Gary winds up with a hammer. It's not a great hammer, okay? I'll take I, – I coached this, so I screwed him up. But he's got an open leg to the linebacker. We stopped scooping this thing because the run through, you know, he would, he would uh, commit to the scoop – we push this thing over here, the, the run through would come under and, and kill us. So what we wanted to do is give this kid some help. And this started way back when we were Duke versus Virginia Tech. This is this is where this came from. I used to call this just plain old cow tipping, but now we differentiate cow tipping from hammering. But he winds up with an open leg to the linebacker, and he gives just enough help to get this guy to get a torque in. And the linebacker makes a mistake, and the back says, hey, I'll go right in here. And he does. Okay? And that's what happens. Okay? So what we're trying to do, when we get a six technique on a tight end or a four technique or on the tackle or a two-eye or a two, a tight shade, we, we call that yellow light. We're not sure. He's a two-gap player, and we're not sure which gap he's playing. He can easily attack either gap. We don't like that. We either like them in the gap or we like nobody in the gap. We like it to be a red light or a green light. But a yellow light, we want to define. We want to make sure that we define. And, and, and what we're going to do, what we're going to talk about here is using our hands to define people. Okay? So here we're going we're gonna to, sh we're shuffling. This is not a high leg or any of that other stuff. We're shuffling first because we're not sure really what's happening. Okay? And we don't want to commit because if we commit directly to this guy, he might he might split us. So we want to cover the distance. Imagine that there's a tackle here, and this is a guard, and we're gonna we're gonna shuffle first by stepping deep, and we're gonna go into the hammer. Okay, so there we we go into the hammer, and we're switching the leg. We start with an open left leg. Okay, by the, by stepping deep. See if I can get this. Okay. We start by opening the left leg to our gap. And then we, once we realize that we're going to hammer, we switch to an open right leg. You can see that right leg stays deeper. So we've got access. We're shoulder to shoulder and hip to hip. But that guy has given us access to this man, either because he's got him covered or he's stuffing him back to us. And by stuffing, I mean he's playing now with four hands. We got four hands on the guy. And that that we'll, we'll show you that a little bit later. But we got access to the backer, and we're going to make this thing get wider. Now, in this particular case, I would I would say if this man, this man is helping a, another blocker drag him out, then the backer will come to him. Okay. But we're just working on that. Okay. Here's another way we define. Again, we're just using a torque. Okay. And you can see the fundamentals. You can see the integrity. And here we're plowing, okay? Remember the other guy threw, but here we're plowing, okay? We got two hands on. We're not going to let this guy go, okay? And, again, we're only doing this in the match area, the tight end 
against the defensive end, or we matched in inside zone to the front side because we really we really are trying to establish an A gap run there. Okay, so these guys use these skills, but we're matching and we're trying to plow. Okay, we're pushing them sideways. Okay, let me get let me get my my. Um, I lost my spot here. Okay. Okay. So now we we got seventy eight. This is a good kid. He played he played pretty good for his big strong guy tackle. Obviously by his stance, I let the tackle stagger, and I tried to convince the guards and centers not to stack not to stagger. And I prefer if the tackles didn't stagger either. They used to tell me to go scratch, and they staggered anyway. So. What, we, what we're finding here, when you watch this guy, his hands are too low. <laughs> now, because this is a drill and he's supposed to be attacking him, he gets away with this. But I don't like those low hands. I, he, I just think he's, I think he's exposing himself. I did it again. Okay. Okay, this is pretty you know, good to see this again. <laughs> watch his hands. He's shuffling, okay, but his hands are low, and then he gets a pretty good, a good hammer on this guy. And I want to see if he goes red or inside. Yeah, he opens his right leg, okay. Uh, now we got sixty-two, and he, as good as he is, he doesn't stay condensed here. I don't know what happens. That maybe maybe uh, Palzetti uh, jacks him up. I don't know what. But what I think it is is he doesn't have good hand placement with that right hand, okay? So he loses he loses right here. He's he's going to be splashed. Palazetti's trying to run him over, and he's losing until he adds torque. He added an impetus to a force, okay? You know, some guys will say, well, he's changing the force's direction. I say, no, he's adding another force, okay, and that is – destabilizing that defender. It's just the way it is. You know, I didn't say to him that that was good, but he used his skill, his toolbox, to add a force, okay? Now, here is stuffing, okay? What what we're saying here to the, to the tight end is you've got a yellow light and there's another defender outside of you that you got to get to. The count says you got to block him, okay? So what we want you to do is – don't get mired in this guy. Use both hands to protect yourself, okay? And just stuff him and give access to the next blocker. In this case, it would be the tackle. The tackle can get his hands right in there, okay? The problem with this is you don't get – you don't always get a lot of movement unless you got a good target. But we – again, we don't – we're not looking for movement. We're looking to escape. So this is a pretty good deal, stuffing, okay? And escaping. Okay. We're trying to get to the linebacker. Because he's red light and because he's so good, I let him skip. Usually I wouldn't let this make him Apache, but he's got red light. He's got plenty of space. And what he knows is the skip will keep him square. He's thinking he's going to wind up possibly helping the left guard. But right here, he's got a yellow light on the right guard. He's got to go that way, okay? He's going to hammer the four-legged animal. This will be the four-legged animal, and he's but his hands are going to be just awful, awful. Watch, okay? He just and he winds up getting hit, harpooned by the by the um, the linebacker because his hands he doesn't stay in that, that good integrity. Okay, watch it. Gets a pretty good hammer, but he gets a he gets a a face full of shoulder pad. Now the thing is the the back we're on the goal line and this guy gets a hell of a, a push on this dude and the back just stays in there and we score. Okay. And I'm, I'm not going to say much to the kid other than, you know, you didn't, you didn't maintain integrity. Okay. I like to skip. I like everything you did, but you didn't maintain the integrity. Okay. Now the next thing we got 84 in at Penn, they're all celebrating and everything. Okay, so we're watching 84. Again, he's got a yellow light. He's gonna 
we're running zone over here. These are, like I said, they're all C gap zone. That last one was C gap zone too, by the way, because we didn't run B gap zone. So that's how I know. Okay. And we didn't run B gap zone much here, but we used to argue about it quite a bit. But okay, this man decides to just cut and run to the outside. He he lines up. He starts lined up as a as a uh, as a yellow light. As the ball is snapped, he's yellow light. You know, he's a threat to that gap. As soon as the ball is snapped, he starts running the sideline. Well, okay, let's just add some force. We're just going to add force and plow him. Okay? And that's a, that's simple as that. It's just a skill. Okay? Now, watch watch this kid and remember back to Gronkowski. All right? And the, the difference is Gronkowski had the man block. Okay, and this and Gronkowski had a Demarcus Ware and a nine technique, and this guy's some joker from Nebraska that's you know who knows what. Um, and the hand, oh man, I can't stand this. I'm glad this is a free clinic. Because I'd be pissed if I paid for this. But <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't mean it's don't. For charity, coach. It's you got to donate, charity. boys. You got to donate. All right. I'm not getting paid, but but don't. So don't complain because the, the video the video operator is not very good. Uh, what can I tell you? But what he's going to do is stuff. He's got to get to this linebacker. Okay. There, there's no fullback to leave to leave this linebacker for. So he's got to get to him. This is the point backer. This is the minus. This is the plus. The tight end has got to get to him. But if he just runs to him, that guy might back gap. In other words, he can run. If that guy stays outside, it's great. He can release. If it's man coverage, it might be because it looks it looks like post safety. And that guy might cover him. But if he's back gapping on him and he runs out of there, so he's got to get this guy stuffed, make sure sure that he doesn't get that linebacker back gapped and then leave for the linebacker. It goes right to safety. We lost this game, by the way. Okay. This guy, okay, okay, the, the for, because of where, of where this defensive end is, he's going to shuffle, and we're just working the shuffle. But watch this 62 here. 62 this time gets Apache. He's skipping. He probably skipped. This time he gets Apache. Now, Apache means in circle. We we want this guy, this nose guard cut off. So we want to put the ball out here, remember. We want to put it out here. Okay. So he gets the in circle and winds up in the he winds up in the stovepipe. So then in circle changes to a cover. He's got a little color hanging off the edge. He's got good color. This is a linebacker. Don't forget now. We'd like to get him covered. He is matching. This guy's getting in circle, and this guy, he encircles, and he winds up getting cover. Watch this thing. It squirts right through there. Now, this guy's got to put the brakes on and come back. They're obviously bracketing this ball, but good luck. Okay? And, and, and I just think that's you know, that's what we're doing. But, you know, going back to the subject, it's about the hands, okay, and protecting the chest. By using the Apache, he shoulder rolls this. Actually, he gets hit in the chest a little bit. But he's, he's going to shoulder roll. And then, okay, and that protects his chest. And here we go. We're, we're in business. Okay, much better than the first one, in my opinion. 84 in this next clip, okay, is over here. He shows us why the tight end matches on C gap, okay. 84 stuffs the defender so that the tackle can overtake. So if he was going to cover, he'd be there'd be too much of a space. So he's going to match stripe for stripe, okay. And this guy steps in immediately, and here he just shoves him. He stuffs him right to the tackle. Obviously, this is a step in, so the backer's got to get outside. 
He throws him. He literally throws him on the tackle, and he gets right back into that integrity. And there we go. He gets slung, <laughs> right? Okay, but that's pretty good stuff by 84. Um, you know, again, he's, they're, they're doing it against – they're just as good of players as, as, uh, as they are. This kid should have been a pro football player. He started, and that's the only other starter here. He, this guy, this guy got hurt his first first game his senior year. Now he's, I believe, he's a NASCAR pit man. Shoves that thing right back in. It's a pretty easy pickup. Not a lot of space in here. Good. Okay, and that's the the middle linebacker uh, getting over the top. The center got picked. Okay. Here, 80 years, stalemated. Okay. This is that Zettel. It might not be. Um, 90 and, and 98 were both pro football players. Uh, Zettel, I was, I believe, started for the, for the Detroit Lions. Might be Zettel. Okay. He gets, he's stalemated. There's nothing you can do about it. He's got good anchor. You know, he's rooted. Okay, but look at this baby. This is Donovan Smith. He's he starts for the Tampa Bay Bucks. He turns the turret, not the tank. He keeps that open leg to the linebacker. Does a great job here. Turns the turret. Okay, it's not circular force, but it's angular force. Okay, he doesn't need to give much force to this dude. This is the four-legged animal. He doesn't have to give a lot of force. He just shoves it, and then once. Once he breaks this guy loose, 84 just gets him and picks him up and starts driving him. There we go. Okay. Pretty good. Okay. You got, do I have to keep repeating this or am I doing this good enough? Are you guys following? Keep doing what you're doing, coach. Okay. All right. Let me just, let me just run that back one more time for another look-see. Okay. All right. This, this is the stuff play. And this is the really good hammer. Okay. And this guy would argue with, he'd argue with a stump. I mean, he was a hard dude to coach, but what a great, fabulous player. Fabulous player. One of the best, most talented guys I've ever been around. Um, there he goes with the shuffle. There's the hammer. Okay. That's the first baseman stretch right there. Okay. That's the way we talk about it. When we hammer, we want that first baseman stretch. Just imagine him keeping this foot on the base and extending to, with his glove to catch that that peg from, from the shortstop. Okay, keeps that leg open on the linebacker, and boom. Okay, of course, he's just going to maul that linebacker. Okay, here's a, here's a guy that doesn't really stay with his integrity. Okay, we saw this one. Okay, and you can see he doesn't need much shove. Okay, this tackle doesn't doesn't stay with his integrity. He loses that open leg. Okay, he's open. He got caught running. Okay, instead instead of uh, good stomping, so he, it's hard for him to change his. Um, it's hard for him. To, we're going to see this one again. I can't. I'm sorry, guys. I'm so sorry. Okay. Let's see if we can do this. Okay. He starts with the shuffle, but he doesn't keep the open leg. He doesn't go into the first baseman stretch. So he kind of gets mired in, but the linebacker kind of helps him. And he gives a monstrous shove. The linebacker is going here now. Gives a monstrous shove on this guy. I mean, almost kills him. And there's the big pig pile. Now that is Zettel right there, 98. He, uh, I think it's 98. Okay, and here's Zettel again. This, I mean, this guy started in the NFL, you know, so pretty. It's pretty valid stuff. This is one of our kickers. Okay, again, it's just a bit of a stale. Gets a hammer, and it gets lifted right off the ground. And you know, it's not the tight doing it. It's not the tack doing it it's them doing it together okay and the, when you when you block with integrity okay we talk about this all the time uh, we 
don't do it your way. We do it our way so that when we can do it our way, we're, we're both doing it the way that complements each other. That's integrity. Okay. We're doing it with integrity and integrity is the, is the key to teamwork. If you're doing it your way and I'm doing it my way, we might both win, but we can't win together. Okay. And by doing it with integrity, even though this guy's running out of there, now maybe he sees the linebacker, I don't know, but he harpoons this dude. Okay. And it's good enough to blow, to blow him up right into the linebacker and the back just goes, yeah, I'll go that way. Those backs are, are like backup DBs or something like that. Cause the, the good backs are somewhere else. And here's the other other one good shuffle okay okay closes his hip and then he's just taking this guy for a ride okay now side two okay guy's gonna go at least he's he's trying to encircle the next blocker okay you're really worried about the defender because the defender can change He's trying to encircle the next blocker. He's trying to replace the next blocker, but he does it in a certain style. Now this this might be a skip here. It is, and he he winds up in air. Okay, he's going to square the air, and he sees enough of a, a enough of a piece to give a little hammer. And there's the open leg. There's the first baseman stretch, and off we go. And he winds up – now, he just goes and attacks that linebacker a little bit too fast, so he would have got him too, okay? But the linebacker takes off on him. Okay, let, let's see where I'm at here. I want to make sure that I'm coaching this exactly. I, my phone – I'm working my phone and this at the same time. Um, okay, now here's 18 stuffing, stuffing it back to the uh, – Stuffing 44. 44 is a good player, uh, Nebraska. Stuffing it back to the tackle. I think this is Gilliam, uh, Gilliam Gary Gilliam. Okay, they're checking, whatever. And in this case, we're leaving this guy for the fullback. This is actually one of our tight ends. We didn't have fullbacks. We're working, we're working this man right here. The linebacker, the quarterback is going. Leave one for the fullback, one for the tight end. Here's our point. So everybody's working that guy in here, okay? We're working that guy. The fullback's got that guy. All right? And you can see Gary's got his eyes right on that linebacker. And the, the, the tight end gets jacked a little here, but he stuffs it, and there we go. Pretty good stuff. Okay. You want to see that one again? Anybody? Okay. So he's, he's using – here he's using – it looks like a little bit of circular force, but we weren't talking circular force in in 2012. Uh, they were just using uh, stuff. So he, he literally stuffs this guy. He throws him to the tackle. And gets up on the linebacker. Does a pretty good job with integrity too. A little high. Okay. Um, here's a stuff by 84. Okay. This guy's lagging him. Okay. We don't want anything to get in between these guys. He's being lagged. He stuffs. Goes into his open leg here. And, and gets the linebacker. Okay, uh, 18 stuffs and stuffs and gives access to uh, 58. Is now that right there? You know, I I'll I'll, I'll give clinics. I say, well, we don't forehand anything anymore to do and then. Um, you know, forehand. Uh, my thing is going dead again. The stuff again. Okay. But when you're stuffing, if you're doing it right, 
you're not going to have this guy on your body at all. You're going to play with locked arms or close to it. You're going to shove this guy as, as good as you can to the tackle to get to – and it, now the tight end's got to get this linebacker because there's no fullback. So he shoves him pretty good. He gets – okay. Now we're talking about throwing is is – exactly what, what it sounds like. We're going to try and throw a defender. We don't like to do this, throw the defender and let him go on run. We'll do it on pass, but not on run. Now, this guy, the guard, I don't know why he does this, but he just takes off. Maybe maybe because this guy's giving him sugar, and if he's getting sugar, he's not going to worry too much about the center. Senator, you're on your own. I got to worry about this run through. I think that's what it looks like. The linebackers are mugged up. They're shallow. They're sugaring him. And he says, I got to go get it. We, when we sugar, though, we always step to be able to come back. But he, in this case, he doesn't. But watch the center. The center's got to get on his horse. Now, we make it, when, when we're going to do this, we make a, a train alert. Okay, and that says, hey, everybody, you're on your own. There's no combos. And really, there's no combos in C-gap. We don't call combos in C-gap run. We call combos in A-gap run. We call combos in power run, gap plays. But we don't call combos in C-gap run. It all it all happens on the run. Okay, that's why I didn't want to do it at Lewisburg. Uh, it's a lot of, a lot of, it was like a whole nother set of practice plans. But he says, all right, I'm going to Apache. I can't, I can't get the Apache on this guy. I got to throw him and I got to plow him. And he plows him pretty good. And he's using torque and he throws him on his back. And, you know, I think we line up for a kicking play. The next play was pretty good. Um, let's see that again. Mike goes quiet. Okay, hmm. once again, we get sugar. We can't. We can't give any help. We we don't feel as though we have enough time. We got to go. He can't. He's just no way he can get an Apache. But he's going to use that arm to to make this guy. This is this is like judo. Okay, gentle way. Use your use your opponent's force against him. Okay. And this is sort of redirecting force, but what I, I still I still say it's adding a force. He's adding more force than this man is is in position to handle. Okay, he's going to get some penetration, but he's going to get thrown on his back. And of course, Jake is probably he's probably got an arm drag on the other side, so because he's not a dope, probably was a wrestler in high, in high school. Okay, now here's Jake. James, you know, right, wanted to to uh, demonstrate something. We're we're making this video here, uh, so I'm having him take take a vertical set, a tackle set, just to demonstrate the throw. So here he th throws, he throws the hand, and he's tr trying to throw. Okay, so now we're going to uh, This is all pass protection. We like to throw and pass. Um, okay, sixty eight is going to stop sign with the right hand. Okay, and he's getting caught a little bit uh, with with the uh, with the arm under, and so he goes to a long arm right inside hand. Okay, and he's he's adding he's adding force. Now he gets long armed here. Okay, you can't deny it. I think he lets this guy. He doesn't set wide enough, if you ask me. Okay, I, we want the tackles to set deep and the guards and centers to set wide. And he, he creates his own problem. Now, the, it may be because he senses this man's got an inside spike possibility. It's definitely – I'd say that's, you know, okay, that's yellow light. But we still want him to set wider, 
even though he's got the stop sign, he can't step. He can't stop the step through. See it? Watch the step through. But he's just going to add some force and long arm with the inside hand. Okay, he's going to do the same thing again. I want him to set this kid. I don't know why, but I, I want him to set wider than this. I want him to shut that, that off right away. He he doesn't, but he goes right away with the long. It's a pretty good job of taking the, the, the other hand off. This, uh, we got. Uh, Uh, we, 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 I, I have my notes here. It says bad hands. Let me see what happens. I don't remember. Oh, he gets caught. He, he's got his elbows out. He gets jacked. So he doesn't have, he doesn't have much to do, but he adds force and throws. Okay. And to me, again, it's, it's not great. Uh, I got yelled at pretty good that pretty for this one we rushed for 300 yards on these guys but i don't know uh distance here he just it's, he can't quite plow but he, he can throw okay. it's hit here but watch him land a, a, a nice throw Boom. Pretty good throw. Okay. You want to see that one again? Anybody? Yes, sir. Audience. Okay. We were throwing back then, working circular force when, when I returned to uh, Ball State. Watch this. Watch this. Watch what he does with his shoulders. Oof. Throws the guy right on the ground, which is good. You know, I I think that um, I think that adding the force, we and again, we're when we're tackles, we chase them, but we can disengage in pass protection. Uh, we don't we don't care about uh, throwing them up the field as long as we throw them away from the quarterback. Now we're going to look at both of these guys. He's going to set too high. He's going to be pretty good. but they both get throws. This is against ourselves in, in practice. We were, we had enough money to, to have. There's a throw by 67. Pretty good pocket, right? And uh, we had enough money to have everybody have a different helmet, but I don't know what that was all. Maybe this is a game. I don't know. Might be a game. Yeah, I think it is a game. I'm wrong. I don't remember this guy. This guy looks like a guy we had. But well, watch uh, 78 here. Now he starts out he starts out in pretty good integrity, but I think hands are too low and he doesn't ever put the stop sign out. Okay? This guy's hands are wide. Doesn't really have the stop sign. Look at this guy. This is Jake. He's probably going to put the wrench in. Okay? Pretty good inside hand. This is this looks like a better set to make. He's wider, but watch watch seventy eight. Just not even he doesn't even really throw, but he he keeps that inside hand going. Now I want to caution you with the inside hand. Don't put the inside hand in early if you're a tackle because it's going to turn you. Now a guard or a center, you can land the inside hand earlier because you're going to set wider. OK, and that inside hand is going to protect you from an inside move. But tackles, we don't want them to set wider because we don't want them to get picked by the three technique. So they're going to set deeper. But the, the quicker they put that inside hand in, the worse it is. OK. Um, this is 65. He's going to throw this man out. It's a wide set. This is definitely a practice. Throws him out, guy comes back, he throws him back in. Okay. All right. Now, pace and translation. Those are those are words that I get, you know. When I started using the word translation, I think I was coaching at um, 
I think I was coaching at UMass, so that's pretty good, pretty old. Translations are uh, a um, it is an engineering term that says that uh, basically the way I've, I've boiled it down is keep your pecker pointed north. <laughs> and pace is, is again, uh, the red light, green light, yellow light. Green light, somebody's in your gap, go. Red light, nobody's near you. Wait. Yellow light, define. You're going to make a decision. You're driving a car. You, you see a green light, you go. You see a red light, you wait. You don't turn your engine off. You wait. Okay, you wait for the light to turn green. Somebody shows up in your in your gap uh, late. You, you it's green, and then yellow light. He's not in your gap. He's on you. We got to define him. So these are just these are just some some examples of that stuff. Okay, this first drill is we're using, uh, and I didn't I didn't use this term, but it's basically a thumb roll. Again, we're being fundamental. the The line of scrimmage is this way. Okay, these guys are working the line of scrimmage, and the defenders, we're trying to get them to play like they're lagging. This would be, say, inside of a double team. Okay, so there's another guy that's going to put his helmet right through this guy's ribs. But we're not, we can't run out of there. We got to carry this man, set him up for the next blocker. Okay, and we got to, we, if we run out of there again, we might get back gap. So we want to maintain contact, but we cannot have this man lag us and shove us off of off of our in, you know shove us out of our integrity so we work this all the time okay there's the thumb roll and we're trying to keep an open leg and this guy these guys are trying to lag us and push us off the line okay and we just kind of stay in the integrity and we come out of it see that stay in that integrity okay Okay, now this is just another example of pass protection, staying in the integrity and using your hands. Okay, he's going to stay vertical for two steps. Okay, these guys are going to stay vertical till I blow till I blow the whistle. Okay, he's this kid's going to stay vertical for two steps, and then he's going to go in and close the distance. Okay. And he does, and watch the hand. See the hand? He's using his hands to add force, add force, okay? Okay, now this is for when we want to step through. Let's, let's say we're the backside guard on C-gap or the frontside guard on C-gap, and we're trying to give help to, to an, another Apache blocker. We want total, we want a total access for that next blocker. We want to use a long arm. We call this a Heisman. OK. Uh, it's, it's just like the Heisman Trophy. We're keeping this leg open. We're closing this leg. We're setting this man up. We're trying to keep his keep him as clean as possible. We can't let him grab our far shoulder or our chest. He might grab our chest, but we got to be able to keep him from grabbing us. And now the, the next guy's trying to replace us. He's not trying to get to him. He's trying to get face in the butt and replace this man, okay? So we're here we're just carrying the lag, and now, now we're going to escape and go into, right into our, our integrity, okay? Uh, here, this is, this is not a drill now. This is assigned to this overhang blocker here, but something's wrong. Okay, here's your here's your uh, tight defense. By the way, this was um, the head coach of Baylor, Dave Arando, was was the D coordinator there, and he was uh, he 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 taught us some lessons that day. We won the game, and he taught us some lessons. But this guy, if he just goes smoking out there, he's not going to be able to sort this thing out. And watch this defender come into his area. Well, we're never going to run by a good block for a bad one. I got I got. Um, question about this but we're we're we got red lights so we're trying to wait and hang around as long as possible i, I remember some of this stuff like it was yesterday it's terrible there's the overhang player that's his assignment these are the point backers because it's a three down look okay and uh, we had different ways to do this this is the minus sometimes we'd call this guy the i don't know what we call i forget but 
at Ball State, this is Penn State, but at Ball State, we called both of these guys. It was two points, and this is the plus. He's assigned to the plus, but he's going to go. He realizes something's up. The plus is running away from him. This guy's coming to him, so he goes into integrity, grabs him, and he gets tripped by the tackle, and we get some yardage. Okay, we'll see. We'll show you that again on a wide shot. Okay, but he's sorting out now. Watch, uh, watch the center and the left, the right guard sort out a middle X. Okay, again, red light, green light, but this guy's going to rock out and put them both in red light. He's going to rock out and make this guy green light. He's going to rock out and make this guy green light. These two backers are going to cross. Watch what happens. Okay. Okay. So, so, bro, you still there? Yeah, he, he's still on. He's listening, coach. Okay. Well, this, we Ben Lazarski, we're playing Montana. Those guys hated me, right? They thought I was an asshole. And I said to Ben, mm -hmm. I said, well, here's what's going to happen, Ben. You're going to do what you want to do, and they're going to do this this cross charge, and we're going to get TFL. It'll be the first zone we run. It's going to be your fault. So exactly what happened. He did exactly what he wanted to do. He took his eyes. He was going for the number two backer. And the cross charge hit it. And ba bing TFL. And after that, Benny was my boy. I could do no wrong. It was a Montana game. Remember, we played it. We lost. But Benny and me, we were joined at the hip. <laughs> and it was all because of, because of, of red light. He didn't, I didn't use that term at that time, but this is what it was, red light. So watch the center just hanging around, sorting this thing out. He's shuffling. He knows something's up. This guy knows, right, oh, I went from green light to red light. Something's up. Look at him, how he's stuffing his arm back, okay? He's – I don't know what's going on with him. He's falling on his face. But it doesn't matter. He puts a hand on the hip, and there they go. They sort it out. Boom, boom. And of course, the the the, the tackle, the back uh, runs into the tackle. Okay, this is the back side of Apache. Okay, versus a six technique. You guys want to see that again? That was that was kind of nice. I kind of yeah. That. Show it again, Coach. Go ahead. We'll show it again. Okay, so it's a sword out. Okay, shuffling. He knows something's up. We're running C gap. He grabs the backside backer. And the, the, the guards, and these guys, they, they, they've they seen this stunt so many times, they know exactly what's going on, okay? I just got the battery saver thing, so I better plug this thing in. Hang on a second. Lutarski, coach, might have been the best center I've been around in 20 years. This guy, this guy right here rivaled him, this kid's 62, because he could do – he could do a bunch of stuff that, that Benny couldn't do, but Benny was fabulous. Benny's coaching now, you know. Yep. He's a football yep. coach. I talk yep. to him on occasion. We text more than anything. But I was recruiting some of his guys. Okay. So here we're Apache, and you, you're you going to tell me we're, we're not skipping, but watch. We are. And we get – we're encircling. And th I call this the ear hole drill, okay. And when I was a good coach, I'd make this defender – I'd make him turn his shoulders and try to beat the guy, but I couldn't get these kids, uh, these these defensive scout guys, to do anything. I like this. This is a nice little pickup. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Grab, grab, and the tackle makes the our offensive tackle makes the tackle. Okay, I, I wanted this guy to spike and get hit in the ear hole, but he kept playing it straight. I think it had something to do with his stance, though. And that's the Apache, okay? And you can use this. I believe you can use this if you if you have to man block on the front side of power uh, versus a six technique. That's what I told him to do. To me, power and zone, A-gap power and A-gap zone are the same play. Use the same techniques. C-gap's a little different because it's a little wider. But uh, duo, power, counter, and a gap zone are all the same it's, it's techniques anyway. Okay, that's probably the kind of stuff that gets me fired. But 
I just now here we go again. We're we're just this is a step through lag, you know, the Heisman trophy. I just like this. So I added it. It, it gives you a better, a better look at the open leg. And you know, the force is coming right, it's coming right through you. So you gotta have you can't have a real open leg, but you gotta have a mentally open leg. Okay. So that you can escape when it's time to escape. And there you go, right into their integrity. Okay, right into their integrity. Right? The fundamentals. Okay, and there's another Apache. Um, this guy couldn't block a hat. Okay. You wouldn't you wouldn't want him to uh you wouldn't want him to block anybody. He'd catch a BB in the dark with his teeth. He could he was a big dude, six four, he's about two forty, but he just he didn't have strength. He didn't have, just didn't have that muscle. But he looks pretty good here. Okay. And uh, here's 18 getting slung because he's not condensed. Okay. It's just fundamentals. Okay. This is that. I think that's that Purdue outfit again. Okay. He loses, he loses integrity here. He's got decent hand placement. He's using his hands, but he just he's he's gonna get slung. Okay, you can see it right there. The other guy develops an integrity, puts the brakes on, and slings him. And you know, we're saying we're saying run off the ball uh to a kid, he's gonna lose his integrity. Okay. We don't run, we stomp. Because we don't want to get slung. There it is. He's running. He's he he's standing up high. He's driving his knees forward the whole bit, and that guy braces and throws him. Okay. The only thing that the only thing that uh, that saved him was he had good hand placement, so at least he could hang on. I tell him if you get your hands on the guy's chest, you better be holding him. Okay. I'm. If you get caught holding, it's your fault because your hands are sloppy. You don't have any integrity. You don't have that fundamentals. But if you can get your hands into his chest or his arm, if you get your hands into his armpit, you squeeze those tits till it hurts. Make him cry. Okay? You got to get that, that armpit here. And, you know, you'll never get called for holding. I think we got called for holding, like, I don't know, maybe three times a year, maybe. I don't know. Cause, Cause we felt like we were controlling the hands. Okay. Here's that play that where we sorted out. So here's the point, here's the plus. And the, the, the tight end is assigned to this guy, but he's looking, he's saying, man, something's wrong here. This, what's he doing way over here? This guy's over here. And you know, there, there's the, the tight defense and there's the three by one. Okay. You want to move these people over to sort them out, to define them. That last uh, that last uh, clinic that we did that I did, there's an example of it. Okay, we moved the safety over, we moved the backers over. Uh, you, you're pretty limited over here, but who cares? You know, you you could still run if that guy's playing loose like that. You could probably get a few yards. But anyway, watch watch 18. He goes into he says something's up, something's not right. Okay, we're checking out. Believe it or not. We're checking this play from the box. I'm up in the box eating popcorn. Yeah, run right. Yeah. So he, he says, something's, something's not right. I'm going to slow down and grab this linebacker. Okay. This guy's got to play the bubble. We probably should have thrown the bubble, but we didn't. And we got some yards instead. Pretty good. Okay. Here he's sorting support. Oh, wait a minute. He's no, excuse me. He's he's uh he's here and he's sorting a support man. Okay, same thing. But the backers aren't bumped here. So he's saying something's wrong. Why is this guy way over here? So again, it's a three by one. Okay. He says, I can go out there and go smoking out there, but who's gonna block this dude? He says, Well, I will. I'll block him. Okay. I got a question for this too, by the way. <laughs> I'm like, gee, I thought that was good. Well, I didn't think it was that good. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's not good. It sucked. Whatever. But anyway, we're sorting support. Okay, 65. Um, 
here is going to rewind and chip. Now watch this guy. He's going to, this guy is going to get the Apache. Even though he's high, he's going to get the Apache. He's going to get this guy encircled. Watch him. He's got him encircled, even though he's high, he's getting jacked up. This guy is not in a hurry to get out, keeps the open leg, rewinds and gives a little chip. Doesn't shut the center off, okay? He's skipping probably a little too far. He should be helping this guy a little, be able to help this guy a little bit too much, a little bit more, but it all kind of sorts out. Now, the problem with, with chipping is you don't always get cover, but he says, okay, I got to plow it. And he does, and it spits. Looks pretty good, right? Almost like we coached it. Okay. Once again, he's got green light. He's got red light. There ain't nobody here. The closest threat he has is right here. Okay. He's got red light. Probably should slow it down a little bit more to, to go, be able to rewind and give this guy a little Heisman help. Okay. He's going to chip. He won't, we don't usually usually use a Heisman on the front side, and, and uh, we wouldn't uh, coach it that way. They they possibly would use it, but he's chipping the defender, not the center. They're layered here, okay. By the center trying to replace him and encircle this nose, he doesn't get blown up. Now that open leg gives him a chance to get on that linebacker and pink. There we go. Okay, so here he's going to rewind and chip again, and and we're gonna it looks like we're good going good Apache here. Yep, clean Apache. He's in red light. This guy gets a nice clean Apache. He's plowing because the guy's just too wide, and boom, the ball spits right where we want it. We got these Apaches gave us cover back here by encircling. We got cover. Of course, we're funneling it to this. We, we had a hard time getting those safeties out of there. I don't know why. I mean, I do know why, but here it is. Okay, Th this is an example of skipping how you lose integrity. Patchy on the nose. Got a good, a good chip or chip in the nose. You can see this guy get depleted here. Boom. And this time the linebacker doesn't feel so good. 39's feeling pretty fast. We don't have a guy for him. Maybe could have sorted it out with the tight end, but the formation didn't allow it. Boom, and there we go. Not bad. Okay. Okay, now we're going to go to movement, I mean line movement, which I think the, these techniques and the ideas behind them um, – you know, the idea of acceleration, of changing and stopping and starting. Uh, I think this is where it really shines um, in movement. Okay. So we're playing in the snow. We're going this way. The, the, the thing I don't like about uh, sidecars, it tells the defense where we're going. Um, you know, and then you got to, you got to do any, everything to counter the back, but running, C gap zone from sidecar from inside zone. Your back is here. He, here he's here. And unless you throw to him, everybody knows what you're doing first and 10, but that's neither here nor there. I became, I became a pistol in uh, aficionado, but here's a, here's a nose. And maybe they know by his stance, there's a bunch of things. Here's a strong safety. Uh, strong safety is a tip. We're talking, we're telling this tackle is telling people the safety's down. Okay, he's telling everybody here the safety is in the front. We had all, all these little codes. Okay, so that alerts people that this might happen. Okay, this guy says, I am red light, so I'm hanging around. The center's green light, and they exchange. The center becomes red light. And the guard becomes green light. Okay. And there we go. Okay. And there it spits. 
and goes to the sa to the safety down safety. Okay. Um, here, here, this next one, they're going to lag. Uh, they're going to lag the center a little bit. Um, he's going to he's going to cut across, but then he's going to try and chase the center this time. You probably got about ten minutes, Coach. Okay. So you might really? be able to finish this whole tape off. I, I, this whole tape, I, I, only, I got about 46 seconds. Okay, the center center says, okay, I got I got a lag. I'm going to stuff it. The guard says, oh, green light. I got to go go get it, and he does. And this back was a hell of a back now. He was a good player. He should, he should have been playing the pros. He just didn't have the speed. Okay, let me show you that one again. I like this stuff. You love it, Coach. I do. I really do. It's too bad I can't. Uh, I'm done, you know. But I wouldn't mind coaching coaches. I just, I just uh, gotta see how that, if that ever becomes a, a possibility. Okay. There's the shuffle. There's the, he realizes he sees he sees what's going on because he's red light. We're slowing him down. His pace is red light. Okay. There he goes. And pretty good and spitting it. Off we go. Okay. Now this one, we got 62 uh, going square to air. And he puts the brakes on because he sees the back, the linebacker back gap. Okay. So the center is in red light. Okay, there's the guard. He's he's I'd say that's green light. That's clearly green light because we got to block him. We're we're going open edge zone. He's got the end. Okay. He's got to Apache this. And he's going to Apache. Okay. The center says, okay. We caught him in a 4-1 here. I don't know how we did it, but that's what we did. 4-1, we're licking our chops. Maybe because we're four open. I don't know. Center says, yeah, we're lagging. Okay. Getting this guy's gonna go back gap. All right. I'll put the brakes on a wallet and we'll let that thing spit right there. Boom. There we go. I think they had it. I think they had the, the end fall off there. Okay. And now here is um we're gonna when we set. Okay, this is pass pro. When we set, we always set the open leg to the shade. So this is a man, you know, man protection. Uh, we don't slide. We either full gap it or we uh, or we set a man with a point. But he's going to set inside, and his open leg will be left. Okay, and he's going to go with the long arm, the inside hand, long. Okay. And the guy goes out, so now he switches hands, outside hand, long, inside hand, strong, and he throws. And we kind of get a little pressure there, but you know, this is practice, so who cares? All right. That, my boys, is what we got. That's all I got. I don't know anything else. Bro, you, you, got, any, you got any questions for Coach? No. Nah, coach runs the best B-gap zone ever invented. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know what? We 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 were we were pretty good at it. You know, you know what I started getting into though? When we learned um when I learned the the, the sniffer and the pistol, really started to get into the uh, power plays again. It's, 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 it's wild coach. Uh you know, we, we were doing I'm into the jet stuff and duo and play action and I didn't really work on the power and we started running the power late, you know, second half of the game after a bunch of duo and zones and that power just started ripping that power. We didn't work on it. Just started ripping out of there. Unbelievable. Yeah. C Coach got kicked off. Um, I'm going to make sure he can get back on coach before uh, coach Casper comes on here. I might, I might have kicked him off by accident because I was just trying to get rid of that uh, the video that was down there. So to, uh, on Sunday at, what did we say, 10 a.m.? 
10 a.m. Yep, I'm in. 10, 10 a.m., bro's going to come on, and I've asked him to speak about the ODU Taylor Heineke offense that they ran. Um, so he's not going to tell you anything about what they're doing at New Hampshire, but my friend was down there and my running back, Hey, Coach, you got kicked off. I think I kicked you off, Coach. Well, well what happened was Co- Mr. Grassley was on explaining how uh, they were going to put everybody in jail if they ever get it figured out. And Which one's Grassley, Coach? Grassley's the old guy from Iowa. Yeah, Coach. I, I don't even know who he is. I probably need to start watching that stuff. You're, you're too busy working. I just sit around all day and look at YouTube. <laughs> yeah. just, bro's going to come on – on uh, Sunday at 10 a.m., and he's going to talk about what they did at ODU with Taylor Heineke. Well, I tell you what, they did a lot of good stuff. That was a that was a hell of a hell of a uh, outfit they had going there. Yeah, I'll be down. I'll be down. I'll be back down at the end of the month in May, Coach. I'm going to come find you. You gonna you gonna do what? I'm going to come find you at the end of the month. I'm going to be back down that way. Yeah, come on. I'm I'm still in Durham. You know, come come. You got my phone number. I'll be down. You know, we. Uh, it's nice once in a while to talk about this stuff. I just this. Uh, you know, I don't coach, so I'm just. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. You know, it's, it's all the good stuff. You know, like I, I learned this this pistol stuff, and I'm like, gee, why 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 weren't we doing this before? You know? Yeah, I've gone fully, not fully, probably 70% under center. Probably another, no, probably 60% under center. Another 25 from the pistol. Very, well, very rarely run sidecar gun. Well, I'll tell you what, but that under center, you want to run the C gap, under center is the way to go. We that's what we're, that's what we're talking about right now. Well, it, under center, you know, especially if you got to you got to run naked to handle the eighth guy backside. But if you if you got a guy that can run and throw, and you don't want to run him on option, okay, I think that I think it's a great thing. Yeah, we got the naked game going right now. We call it trailer. You know, with two two flats, it's a pretty good deal. I bet you. I bet you. I got to run, guys. I'm getting yelled at by my teammates. Yeah. Uh, that was a great clinic, Coach. Always good to hear your voice. Well, I tried to in- infuse a little humor, but. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, guys. All right, See man. You. Have fun. Hit them straight. Hey, go ahead. Go to your next guy. Hey, so I'm just waiting for him to come on, Coach. I just want to uh, say thank you. Coach McNally will be coming on tomorrow. I'll send you the link so you can watch him. Well, I tell you, it's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, I sit here and I watch this stuff from 10 years ago and it's like, like it was yesterday, you know, and then I just go back, turn it off and I get, I go into my fog and, you know, don't worry about it. But I, Hey, I'm, I'm hoping that, that this thing, um, you know, that, that it's successful, you know, for, for, uh, the cause and, and, uh, you know, once again, I'm really honored to, to, uh, you know, be a part of it and be able, be able to help out. You'll have, uh, McNally and some of these other guys, you know, Donnie Brown, man, Donnie Brown is a dude. I mean, he really is. He's one of, the, he's one of the greatest and McNally. And, you know, I don't know who else you're having, but you, it sounds like you got Dave a- Dorn. You got who? Dave Dorn. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Galesh. Galesh, uh, that was at Tennessee, is the OC. Is at wow. South Florida. Yeah, here's Coach uh, Casper here, Coach. I'm going to add him to the stream. Hey, Coach. I got Coach Sean Strollo here, Coach. Do you know Coach Strollo? I do not. What's up, Coach? Just sitting here, you know, trying to fill in while you, while you get ready. Nice. I'm ready to rock. Ready to rock, man. What's going on? What'd you talk about? Uh, mostly just told some jokes. I did a few uh, magic tricks. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Strollo, could you go five hours like Bob Wiley? No, I don't have. I don't have. I don't know enough to go five hours. I don't, Jeez. Couldn't. Are you kidding me? We'd have to have a lunch break. 
Yeah. So Eric, if you want to present down at the bottom, if you press present, yep. um, we'll make sure everything's good before we get going. Coach Strollo, thank you, my friend. Yes, sir. I'll well, talk what to, I you to get off. You I think I, I think I just kick you off again. Beautiful. Thank All you. Right. Good luck, See coach. You. Thank you. So hey, coach, I'm gonna I have a PowerPoint and then I have some huddle film. What's the yes, best? Yes, sir. Film? Do I have to do them separately or what? Uh yes, sir, you can. Just go share screen. Oh, there we go. Uh, yes, sir. Perfect. Just like Zoom. And here we go. Um we'll start with there's my film. Let's go this. There we go. We'll start with this. How's that? All right. So I just added it right now. If you want to make that full screen, I, I can still see you. Everybody else can see you, but we can see your PowerPoint, Coach. How's that now? There. Good? It, lo it looks great. So you want to go to your huddle? Yeah. So if I go to my huddle, do I just exit out? And Yeah, you can uh, just – yeah, just go to your huddle. Just go to put a huddle on your computer and it'll work, I think. Will you be here monitoring that huddle there? Oh, yeah, coach. I'm I'm going to be here. All right. I can still Bye. see your PowerPoint. Oh, I'm I'm on my huddle now. How do I uh, how do I get huddle into there? Uh it sh should is it at the top where it says uh share this screen now in blue? Okay. Um, on the huddle. Let's see here. So if I go, so I'm sharing. Okay, I think I got to stop sharing that. Then if I come back here and hit share again, present, share screen. Easiest with two monitors. Okay, I got two monitors. I wonder if that would help. Share screen. All right, here we go. So here's huddle. So it's making. Yeah, and if you, you just share them, I can keep them. I keep them down here at the bottom of the screen, and I just add them whenever you want me to. All right, so, yeah, there you go. There's your huddle. There's huddle, right? Mm-hmm. And then if I want to go here, how's that? You got it, Coach. That was Perfect. easy. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna take this off the screen right now, and then I'll add it back on. Um, Coach, thank you for coming on. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, Coach, your background, and then we'll get going. Um, I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate you guys having me. Um, you know, awesome uh, cause, obviously for for charity and for a, for a good good event, good situation. You know, it's always good to come on and talk ball, but uh, you know, especially when it's for for such a good cause, cause bringing coaches together. Um, you know, doing it for a good reason, and there's no better community than the football community. So excited to be here. Excited that. Uh, Coach Gibbs uh, asked me to come on, so I'm pumped. Um, I'm a high school football coach here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been coaching football now for about 24 years. Um, I, I played quarterback, defensive back here at North Hills High School way back. Uh, played football at the University of Pittsburgh. I went in as a quarterback, ended up playing um, free safety, strong safety. Uh, tore my ACL twice, actually, uh, so it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to be playing at the next level, but like most of us, uh, loved the game and wanted to stay in it, so uh, the next step for me was was to coach, and, you know, at the time, I was trying to decide between college and high school, uh, got my teaching degree and decided to go the high school route, um, did that for 10 years as an assistant in my alma mater. Um, and then I got my first head coaching gig in 2012 and I was there for, um, well, 10 years total, eight years as a head coach. Uh, we won two state titles, four district titles. We ended up, you know, I think three times in the top 15 in the, you know, max preps top 25 in the country. So had a lot of success there, had a lot of good players, um, Last year, I guess two years ago, 2021, I had the opportunity to go back to my alma mater, University of Pittsburgh. I was an offensive analyst, worked uh, under Coach Narduzzi, worked with Kenny Pickett in the quarterback room, uh, pretty much focusing on third downs. I was with them. We won a ACC title, so I was blessed to be a part of that group. And then um, this past year, I came back to high school. Um, my son's playing. He was a sophomore quarterback, and 
decided I wanted to come back and be with him and finish his career out. And then we'll see what happens after that. Maybe get back uh, to the collegiate level one day, maybe not, but it was a great experience doing that. But ultimately wanted to get back and be able to, you know, spend some time with my son and be able to coach him. And as most of us coaches are aware, you know, we spend so much time away from our family. So to be able to have the opportunity to coach him, I couldn't pass up. So I wanted to do that. And we had uh, our first year there last year, uh, lost in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, and he had, I think, four soft, four seniors. So we're looking for a big, big, bigger year this year. But um, everything's set up, had a great off season, So looking to make, make a little bit of a run this year. But, um, yeah, right in the middle of the off season here. Coached both sides of the ball, offense, defense. Currently the head coach and defensive coordinator at Mars High School which, again, is, is a suburb of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So, yeah, excited to be here, Coach. Amen, Coach. So I, I'm going to present your your PowerPoint, Coach, and I'll just stay on here just in case you have any problems. Um, but thank no you, problem. Coach. Just roll, and then um, what, what do you say, about 1245-ish? Uh, about, about 1245, Coach. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, Coach, so I got uh, – whenever you're ready to go, I got your uh, PowerPoint up here with Perfect. the Coach Stoop. So I can start rolling? Yes, sir. Awesome. All right. So there we go. Uh, hey, hey, guys, uh, appreciate you having me on. We're going to talk about um, hot coverage today. So um, this is something near and dear to my heart. Uh you know, we're, we're a quarters-based team, quarters-based uh, structure, 4-3 defense, you know, albeit in today's day and age. I think you got to be multiple. I think you got to be, um, you know, versatile in what you're doing. I think you got to be able to, you know, close the middle of the field at times. I don't care if you're a odd front, an even front, a quarters, you know, based defense, uh, you know, a, a cover three, cover one type type structure on the back end. I think you got to be able to do a little bit of everything. Um, and that sounds kind of, you know, maybe um, hypocritical coming out of my mouth because I'm a big simplicity guy. Be great at what you do. And I still believe in that, but I think you got to be multiple and be able to do, you know, some different things in today's football. There's just too much stuff out there um, nowadays and, and, you know, too many good coaches. So uh, I, I think you got to be able to do a little bit of both. So today we're going to talk about hot coverage. Um, hey, coach, you can see what, what slide can you currently see? Can you see the hot coverage slide or can you see, I can the, see the gray one? The one with the, the players? Hot, or the one, well, the I can see player. both of them, but the one the one that's on the left is hot coverage. OK, I want to make this full screen here. How do I do that? There we go. How about that? Yes, sir. It looks great. That's better. All right. So there's my contact info. So, again, hot coverage when I refer to it, I know it's pretty much universal. Uh, but it's three deep, two under. I learned this from Coach Narduzzi way back, um, you know, the Michigan State days, mid-2000s, um, and kind of morphed it into our own system. We do some things differently um, than they do now, I know, but still a big believer in his philosophy and what they taught at Pitt and Michigan State um, and kind of made it our own. So this is basically what it is. Um, you know, I don't want to demean anybody's football knowledge, but in the most basic um, sense – you know, it's three deep, two under, you know, it's built with, um, you know, some version of three deep over top, two underneath, you know, defenders, and we're bringing six. So you can bring whatever blitz pattern you like, um, you know, double A gap, double edge, America's zone blitz from one side or the other, draw up any blitz pattern you want. At the end of the day, we're going to have three deep defenders and two underneath defenders. Now, how we do that, is very, very, um, you know, particular, very exact in, in how you got to coach that up because there's a lot of a lot of football field that we're not covering. You know, we're kind of selling out. We're going to get get the quarterback. Um, we love this versus the run, but ultimately we're going to overplay. You know how the quarterback reacts and and react accordingly to him. And again, I got a lot of slides here that we can talk about. So. A couple of key things I got about, you know, four or five slides here, and then we'll get to some film and watch some film and can discuss some things there. But basically some keys to hot coverage. Um, in my opinion, you got to, you got to 
disguise it great, right? If they, it, it's like anything really in football. If they know you're coming, they're going to try to take advantage of what you're doing. So we want to disguise this as much as we can. And in our structure, we're going to show quarters. You know, that's why we love quarters so much. It's so versatile. You can do so many different things from it and make it look the same every single snap. The second thing, the blitzers must go. This isn't something where you take your time, you hope you get home, you got to go, man. Like your hair's on fire, um, you know, because, again, we're only playing, you know, two underneath defenders, so there's a lot of grass out there. So we got to go, um, not necessarily get home, but we got to go and at least make the quarterback feel and understand that we are coming after him, make him get rid of the football. Third thing, our defensive ends or our edge blitzers, whoever they become, you know, generally speaking, it's going to be a defensive end or a linebacker, could be a corner, could be a safety, could be a, um, you know, inside outside backer. Um, they're on a, what we call a peel alert, you know, so we're, we're, we're playing zone coverage behind it um, with only two underneath defenders. So any type of um, route where we're going to get a running back that crosses our face as our edge blitzer or as the contained blitzer, we're going to peel with that. All right. Fourth thing, um, our, our tackle. So any type, anytime we get a three-man surface, um, or that could be a, a, a guard tackle with a sniffer, a Y-off formation that's become so popular, uh, we will wipe that, um, which basically means we're going to wipe out to the C-gap and kind of squeeze behind it um, there. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. And then ultimately it is, you know, three deep, two under coverage. A couple more things here. Um, why do we like it? Well, it, it gives us the ability to bring six. You know, we're a quarters-based um, structure. Um, and everybody knows, and when you're playing quarters defense, if, if they line up in four verticals and, and uh, run four guys deep, well, ultimately you're going to end up being in, you know, cover zero a lot. I mean, we're a match quarters um, coverage team to base. And, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, if they send four guys vertical, we're going to have, you know, four guys on them. It's cover zero. So we play a lot of, you know, in my mind, man-to-man -man coverage. So when we bring six, this gives us the ability to, number one, close the middle of the field, and number two, play some zone coverage and give our guys a little bit of a break. You know, let's face it, when you're playing press coverage on the outside and your safeties are constantly having to, you know, cover the number two receiver um, with a lot of room, that gets stressful. So for us to be able to change it up, close the middle of the field, and again, like I said, give those guys a little bit of a breather, um, really, really, really is advantageous to us and to our defensive structure and to keep the offense off balance. You know, everybody knows, well, hey, if they're going to run quarters, we're going to run our quarters beaters. Well, that's up to us then to keep them off balance and not allow them to dial those said quarters beaters up whenever they want. Uh, third thing, like I kind of mentioned before, it's very versatile. We love um, hot coverage. We love bringing six um, in this aspect. We can do it on any down and distance. You know, we love it on first down. We love it when we think they're going to run the ball. And we also love it on third down in really anything. You know, it, it's safe. You can dial it up any way you want, depending on the structure. You can blitz certain formations. You can blitz really anything. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And that's why we love it so much. It's great in the red zone and goal line because it adjusts easily. You know, big coverage, a lot of people run down in the red zone, you know, because they want to prevent getting picked. And they'll run cover two, right? And um, a lot of people, you know, in the football world will, would maybe call it red two. So it's cover two, but it's, well, you know what? Our safeties really aren't going to back up. So it, at the end of the day, it ends up becoming almost, you know, seven across the board. Well, that's basically the model we use down there. Instead of seven, though, it's five, five across the board. Eyes on the quarterback, ready to react and jump anything he throws while we're bringing the six guys at him. Uh, we feel it's very safe. You know, we're going to close the middle of the field. Um, you know, all eyes are on the quarterback. All five defenders, all ten eyes are on the quarterback. Um, you know, we're anticipating his movement and we're making, you know, we're, we're jumping um, his movement. And I'll get, a, get to that in a second and explain that a little bit more. But it is an interception coverage. Our eyes are on the quarterback. Um, we get a lot of interceptions from this because, again, we're seeing the ball thrown and we're reacting to that. A couple more things here on why we like it. it forces the back to stay in the block a lot. So if it's a team that's looking to get rid of the get the back out, well, this is not going to allow them to do that. To do that, 
Um, like I said, if, if he does get out, we're going to peel with him. If he crosses our face, if he doesn't, then he'll just go into our zones and we'll be okay right there. And, and to be honest, if he doesn't, you know, swing wide, he's probably not going to get out going through the, you know, through the line of scrimmage just because of the blitz pattern we're bringing and whatnot. Um, for the most part, we are gap sound. You know, there is certain times we'll, we'll bring some, some pressures if it's, you know, long yards. Um, where we really don't worry about being gap sound, but for the most part in our base structures, we're gap sound. So that's why we love these, you know, on, on rundowns, on pass downs, really doesn't matter. Um, a lot of these will create a one-on-one pass rush. We can dictate certain matchups that we want when we're bringing pressures, when we're dialing these up, when we're designing these. So to really get our best guys versus, you know, in a one-on-one matchup or possibly versus their, their worst guys. Like I mentioned before, it's a great middle of the field, um, closed complement to quarters, which we need, you know, there's no, no way you can sit out there and line up and, and run quarters uh, coverage. In my opinion, every snap of defense, right. You're, it's too much pressure. Eventually you're going to run into a team or a player or a quarterback or a receiver that's able to, to take advantage of that. So in my opinion, for as good as quarters is, you have to be able to change it up and close the middle of the field and protect the post. All right. Couple last things here: the quarterback can't pump or fake, uh, pump fake or look off because he doesn't have time. You know, very specifically, if he's going to try to look one way and look off and come back the other, we should be smacking him in the mouth, right? He shouldn't be able to pump fake and then throw it again. If he does, I'm not blitzing the right people. I need to design another blitz, um, or we're not doing it right. You know, um, and then finally, it generates movement. Um, you know, gets him out of the pocket hopefully moves the pocket a little bit, get, gets them out of rhythm, makes them, you know, run their offense, not the way it's designed to be run. All right, a couple things now before we get to some video um, is, is developing the blitz. So we're talking about hot coverage, you know, three deep, two under. But with that, you got to devise some blitz patterns. Now, I'm not going to sit here and talk about this too much because um, we're just talking about the coverage per se. But as far as our blitz – development goes and how we develop the blitz patterns that we like um here's some some key points to that so first thing i want to say is you really don't want to blitz from depth per se there is one that we do but for the most part kind of back to my original slide original point is if you're going to blitz you better go you better get there there's no use blitzing from five yards deep if you're not going to be able to get there and not going to be able to affect the quarterback right so you have to have a couple different answers here a couple different things we, we make – and to protect this, you know, at other times, we want to show blitz and be able to drop out, and, and we want to be able to show blitz and come, right? So that's just a little reminder there. So as you're developing these, make sure there's times where you're doing some of that as well. Stay gap sound for the most part when you're developing these patterns, right? You want to be able to run them on, on multiple downs and distances. You don't want to have to be, you know, pigeonholed into certain times when you can run these. So in my opinion, uh, staying gap sound allows you to, to do that and be able to run them whenever you want, really. Um, number three, don't forget your overhangs, you know, meaning if they come out in a certain formation, three by one, for example, where you're going to blitz that field backer, but now all of a sudden, you know, they're in three by one and you're going to blitz that, that, that field backer, that nickel, that Falcon, that Sam, whatever you call them. Now you have no overhang on your defense, right? So maybe you exchange that off to the mic. Um, that way you're still able to have those overhangs. Um, breakdown protections, right? Back in the day, I think, you know, 20 years ago, I know myself included, um, some coaches I played for just called blitzes to call them, right? I, why not have a, a, a rhyme or reason, have a system in place to where you're blitzing for a reason, right? You're blitzing to break down protections. You know, they're in a full slide. So you're going to attack, you know, off the edge to the, to the running back side. All right. Or maybe they're half man, half slide. So you want to attack maybe the running back there or maybe it's, you know, whatever it is. And you want to attack the two A gaps. Right. So package the blitz together and blitz the formation that you're seeing so that you're, you're giving yourself the best chance to succeed, to pressure the quarterback and ultimately, you know, whether either sack them or get the ball out quickly. A couple patterns that we run um, quite often and try to take advantage of. And again, by no means is this all of them. You know, you can design 
any pattern you want, but some of the more, you know, prevalent ones, more popular ones that we, we do, we'll, we'll go double edge, which is, you know, pretty much everybody in America will run. We'll bring both, both outside backers off the edge. We'll bring them both underneath and, and blitz the face of the tackles and, and, you know, go in the B gaps there, which is pretty much the same deal. We'll go double A gap, you know, which has become very popular. You know, again, Coach Narduzzi made that popular back in the, you know, his Michigan State days. And now at Pitt, they still do it quite a bit, the cross dogs, all that. Um, and then your America's Zone Blitz, which, which are very versatile. Um, you know, we really have one or two calls for these, and you can see how versatile they can be. You know, just based on our rules, we can blitz the field. We can blitz from the boundary. We can blitz the back. We can blitz opposite the back. We can blitz to the strong and the weak side. Heck, there's games where we blitzed certain linemen. If there was an offensive lineman, an offensive tackle, we would we would activate our blitz based on a, a certain player, right? Because we always wanted the blitz to come from that side or that person or that formation or whatever you want. Um, so if you build your rules in, then you're able to do some of that. But again, that's a whole separate discussion. Um, would love to talk ball with anybody if they got a better way to do it. Um, these are things that you know I've stolen and. You know, we've come up with over the years and tried to make them our own. And, and again, just some of the patterns that that we we like and are familiar with. All right. So a little bit about the coverage, some of the philosophy behind it, some of the rules, and then we'll get to the film. So, like I said, it's three deep, two under <clears throat> your hot players. They're the two under. Right. Your hot players. We call them hot players. They're the two underneath the fender. Um, hence the name of the coverage. Um and they protect the seams. So you can think of it however you want to. At the end of the day, like I said, depending on the blitz pattern you have, whoever you have left, you're going to have two hot players. You're going to have one deep middle third player, which you know we, we call him a delay high hole safety. He's in the high hole. Right? We hate to say thirds to our players. Um, here we'll, we can talk thirds, but he's the. it's all based in relative to the formation. Obviously, obviously if it's a two-by-two two set, well – yeah, the third's probably going to be in the middle of the field, roughly. But if it's a three by one set, that 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 third, that middle third, that middle hole, that's going to be not necessarily in the middle of the field. That's going to be in the middle of the formation, right? In the middle of that three by side. And then finally, you're going to have two outside third defenders. Um, and again, depending on the the blitz pattern that you develop developed. Um, it could be both corners. Usually it's the corners, but there's a lot of times that if you blitz a corner, well, now it's not, you know, so you're going to have two outside third players, one middle third player and two hot players. A couple things here with your, um, your hot players in particular, but also your deep outside third and middle third players. They have to understand the keys. So our directional keys, which is basically going to tell us what we are doing. So once the ball snapped, our eyes all right, are on the quarterback. All right. Which way does he look? Which way does he turn? That will dictate to us what we do. Okay. And I'll go over that in a second. And then secondly, the delivery key. And normally this is when the quarterback's about to throw the ball. He takes his hand off the ball. That's when we are going to um, – you know, be able to to make a break and, and break on the football. So some special techniques here um, of each of those three different players. Number one, for our cornerbacks. So again, generally speaking, a corner this is when they're not blitzing. So this would not be a corner blitz. This is when a corner is is going to play his outside third. In our defense, we're going to show press no matter what. Unless it's unless it's a three by one set where we're going to play a, a you know maybe a three by one adjustment, then we'll be off coverage. But if it's if it's versus one or two receivers, we're going to show press. If we have a single receiver, we are going to bail on the snap of the ball with our eyes on the quarterback. So all all it is is a bail technique. All right, eyes on the quarterback. All right. If we have two speed two wide receivers to our side. All right. We're going to bait him. We're going to pre-snap bail. And then we're going to overlap number two, depending on where the quarterback looks. So down to here now. So again, back to the rule. One quarter, one, one receiver, bail on the snap of the ball, two receivers. We need to pre-snap bail just because if two runs up that hash mark, we got to be able to overlap him if needed. All right. 
So now to our rules. As we are bailing out, whether it's on the snap of the ball or pre-snap, if the quarterback looks away from me, so let's all assume I'm the court on the on the defensive side, I'm on the defense's right. If the quarterback looks to the other side of the field <clears throat> as I bail, I am going to overlap the number two receiver. All right. If he looks at me, I am going to bail and stay over top of my number one receiver. All right. So I hope that makes sense. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll show this and talk about this once we get to the film. So that's the cornerback. So again, I'm bailing out. I'm bailing to my third per se. I'm giving quote marks. I'm getting bailing to my third. And then if he looks at me, I'm staying where I'm at. If he looks away from me, I am moving in that direction and hopefully overlapping my number two receiver. Second technique is our deep safety. So this is the middle third safety, which we call a delay high hole safety. He's the guy in the middle. We say delay because we just don't want to bail out of there and fly out of there. And he's our high hole safety. So there's a lot of carryover, a lot of overlap in our cover one technique as well. But he's going to take three shuffle steps, reading the quarterback for runner pass. So again, we're going to be showing quarters. Snap of the ball. Whoever our delay high hole safety is, he's going to start shuffling to the middle of the field, reading runner pass. If it's run, just like in a cover one type mindset, he's going to put his foot in the ground. All right. And he's going to come down on top of the football. And if it would happen to get to him, anything would happen and blocker would get to him. He's going to spill the ball to the two outside seam defenders, to the two hot players. If it's pass, well, then – on his third shuffle, he's going to read the quarterback's eyes, just like everybody else is doing, and he's going to squeeze to the number two the receiver to the side the quarterback is looking. So, again, if I'm in the middle of the field and quarterback looks to my right, I am going to squeeze and slide to the number two receiver to the right. If he looks to the left, I am going to move to the left. All right. Final thing. If we have a three-by-one set, so three speed or three displaced wide receivers, we're going to do the same thing, except we, we call it a torch technique, which basically is we want to clear the number three going vertical before working to the middle of the field. So basically what that means is just like the technique we're using, we, we want to sit there for maybe another second. We're going to shuffle and hang out on top of number three um, to prevent – them just running a little stick route right there. Uh, number three running a little hook or a little stick route, five-yard um, hitch route. Um, we want to hang out there because they just pop it to them there. You know, there's a little hole in the defense, and that's where we're there to just kind of protect that and be there to make the tackle versus, you know, giving up a, a, incomplete, a, a quick completion and us bailing out to the deep middle of the field. All right, so we just use that. We, we call that a torch technique which he's just kind of the point of the torch. He's just hanging out up top there, clearing three vertical, making sure three releases vertical before he runs out of there. And then the final part, which is our hot players, and then we'll get to some film here for the last um, uh, 20, 30 minutes or so, is our hot players, our seam defenders. Now, this is what defines the defense. So this is very important, um, but, but similar techniques to what we talked about already. All right, hot players. So... Let's talk about alignment first. So this is generally speaking, um, a linebacker or a safety. All right, linebacker or a safety. So whether we're disguising, well, we're always going to disguise. So it's always going to show our quarter structure, too high shell. Um, <clears throat> if you have a removed number two receiver, so just say a slot receiver, I don't care if it's a safety coming down from, from the roof or a linebacker apexed out. We want to be up two yards inside and seven yards deep off that inside receiver when the ball is snapped. So, again, do your best to, to you know, disguise that. But once the ball is snapped, we're going to be about two by seven inside that number two receiver. If there is no number two receiver and it's attached tight end, which he could be the number two receiver, or it could be an offensive tackle, maybe number two is in the backfield. <clears throat> well, then we want to be two by seven, but we want to be outside that tight end or offensive tackle. Right. Because, again, there's only two underneath defenders. So we got to protect, you know, that side of the field, per se. What to do when they sprint out? <clears throat> Very similar rules. If they're able to get out, 
You know, they shouldn't be able to get out very easily because of the the blitz pattern you're running. You're bringing six guys, and hopefully if they're coached up correctly, you know, the edge of the defense is going to at least force them to bubble back and shouldn't be able to sprint out um, that effectively. But it does happen. Um, so our rule for the hot players, if they sprint out, we sprint out, right? So, again, kind of back to the original rules, if the quarterback looks one way, well, we're, go- we're, we're going that way. So if he sprints out one way, that means he's looking there, which means we're going to go there as well. So both hot players, if the quarterback sprints out to the to his left, which is our right, means we're going to take off and sprint to our right the way he's going. A couple things here now with those hot players. So, again, they're going to both going to be two by seven. Um, if the quarterback looks at me, so I'm going to pop my feet, picture old school, you know, keep your, you know, kind of like you're doing old up downs, treating the ground like a hot stove, ball snapped. We're going to pop our feet in place, read the quarterback. All right. His eyes are on me. I'm going to hold my landmark. That's two by seven. I'm going to hold it. I'm waiting for him. I'm waiting for the trigger. I'm waiting for that hand to come off the ball. All right. And ready to make a break on it. If his eyes are away from me, right, I am going to sprint to get into his vision. All right. So, again, I'll show you in the film, but if I'm the guy on the right, the hot player on the right, and he looks at me, I'm going to be standing there. All right. If I'm the hot player on this side and he looks away from me, I am going to be sprinting across the field trying to get into his vision. Finally, if they run the ball, As a hot player, again, we're bringing six. Um, We're gapped out for the most part. Um, You know, when when we call these verse run situations, we we will be gapped out. Um, The ball would break somewhere. Both hot players want to keep the ball on their inside shoulder and force it to the middle of the field defender, right? And finally, as a hot player, if it's pass, you know, normally in most in our defense, we reroute receivers. You know, um, if they run any type of zone read, bubble stuff, play action fake, we need to ignore all that because all we care about is eyes on the quarterback and when he's throwing the ball. Because there should not be time to pump fake. There should not be time to uh, look off and look the other way. Like I said, if that's happening, you have a bad blitz pattern designed. You're not blitzing the right people. Um, um, yeah, that doesn't happen very often. And, and, and if he does do that, he should be getting hit right in the mouth. So that's what I got. That's that's all the info. I know it's a lot. Um, but if you can get that figured out and get that, you know, down, um, it's very, very effective. So, Coach, is, is the video up here now? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. So – I got these kind of in order uh, of the styles of the blitz patterns. Again, I'd I'd kind of disregard that. You can design any type of blitz you like. Um, But these first few are going to be, you know, our America zone blitz. So we're blitzing a corner. And I don't know, high school football, we love blitzing the corner just because our hashes are so wide. Um, But we're bringing America zone blitz from the boundary here. All right. So we're bringing six. We're we're sticking our line um, opposite. We're bringing six from the boundary. Our hot players are our two linebackers that are left, right? And then these three will be, you know, again, in essence, deep third players, right? But it again, like I said at the very beginning, it's all in relation to what does the formation. What is the formation? They got three by one. Well, my delay high hole safety, he better be cheated to that side, right? We're bringing the corner. Remember, our edge players – our edge players are peel alert. So if the back would swing in either direction, we would we should peel with that. Now I say that that's our rules, and and we got to do a better job of coaching it because there's probably half the time where we haven't peeled, and you know just trying to coach these kids up. Hey, you're blitzing off the edge. You know you got to be able to peel with that. But here's a good structure. Again, we're bringing six off the boundary. Watch our two hot players. So again, right now the quarterback is running a little fake zone read bubble so the quarterback is looking this way he's taught to hold his ground he's taught to sprint into his vision so if we watch his mike linebacker here the minute the quarterback catches the ball and looks 
bump. He should be sprinting, which he's doing. Very good. Let's watch this hot player up here. He should be holding his ground. Boom. Good. Sees the ball thrown. We're going to react again. Keep the ball on the inside. Keep the ball on the inside. You're top down. That's pretty good. So, again, we're bringing six, forcing the ball out. All eyes, one, two, with our hot players. And then our three deep defenders, all eyes are on the quarterback, seeing the ball thrown and rallying up to make a good tackle. Here it is again. All, all the, I think the first 15 or so clips, I'll fly through them a little bit, but they're all going to be corner. America's own blitz. We're bringing six from the boundary. All right. Again, a little toss sweep action to the field here. Again, pressure's coming from the boundary, and, it, it, you know, again, we love this versus the run. Showing too high here. Contain the football. Pressure's coming from the boundary. Again, just kind of suffocates team. This is first and 10. You know, we love it on first and 10. Good job down here by this receiver. He's got his tail able to overlap number two if two runs up the hash. One runs here. He's able to overlap two if he needs be, if the quarterback looks away from him. Here's my two safeties. Doing a decent job of showing too high. I wish he'd back up a little bit. Here's a good alignment. Two by seven. Two by seven off the number two receiver. Again, he's got to keep the ball on his inside shoulder. Good. Another one here. All right, here's a good video, good picture, same pressure, same blitz pattern. All these first ones are coming off the edge, contain. We're all short sticking, some of us long sticking to the field here. Playing hot coverage behind it. So here it is again. Looks like they're they're trying to pop a little uh, a little snag route here, maybe. Right? Quarterback's looking. He's trying to throw it. All right. My hot player probably didn't do a great job. He's reacting too much. Remember, if he looks at me, stay there. Do not trigger until the ball comes off his hand. This guy does a really good job. Boom. What I tell you at the beginning, though, if you pat the ball, if you try to look off, you should be getting hit in the mouth. Now, albeit we missed him, that should be a sack fumble, hopefully. Most situations, you don't even see them coming. <clears throat> you see the hesitation there by the corner. <clears throat> but, again, ball's thrown right there. It's probably an interception. Eyes are on the quarterback. We end up getting them down at the end. Another picture here. All right, this is the first game of this kid's, you know, life. Never played ball before, but he's coming off the edge. He shouldn't be showing it that much. And again, uh, probably kind of a bad play altogether here. You know, if you're ever on block, you never want to jump. But nonetheless, the whole point of me showing this is, here's my two hot players. All right, eyes on the quarterback. Let's watch this one down here first. Where's the quarterback look? He looks here. Hold your ground. Hand off the ball. Go. So if he threw that ball, which he even if he threw it the first time, we're going to get a nice TFL there on a on a on a pass. Pushing point here. This is not good. Again, what did I say? He's a hot player. Two by seven inside of number two. Quarterback catches this and looks here immediately. He should be sprinting to get in the quarterback's vision. Right there. He should be sprinting here. He should be about right about here by now. Right. Quarterback's looking here. The delay high hold safety should be working over this way. This corner should be working to two. This corner, who's our safety in this picture, is in good shape. Here's one versus a nub tight end. Nub tight end. So, again, we're bringing the corner. We're all sticking to the field here. Hot player, hot player, third, third third so again good alignment good alignment good eyes good depth bringing six you know the heck they got they got seven man protection and still can't 
figure it out. Even if they get rid of it here, they're running stick. Great job seeing the quarterback. Quarterback's looking at him. Hold your ground. Good eyes. Can't see the other two. But I think we're going to be in good shape there. Here's one where we do not do it correctly. So we have a good call on. It's second and 10. So again, doesn't matter down in distance to us. We're gap sound. We're bringing the corner. We're coming off the edge. Running back swings here. So as we're as we're a contained blitzer, if we're the edge contained blitzer, if he crosses our face, we're going to peel. So you can see what would happen here if this corner did it correctly and peeled. If, if he either catches the ball and gets a pick six, or he allows seven to hit him right in the mouth. So right there, we want to peel with that. Nonetheless, even though we didn't peel. Our hot players in this picture. So again, two by seven inside of number two. His number two here, two by seven inside of him. Eyes are on the quarterback. Third, delay third, third, eyes on the quarterback. He catches us immediately and looks this way. So he should hold his ground. Sprinting that way. He should overlap number two he should be going over here to number two and he should stay on number one so in essence this receiver if he ran all the way down the field would you know have some room and that's the whole design of the coverage it'll never get to that point let's watch number eight here quarterback looks away from him pops his feet sees a quarterback look you can see him start sprinting in division you know, if they start to pop one of these balls, he's there, he's there to make a play. Watch 44. Hold your ground. He's looking my way. React to what you see. TFL. Watch 18. Where's the quarterback looking? Quarterback's looking here. He should start overlapping to this hash mark here if he's vertical. Now he's not really vertical. He sees him going and under right now. So he can just stay back in his third on top of him. Watch his safety. Again, quarterback looks this way. Now they're running mesh, but if, if somebody would be up the hash, he'd be able to squeeze to that side. Either way, he's going to work that way, which he's doing there. You can see five kind of eyeballing that. Everybody's doing a pretty good job there other than our peel defender. One more out of this, and then we'll get on to another blitz pattern. Same deal, coming off the boundary. We love this on gap versus gap scheme. This is a this is a Y off. Looks like just ISO lead could be outside zone. Whatever it is, it's second and one. We're all slanting this way. We're coming off the edge. He's my third hot player, hot player, third, third. Great versus gap scheme, great versus zone scheme. TFL on second and one. Love it, love it, love it. If the ball would break, he's going to keep the ball on his inside shoulder. This hot player is going to keep the ball on his inside shoulder. And my safety eventually will come down here and be the top of the triangle right there. That's, that's our run fits for those three players. Good one there. All right, here we go. Here's what last one, and we'll move on. Same deal. Now, this is out of our Oki front. It's second and 18. So it's our three down package. Again, same deal. We're bringing from the boundary. Hot player, hot player. I love the leverage. Third, third, third. Bring in a corner. Boom. Here they come. Quarterback again. Feeling the heat, getting rid of the ball, throws it up. Reason we get a pick six here is because all eyes are on the quarterback. All eyes are on the quarterback. We're able to get the get the pick and get into the end zone. So really, really good. It, it you know we said it, it's an interception coverage. Um, 
really good change up to what we do. So here's one now. <clears throat> so instead of that was our boundary America zone blitz. Now we're going to come from the field. All right. Now this is actually we we add an under tag to it, so it just tells us now we're coming from the field. So our two backers, our Falcon, our Sam, and our Mike, um, we add under the defensive ends that contain player. So it ends up just being an offset double A gap pressure. Again, we're bringing six, and that's our pattern. We're going to play hot coverage behind it. Hot player, hot player, third, third, third. So, again, drop whatever pattern you want. Um, again, don't get home necessarily. We're blocked, but we're bringing pressure. We got movement. Causes indecision for the quarterback. Eyes are all ready to go. He's got a guy open, but, you know, most guys aren't going to stare down that gun barrel over and over and over again. Again, third down and 12, multiple situations. We like it. Oki, so we're moving around. Really don't know where we're coming from. We're coming from the field here, all right, which in, in this picture is down here, all right. Coming from the field, we're playing hot coverage behind it. Good job here. Popping out, hot player, hot player, third, third, third. Here's our press bail down here. Doesn't not a, not a great press, but nonetheless, he's bailing out. Eyes on the quarterback. Watch the guy up top. Press bail. Eyes on the quarterback. He run a little waggle bootleg play. The pressure doesn't get home. He actually gets the ball out. And actually gets tipped. But you can see my hot player right here. Again, what's his rules? Don't go for the fake. Don't go for the fake. Eyes on the quarterback. Boom. I think if he did throw it, he probably picks it off. Worst case scenario, we're going to have a, a big time collision there. All right. Again, doubles, two by two stack. Doesn't matter. We're coming from the field now, coming off the edge, field edge. All right. Hot player, boundary safety, hot player, third. I'm sorry. Third. Hot, hot. Ready to play ball. Here comes our Falcon. Good. Coming off the edge. So, again, just coming from the field. Here we go. Coming from the field again up top. Coming from the field. Third and six. This is, a, this is an answer a lot, a lot of teams will have. Hot player, hot player. The only thing I don't like about this is there's no need to backpedal. Just hang out there. You're hot, seven yards. So that's incorrect there. He should be sitting here popping his feet, ready to trigger. He's our whole third, deep third. He's our third. There's our other third. Eight does a good job of sprinting. But great job here by the cornerback. Press bail, ball thrown, go. Make a good tackle, get off the field. Fourth and one. Down the red zone. Translates very good, like I said at the beginning. Remember, it's three deep, two under. Down here, we're all going to play at the goal line roughly. Now, this guy's choosing to press bail and do it, but nonetheless, he's kind of your outside, you know, hole. And, you know, that cover seven, everybody's running now. He's your next one. He's your next one. He's your next one. He's your next one. End of the day. Any type of crossers, any type of, you know, pick routes, we should have it all taken care of. Here comes coming from the field again. So coming from the field under. So we're going C gap, B gap, A gap. Pressure coming from the field. All eyes in the red zone. We get pressure. Quarterback gets rid of it. They're trying to throw a little bit of a tunnel screen here. Uh, even if they did complete it, we got two guys, three guys ready to jump it. All right. Next version we like is strong and weak. You know, we, we find this very good versus, um, you know, gap scheme. I love this versus power and counter. Um, we love coming from the weak side on power and counter. All right. This happens to be third and six. <clears throat> We're coming from the weak side. This is actually an unbalanced formation. They got a tight end, receiver, receiver. They're going to jet motion across, sprint out. We're coming from the weak side. All right, hot player, hot player. Again, third, third, third. 
all eyes on the quarterback. Again, remember what I said at the beginning, if they're going to sprint out, now I'll be at this kid falls down, but – I, I'm pretty safe to say that if he sprints out, we're gonna we're gonna keep him contained and we're gonna end up catching up from behind here. You can see my front side defensive end is doing a good job of kind of working flat because we will eventually get to him. But you can see in the coverage aspect, we're trying to run a little slant slant arrow. We do a decent job here of, of picking that up. Same thing. Two by one. All right, kind of a split back set. We're coming from the weak side. You see the safety does a great job of timing this up. We're all slanting to the field here or to the strength. Great timing there by the safety. All right, my field end here needs to do a better job of containing this, keeping it on his inside shoulder because we're coming from the other side. But, again, the movement catches it from behind. Great job by 42 here. Popping his feet as the hot player. Boom. If the ball breaks, keep it on your inside shoulder. Here's the other hot player. Keep it on your inside shoulder. Here's my safety. Top down. Four, cornerback. He's got two receivers here. So he's going to pre-snap. Bail. Ready to overlap two if he has to. Corner up top. That's just a regular post-snap bail because he's only got one receiver. Again, good eyes. I love the eyes. Look at the eyes. A lot of people, us included, a lot of times I'll refer to it as eyes coverage just to remind the kids what we're looking at. Here's a great one. Again, weak side. We love it from the weak side. We love it versus power and counter this way. We love to track it down from behind. Cross face on all these down blocks you're going to get. Great job. Not sh Great job in sh disguising it, right? Hold your water. Hold your water. Here goes quarterback counter coming back. All right, one good coaching point here. So number one coming off the edge is our contained player. Number eight here, he's a spill player now. If he gets any type of puller, he must go underneath it, must spill the ball. Right there, you see him go outside of this block. All right, ideally he goes, again, goes under that. Goes under that, forces this ball here to our hot player who's unblocked. Again, weak side. Good old, it's a state championship game in the snow. December 9th, we're coming from the weak side. They're running power read to the field. All right, so power read to the field. Contain. We're going to try to track that down from behind. Hot player, hot player, third, third, third. In this picture here, remember what I said early on, if you remove number two, we want to be two by seven inside. Or it's a tight end, wing, we want to be two by seven outside. So I'd say this guy's probably a little bit misaligned. I'd like him a little bit wider just to maintain leverage on the defense. But, again, end of the day, this defensive end shouldn't let the ball outside of him. He needs to come with a little bit more force there on 32. Because right there, if he does pitch the ball, you know, I, I think we're probably not going to be in great shape. I mean, I, we'll track him down. I know the corner is going to show up. I know the safety is going to show up. But in a perfect world, we should be outside of this block because we got everybody else coming. So that's a good coaching point that, hey, it doesn't always, you know, your kids don't always do it correctly. But at the end of the day, I think, I think, you know, they're running this power read pitch play. He's reading this guy. So in his, in his vision right now, he's wide, which tells him to keep it. So we got we, – we forced the read. We forced the keep by the quarterback right into us, our, us blitzing, you know, six guys. Right on. Yeah, I love it, man. Yeah, a couple more here. We're still going, Coach? Yeah, Jeff's in the Jeff's backstage waiting. I'm gonna bring him on, just coach, just so you meet Jeff. Awesome. Jeff Gallo. Uh, we got Eric speaking, Coach Casper. Uh, do you know Coach Coach Gallo? I, I I know of him. I don't think we've ever ever formally met though. What's up, Coach? Yeah, he he said what's up. I just wanted y'all to meet each other. I appreciate y'all coming on. Um. 
you know, uh, you know, for this good cause for autism and for the uh, family initiative. Um, so Eric, very impressed with you, man. I, I loved it, dude. I like, I'm going to hit you up. We'll talk some more about it. this. Yeah, man. I just do, you know, half the stuff I learned from a lot of great coaches, you know, you can make your own tweaks, different places you go, different players you have. And, um, you know, try I don't to want anybody it. watching this. I don't want nobody in Richmond, Virginia, any high school running that stuff, <laughs> man. Yeah, it, it's good stuff. There's no doubt. Um, but, you know, it's all in details and how you coach it. That's that's for sure. Yeah, brother. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, Eric. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have, have a great day. Appreciate it. Good luck. Hey, Jeff. Hey, can you hear me, Coach? Hey, can, can you hear me? No? Can you hear me? Let's see. I'm going to give you my, my phone number, Coach. Yeah, because you can't hear me, Coach. Can you hear me? I think you. I think your mic is muted, Coach. Or either, can you hear me? Because I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I think it's your mic. Now? Yeah, I can hear you now, Coach. Great. Give me some opening this up real quick. Yeah, brother. Am I am I am I on or are we back? Am I in the back room? Where am I at right now? I uh, know you. you we're, we're on. Um, nice. but you, yeah, Coach. I I don't really know how to cut this thing up, and I only got one link. So <laughs> yeah, but I, I'll coach you up, Coach, on how to present and everything. Awesome, man. Let me just get into this. Give me a second. Pull the video up. We'll get rolling. I'm Troy Taylor. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I'm hey, Troy. Coach I'm Elsie Jeff. Burke nice to meet you, man. How are you? Yeah. Nice. I'm doing good, man. We're going on hour number three. Nice. We only got about eight more left. <laughs> Grinding, man. Yeah. I did five hours with Bob Wiley on Saturday. Oh, it's awesome. That was awesome. Yeah. By the end, he was uh, asking his own questions and answering them. That's pretty <laughs> – we didn't even know until hour three that we were five. We were a five second delay. We'd ask a question and he couldn't even hear it for five seconds because he's watching it on YouTube. I so you. if you want to present, Coach, go down to the bottom uh, where it says present, and then you can collect. You can select a tab or a window, or you gotcha. can just share your whole screen, and then I add it to the stream. I'll share the screen. I want to make sure it's, it, it's optimized. Like the videos, usually I'm used to do this on Zoom, and I like optimize the video so it goes fast. Let's make sure it goes fast. If that's my biggest concern, I'll share the screen. Um, this window here, share it. Can you see that? Yeah, I, I just added it right now, Coach. You, I don't. I don't think you can see us, but we can see you, and I see your mammoth there. So if I hit know. this, what do you see if I hit that? It looks great. Let, let's just go. Uh, I want to make sure the video goes clean out. That's all. Because sometimes when you go share screen, the video gets a little choppy. Tell me. Um, I've got some slides here. Let me go through this and let me get to the video. And tell me if it's uh, if it's if it's choppy. If you're all right with it. Is it choppy on your end? Are you guys all right? No, it looks fine. Okay, cool. Give me a second. Let me some. Um, two things. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna about. I'm gonna remove the screen now, Coach. Okay. I'll, I'll 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 bring it back. 
um, once you get going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run to the bathroom real quick, Coach, and then we'll get going. Uh, no problem. We still got 15 said, minutes. What's that? We, we still got 15 minutes, but we can go ahead and get going, Coach. I got you. I didn't know if everyone's in here. I didn't know if uh, everybody was on this deal already. Right, that's all. Yeah, let me I, I, All right, coach it's it's 12 47 if you if you want to we can wait a few minutes uh, to get going we got we got a couple guys in here watching um you tell right me man now. i'm ready to go whenever I, I, I can i've been in the car recruiting for the last four days i've had too much coffee i got too much film so i don't think let's as much get time it. as you give me let's get it let's go okay so uh coach thank you for presenting today um uh, for the people that don't know you jeff could you just tell us a little bit about yourself um and where you're from where all you coached yeah, uh, my name is Jeff Gallo. I'm the offensive coordinator, tennis coach here at Monmouth University. Um, I've been here. We're, we're an oddity here at Monmouth. I've been here for um, you know really 18 years. Played here, uh, stayed on here. I've kind of moved my way up here. Started on the defensive side for two years and moved over to tight ends and kind of been promoted throughout. It's a great spot. Our head coach has been here for uh, 30 years. Started football here. Um, so it's really a, a great spot. Uh, I met uh, Coach Gibbs. He's a Manasquan guy. So I'm at the Jersey Shore. He's a Manasquan guy. Known him for a long time. He's a football guy. And um, really excited to do this clinic with you guys. I live here in New Jersey. And I'll take you through some of this. Just as in here is going to be some information. Give me a second. Yeah, that. Um, so this is so you get a feel for where we're at. This is Monmouth University right here, guys. And, uh, you know, we're right in the center of New Jersey. Okay, about a mile. This is the beach up here, about a mile from the beach. So Coach Gibbs, who put this whole thing on, he is about south, just south down the beach, about probably 15 minutes initially. He traded uh, the Jersey Shore for the Florida Gulf. God bless him. But, uh, yeah, FCS school here, just joined the CAA, started here. Um, we were in the Big South until 2021, joined the CAA in 22. That was our first year in the league. Uh, excited about the second year coming in. We've got a great staff, um, great location, great private school here in New Jersey. Like I said, just joined the CAA. Our head coach has said is, is one of the best coaches in college football. He's been here for 30 years, started football here. He's one of the winningest coaches in all of college football. Um, we are an outlier in that our staff has been together a long time. There's not a lot of turnover here. It truly is a family-type deal. Uh, I played here and been here throughout. Our old line coach, Brian Gabriel, might be one of the best old line coach is one of the best old line co coaches in the country. He's been here for 20 years. Um, Jimmy Robertson just joined us. He was the head coach at FDU. 
He uh, is coaching our quarterbacks, uh, Kevin Callahan Jr. Our head coach's son is uh, probably the best receivers coach in the country. He coaches our receivers and uh, Coach Dorsett as our running back coach has been with us about, you know, call it 10 years. Uh, our backup running back was selected, was uh, signed a free agent contract with the uh, Ravens this year. And our starting running back led the nation rushing. So Coach Dorsett has had the nation's leading rusher two out of the last four years. And he's had um, three NFL backs in the last five seasons. He's one of the best in the business period. Um, Jaden Sheridan is our splash player, obviously running back, average 8.4 yards a touch. He led the nation rushing in all of Division One football last year. He was a finalist for the Walter Payton Award. Phenomenal talent. And 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 what we've done here is uh, we're still, a, you know, on the base of us, we're an inside zone RPO team, but we've become much more of a, and what I want to talk about today, some speed motion, um, speed motion runs, play action, speed sweeps. We've it, Our runners are faster now. We're not the big bowler types. It used to be we have got fast kids. So we're trying to use that speed on the field and, and trying to make the linebackers adjust or safeties adjust or get some bumps or get people running with motion and see if we can hit a counter at the front door or a mid zone or even an inside zone at the back door. And that's what you're going to see on film here today. Uh, if you look at our offense in 2022, uh, in total offense, we averaged just uh, about 460 yards a game, which was good for ninth nationally and, and first in the CAA. Uh, scoring wise, we averaged just under 37 points a game this past season, which again was ninth nationally and, and first in the CAA. Um, to, and if you look, so we, you know, we're good on offense. We've got really good quarterback play, O line play, receiver play. Um, we've got good players on offense, um, and, and we're very fortunate. We have good coaches on our staff. If you look at us, 20% of all of our calls, we use some sort of speed motion. We went back and studied this. Right, so we want to be a moving target. We're either going to one play with some tempo on you. We can, you know, we can play fast. We can freeze it. We have the one word packages, right? And if we're not doing that world, we're probably going to use some hard motion, trade motion, or speed motion. We're not just going to be a static sitting duck that you're going to kind of tee off on. Right? I know the last guy I heard a little bit talking about six man pressures and all that, and we don't want people blitzing six six at us. I don't have a lot of great plays except for Chuck it or, you know find a seam. So we want to make you hit a moving target. Okay. Our average gain on offense was, you know, 7.4, six, nine, a run and nine, four pass uh, with this, with the speed motion, right? So when we brought speed motion, we we're average seven point yards, uh, 7.4 play. And then I'm base down. So, you know, cause we'll run this on fourth down and in the low red and all that. So on just base downs that, that run average goes up a little bit, even more that overall average goes up more. And so is the run average to seven, two. So there's some big splash runs here. Okay. Sorry, Coach. I hit the wrong button. Here we go. It's good. Uh, I messed it up. <laughs> you back yeah, to me or not? Uh, hold on. There you go, Coach. You got Sorry me? That. Yes, sir. It's great. Gotcha. What did you get? Um, can I keep going from here? Am I good with that? You're good. Yep. How defenses react? You haven't gone over that yet. That's good. No, here we go. So, so we when we looked at this speed motion stuff, and we talked to a bunch of other staffs who are doing it. And you're watching the NFL. You know, Niners do a lot of it, and uh, the Rams do a lot of it, and um, you know, you talk to other teams who are doing it. Right? You're looking at first of all, how are how are defenses reacting to it? Right? Well, when you get some bump linebackers, you know, maybe you're playing out of eleven personnel, you know, and you're getting a two high quarters kind of look, and line, the first thing you get is the linebackers bump. So if your linebackers are bumping. You know, what do we like about the speed motion? One, we can eliminate a run defender from the box. You know, if they want to stay in that too high shell, maybe you can eliminate a better box defender. I can eliminate your will or your mic in an FSL picture. So I can eliminate a better run defender from the box, and I can force a lesser tackler into the box. If I can motion you and get your maybe your nickel Sam and bump him into the box and eliminate your will, I, I like that. I'm, I'm getting a worse, a worse player in the box. All right? And then it can cause some just gap fit issues. Right off of the bump, and you'll see this in a second. Off of all the different bumps, all right. If we're going bump and split flow, and you're a back fit team, you know how's the will playing that? You know, can I get the mic size to cheat and keep him front side and create a gap issue uh, within the the front six and or seven? So with, with bump alignment, you know that's what we think we're going to be able to attack. Two safeties will rock. It's a one high scope maybe, and the safeties just rock. Maybe you're playing a three safety scope defense, all right? So the safeties are uh, rock to account for the new passing strength or formational strength. Well, you know, what do you get out of that? Well, one, you can eliminate a run defender from a low fit. I mean, hey, if we go hard speed motion, that low safety rock starts to rock up high. 
All right, I've eliminated him from a run fit. Maybe I'm trying to run back at that motion spot. Two, I can generate some force issues, right? If you're maybe you're you're a sky or safety support team, right? As you motion, you rock him high, it becomes a backer support. You got to get that all communicated quickly. So I can generate some force issues. Maybe I can see a ball getting to the edge. And you'll see all these things on the film here. And then three, you know, you can make a run fitter transition, uh, really transition from low back to high. So, hey, I'll make that as we go speed motion, that low guy starts to play high. Then he's got a hard transition to come back and run that alley again. Make, you know, make safeties move, make them transition, even quarter safeties. Don't let them just stand there, read, you know, pattern read it or read through the backfield and, and come downhill at you. Make them react, adjust, then react to run. Almost go, hey, from run to pass back to run at times. All right, so we want to get those safeties moving and try to refit into a run. And the last one, right, maybe they run with the motion. All right, so it's a man-to-man, right? The man-to-man player handles the speed motion. Well, what does that give you? Well, it can cause confusion and potential pass-offs. You saw in the Super Bowl with the Chiefs, right, you start getting that guy going motion in and bring him back out and the, and the potential pass-offs of how they're handling it. Um, two, it can create some natural rubs in the run in the pass game. You've seen sometimes where maybe the nickel Sam or the safety's trying to run with that slot receiver all the way through the box and – you know, he goes underneath the mic or the will, and all of a sudden they got to bump it over. Uh, and then also in the pass game as well, just passing off routes. And then three, you can just tire out. Those guys are running man to man across the field and tire out man runners. So, how the defense react, right? Bump, rock, or run, and then what you think you get out of it, right? That's the idea of it. And you'll see this on tape here. All right. Why do we like this, right? Why do we like to bring some speed motion to what we do? Like we just said, one, it can eliminate a hat in the run game, two, it can create some confusion and misdirection. Right. We want to, we, again, we want to give you eye candy, even for the linebackers. So they're just not initially coming right downhill at you. Make them, make them talk, make them diagnose it. Give me another half second. Uh, let our linemen sit on a, a double for a half more second. Right. That, that counts. So create some confusion with the misdirection. Again, for, like we said before, force a lesser defender to play into the box can create some leverage for us, you know, with force issues or, you know, just say hey, as we get bumps. Uh, it can get the ball to your speed guy because we start with speed sweep. We'll go over that in a second, but it can get it can get the uh, easy touch to a fast guy with your speed sweep game, and then it makes the defense constantly communicate, right? Make them hit a moving target, right? We don't want to just sit there and let you tee up on, tee off on us, you know. Defenses are so good, and there's so many good blitz packages. I know Coach Brown's going to talk on this thing at some point, and all the stuff they do. You know, you if you just sit there static, they're going to tee off on you. So you got to really make them hit a moving target, and, and we can be aggressive with it as well. When do you want to bring the motion? Well, early in the game to get your playmaker a touch. If you're going speed sweep, get him a touch early. Get him going. All right, two, you know, base downs versus aggressive defenses. You know, heavy blitz or they're cutting the front up and they're they're making it a mess in the box. Maybe you can get the ball out to the edge or, or you can create a seam and some confusion. So on, the, on base downs against aggressive defenses in the high red zone, Maybe you're hitting a speed sweep or you're going to throw off. You get your play action throw off at your high red zone shot off of speed motion. All right. Short yardage. Short yards. Maybe you want to run inside zone. Or you want to run power or counter. Well, let's bring some hard motion to it. Make them adjust. Make them bump. Okay. Short yardage runs. And then also in four minute. Right. In four minutes. Don't just, you know, you, you got to run. You know, you got to run the ball. They know you got to run the ball. Okay. What can we do to be different? You know, can we show you unbalanced and then can we motion? You know, can we can we make you guys communicate and talk on defense? And also coming out, you know, you're backed up. The ball's on the two yard line. Again, you got to run it there, All right? Or you want to throw a play action shot? Put some hard speed motion to it, right? Take a shot off it. Make people bump or adjust. Or on the goal line going in, same thing. You want to run? You got to get a yard or two, right? Good times to just give some more eye candy to stuff, or give it to that speed guy. We've you know we'll run some speed sweep on the four yard line and get our fast guy just trying to circle that boundary, put his foot in the ground, and knife it. Okay, so that's, you know, why and when we like it. All right, and then our tactics when we're doing this. What are our tactics of attack? How are we using this thing, right? So, one, it starts with speed sweep, and we'll go through that in a minute here. We are going to give the ball to the motion runner, our speed motion runner. Right? We're going to bring him in full speed. We're going to snap it off so he gets the edge of the tackle box, and we're going to you know, usually run a, a wrong way run and get the ball at the back door of it. So it starts with speed sweep. They've got to respect this. Give it to the fast guy. You got a fast guy, get him a touch. You know, you got a five eight slot receiver who can run, you know, who's fast, who's legitimately fast. You know, get him going, get him running. All right. After that, our downhill run game, whether it be counter, split flow inside zone, getting downhill at you. Get the linebackers bumping and moving, get the defense rocking, and then come right back downhill at them and come get downhill on them. 
All right. And then, hey, get some wider, wide, wider aiming run game, you know, so you maybe want to run mid zone. All right. Or even pin pull. All right. You maybe you want to create some leverage and really to get yourself to that backside linebacker. All right. In college, that backside, you run mid zone or even pin pull that will, that backside linebacker, he's tough to get to. So can you hold them? Can you bring motion from the front side, maybe eliminate a front side defender and hold that will linebacker? Just create some leverage to get to that linebacker, right? Create leverage to get to backside linebackers. A big deal in the run game there, right? And then your shot play, right? We're going to come at you with a shot play, either a play action or a stag off a full slide, um, and we're going to take a shot down the field. And then the freeze, you know, can we steal five yards? Bring hard motion and just hard dead cadence it, see if you'll jump off sides. Right. See if you'll jump off sides. Can we steal five yards right there? Right. So we're going to start, give the fast guy the ball, speed sweep it, come back, then come right downhill on him. Right. Then get to your wider run game, mid zone, pin pull, then take your shot, come up over the top. Could be a high red zone deal. You know, could be a ball's in the middle of the field and you want, you want to push you trying to score. Right. And then freeze him, steal five yards. Could be a good third and third and three, third and four. You know, break the huddle maybe you're in 12 personnel. All right, come out, hard speed motion, dead cadence. It's him to jump, steal five yards, best five yards in football. All right, and, and and when you build this out, okay, as you build out your package of this, it allows you to sequence calls from series to series or within a drive. Okay, hey, we came out, ran the speed sweep. You know, how did the defense react? Okay, where are we going next? All right, within that, within, you know, either from series to series or within a drive even. You know, and we'll see some of that in here. And then we're going to come at you multiple personnel groupings, multiple formations. We'll do this at 12, 11, 10 at times, right? Or even like a, a flex kind of 11 where that, that tight end's kind of moving all over the place, kind of find them, you know? So we'll, we'll do it multiple personnel, multiple formations and do a lot. We can build this whole thing out, right? So that's you know how we're going to come at you, all right? And just some, as you're doing it, things we've seen, adjustments, and we'll go through this especially as you get into the run game. Right. As you're bringing motion, you're creating some confusion on the defense. You want to make sure the offense is on the same page, especially your front six and seven offensive linemen, tight ends. You want to make sure they're sharp and you get hats on hats. You want their seven, six or seven hats on the most dangerous six or seven hats. And so we'll have a turf call. We'll go through later in the film here. It tells the line here's motion coming. Protection wise, sometimes we won't lock into a point. We'll full slide a protection if we're just going to push the ball out and read one side of the field. So some full slide protections. Or if we're going to six-man or five-man pro it, we'll push the protection back, all right, away from the speed motion to make sure our, our quarterback's protected on his backside and his eyes are on the front side. We'll use a speed motion where we're going to snap the ball off as the speed guy comes to the front side of uh, the edge of the uh, of the tackle box. We use an over motion, so an in-up and over kind of orbit motion as well uh, to get ourselves into some potential bubble phase or – um, or if we want to go drop back pass and keep him out of the way of the backside tackle setting. And then we have some through motion where we're going to let that guy come fast through and clear the backside of the box, then snap it off. So maybe he comes a legit number two receiver at the backside and you have to count for him. Maybe want to run him on a wheel. All right. Um, so we have three differentiated motions that we'll use as we get as we get going with it. And then we'll also have a different cadence as well. So the line knows, hey, this won't be as rhythmic. If you're, if you're a clap team, you got to probably figure that out. Uh, but we're we're a cadence team. We're a true cadence team. So we'll have we'll have a different. We're, we can be rhythmic at times when you're bringing the motion. You're going to get away from that rhythmic cadence. So uh, the cadence will dictate. So the line knows this is not our standard cadence. This might have a little more of a pause in it because of course I got to time that thing up. Okay. So that's some adjustments we've seen that we've made over time and talking with people you see. So let's get on to the tape. Let's start with the speed sweep, okay? And when we talk speed sweeps, you guys understand. Quick slides, so you understand it. So right here, this is the top picture. We're running um, really wrong way run, right? So sweep. It's a speed sweep at the backside of the called run scheme. So in this top right picture, we'd be calling, like, let's call our GT counter scheme going to the right. So we call GT counter sweep right, right? The line's going to block for the sweep right, and we're going to get the ball to the speed guy and run out the backside of it. So your wrong way run. All right, so the speed motion guy is going to be the guy getting the football. For the speed receiver, right, he's going to run at the quarterback's feet. All right, he's going to take the – he's going to – the course going to pop up. He's going to take the pop pass from the quarterback and have a circle of the field or boundary mentality. We're trying to get – if we run to the boundary, trying to get outside the numbers. All of our points are outside the numbers. All right, the backside outside receiver, so we're running this counter right sweep, right, tag be the sweep. So we're going GT counter right. Sweep tells us, hey, it's wrong, wrong way run. 
The backside outside receiver in this picture would be the H, all right? He's going to block the corner, the sidewalk, okay? The backside inside receiver, this would be the Y in this picture. He's going to handle the alley first. If the alley's full, he's going to block the alley. He's going to reach the alley. These are all going to be outside number aiming points. The alley's empty. He's going to look to seal. Do I need to seal that will linebacker? All right, if the will is influenced by the wrong way, wrong way run, then I'm going to take myself to the safety. So I'm going alley to seal to safety. All right, and then the running back, you're going to check the DN alignment. All right, DN's in a wide, maybe a wide seven. All right, I'm going to make sure he can't ruin the play immediately upfield. All right, once I've cleared that, I'll take a hard jab step. Now I'm going to just make the tight end right. So the tight end were to come out and he thought the will was in the alley, he blocked the will. I'm going to threaten the DN and I'm going to take care of the safety. So we add our tailback into the run scheme. That's where a lot of people bring him through the mesh and try to hold people. We're going to go more wrong way run. We're going to try to hold that will linebacker off the wrong way run. All right. And get our tailback at the extra hats. We have all, we got the sidewalk, we got the alley, and we've sealed the whole picture off. All right. We're getting the ball now out the back door of the play. Okay. The center, all right, in this, in this deal, the center is going to block back. So we're going to counter, you know, GT counter scheme to the right, your backside guard. Backside tackle point. Your center's going to block back hard through the A to B gap. All right, get beat over the top, then work to just seal the box. You don't need him out here leading you know, the run. We're trying to seal that box. All right, so we're really trying to get, hey, see if we can influence these linebackers with the pull scheme and get the ball at the back door of it. Quarterback, right, he's going to snap that motion off right at the edge of the tackle box. He's going to step off the flat line and pop the ball up to him. Simple as that. Huge coaching point here for the speed guys. I'm running, I want to run through the feet of the quarterback. If I get that depth, we feel, if I hit that thing timed up right, if we snap it off at the edge of the tackle box and I'm running through the feet of the quarterback, really, DN should almost never catch me. If the DN's immediately up the field, all right, tailback will, will eat it up. But if not, right, we should be able to beat that thing with, with the speed of the bat, of the speed of the runner and the course of the runner, all right, and the timing of the snap off, we should beat that guy around the edge. Quick adjustment if you get a DN and a nine technique as well, the tight end will reach it right now and start to play. All right, so we get any wide nine pictures. Dan will take it right now. That what he says being alley full. Tailback will get himself right. He'll take care of the will. We'll block the corner, and the free safety would be high. We live with that. That's the general idea of blocking it, right? And this that bottom right picture. All right, same idea. Now we're going to FSL. Maybe we're to the sideline. Two receivers to the boundary. See, maybe they bring the nickel, uh, the nickel Sam over here to the boundary. Run your speed sweep back to the field. Same thing. Right, so just be a counter right again. Sweep tag. All right, the, the backside, right, right to the direction of play, so the backside outside receiver. This time would be the L. The left outside receiver would block the corner. Same idea, right? The Y is going to go alley seal safety. Right tailback is going to check the DN, make the tight end right. Centers back through the A to B to seal the box. All right, so that's a general idea of the place so you understand it. Let's get on the film of it now and wash it through. All right, so here we go. Turn off this overlay real quick if I can. I might not be able to. There we go. All right, so here we go. We're coming up. This is uh this is a four minute offense here against uh, Stony Brook here last year. It's second. All right, we got to run the ball. All right. And I'm saying this is a clean run for us, right? The defense is all locked in, right? They're playing down the box. There's just under three minutes to go in the game. We're up by a score, right? You got to run the ball right here. This is your non traditional run. So we're in a twelve personnel set. We're gonna bring the speed motion guy from the boundary here. All right, outside receiver. All right, backside uh backside outside receiver right now. All right, he's gonna block the corner. Right hand's going to go alley to seal the safety. Well, the alley is full. He's going to try to reach the alley. Tailback will threaten the defensive end and make the tail back, make the uh, tight end right. Speed motion guy, full speed, snap it off the edge of the tackle box, run through the feet of the quarterback. Quarterback, snap it off, step off the flat. All right, here we go. Tight end, alley comes under right now. Reach it, stop it right now. Alley comes under, hard post it, hard post it. The speed will get around the edge. There it is right there. All right, tailback is a reach right now in the alley. Boom, make the tight end right. Look, he's initially using tight tailbacks looking to what? Looking to seal, right? But we're going wrong way run. We're pulling our guard and tackle, right? That eliminates the mic right there. All right. So the tailbacks going seal. No, I'm going safety. Boom. There's a safety for me. All right. There's a good wide view of it. Boom. We're out and we're running. The speed guy, the ball, and we're running. Good hard hard the offensive line. Good run by the speed guy. Good hard. Great job finishing right here. Great mentality by the old line. It's awesome. All right, let's go to the tail. As we're going right now, so we're going to go counter right sweep. So I'm getting my left guard and my left the pullers on this thing. We're trying to influence pull, wrong way run. So I'm just blocking back through the A, through the B, then trying to seal the box right now. 
right? Tight end sitting in an alley, right? That alley comes under, posts it right now. Stab it in the outside number, set a hard post. The speed of the back and the course will get you around the edge. Go back, comes out, he checks to seal it. No one there to seal. Take the safety. Boom, let's go. Let's get running. Out and run. Let your fast guy be fast. Good hard finish, good mentality. By the look of it here, all right, we're coming out. Now we're showing you that same FS uh, formation of sideline picture. All right, so you got your speed guy to the boundary right now. All right, they've walked over the nickel sand, put him to the boundary. Great. Let's run to the field. Let's run to the field. Here we go. We're on the counter left sweep. Outside receiver blocks the corner. Right hand's got the alley. In this picture, he's saying the Wilt, the uh, the Mike linebacker, took the alley all right, to find the picture. Uh, no, he didn't. He, bought, he took the safety. All right. The best part of it is we tell the tight end, be decisive. He just says the tailback will make you right. Good look at the tailback on the jab right there. Boom, jab, and he makes the tight end right. Takes the alley, tight end takes the safety, and we're out and running. Again, speed course to the back, trying to run through the feet of the quarterback. Quarterback just set back off the flat line. A little slow snap here. Snap off the flat line, pop it up. Let your fast guy be fast, right? It all starts with speed sweep to start. So again, you see it right here. This is off of our inside zone tag, right? So we can get off of uh, inside zone as well. If you feel like you've got a defensive end, or not, a I'm sorry, a three technique who can really be a hard up the field charge guy, right? Maybe the line's not, maybe the linebackers aren't as influenced off the pullers. Then we'll go it off of our inside zone scheme, right? So this would be inside zone called to the offensive left, and then the tackle's going to control it. He's going to step down to the B, step down to the B. All right, once he doesn't get immediate hard up field charge, now he becomes a seal player. So instead of center blocking back on the on the GT scheme, this off the inside zone scheme is going to step down through the three, and then he's going to work to seal the box. All right, tell him the, the speed guy, right, keep pressing. Try to circle the field, right? If you have to, cut on heels and ride the way back out. Cut on heels, ride the way back out again, away from the chasers. All right, so Lonnie Moore, he uh, went to camp with the Jets, and then uh, he's now playing the CFL. Really fast slot receiver, man. This is the first play of the game against Villanova. This is this year. First play game against Villanova. Now we're in a uh, hey twins out to the field. All right here's your fast guy. This is Dimir Miller for us this year. We always have a speed slot guy. So this is Dimir. He's an all uh, all CA player for us this year. All right, we're gonna bring the speed motion from the field here. All right, we're gonna run the counter. We're calling counter left sweep. So I'm get my backside guard and tackle pulling to try to influence the linebackers. All right now that H. All right, he's the backside outside receiver. He's got the sidewalk. All right, the Y is gonna take the alley. All right, Taylor's gonna check the defensive end. Look and seal the safety. There's a speed motion again, full speed. Good job, good course right here. Good course to speed motion runner. Good job snapping it off. They're trying to blitz it from the field. They're trying to go overload pressure first play of the game from the field, right? And we're running out the back door of it. All right, so I'm going to run through the feet of the quarterback. Quarterback's going to catch it, step back, pop it up. Boom, let's go. Speed course, let's get running. Get running. Get running. It's a huge play to start the game. And let's say, hey, we're going to give the ball. We're telling you right now, we bring this guy to the mesh. We're going to give him the ball. You better be able to tackle him. Then we're going to come back and get all of our downhill game going off. Great run by this kid. It's a great first. That's how you want to start the game right there. Get guys running. So as you look at the picture from the tight here, I'm trying to hold 42 off if we hold enough of them. All right. As we go to reach, you know, you get 25 playing low. All right. That H sits in on right now to find the picture. Let me get around the edge of it. Winds up taking care of the, the alley. Tailback ends up sealing on 42. Center on the block back. Let's see it. Center on the hard block back. Working to seal that box. Good job. Hard running. We're out and we're running. We're just trying to get this nice hole, right? It's a lot here. We're giving you wrong way run, right? You're seeing if you're a linebacker here, I got hard motion. I've got two pullers. Got where's the ball at? Another picture of it. This is against Montana uh, in 2019. This is a nasty defense. Cut you up, show you different fronts, three safeties, blitz you, move you. Some of your best runs early on are going to be these. Just, hey, get the ball the fast guy, get a block on the on the sidewalk, boom. Get a block in the alley, boom. Get your tailback coming through, get the speed guy the ball. Right? Early in the game, get a quick cut to the fast guy, right? Get your maybe best potential run, to be honest with you, here against this defense. It's a, a nasty-looking Cut you up defense, and we're out and we're running. And we're just trying to circle the boundary. All right, speed motion coming through. All this one off of the inside zone. So there's your, if you look at off. So now we're going, hey, we're calling inside zone left sweep. So that backside tackle, he's protecting that hard initial charge in the B gap. 
There's that hard step down by 69, then pop in the seal. He seals the twist game. This is pretty good here. Steps down. All right, boom, B gap doesn't come immediately up the field. I look to seal the box, twist game, boom, sinking right there. 84, all right, this is Gene Scott, Wall, New Jersey. Wall used to always beat Mansquan. I don't think Coach Gibbs likes him. It's a big rivalry here in New Jersey. On used to be Thanksgiving, Mansquan versus Wall. Gene claims he was undefeated against Mansquan back in the day, so in your face, Coach Gibbs. So come out right here. He's got the corner, run to reach, run to reach. Right, the Y, taking care of the alley right now. Boom, alley's fold the will, lock in on it, tailback will make you right. We'll be blocker for you. I'd say keep on running and get that safety. Almost out here. We're close to being out. All right, here we go. This is NCAT. This is a G World's Greatest Homecoming. We beat them 2021. They hadn't lost a, a homecoming game in 17 years. This place was wild. There's like uh, 27,000 people going crazy. All right, on homecoming. This is third and first, third and two of the game. And as you do your self scout, me and KK do all the self scout. It's like, hey, man, what? When we're on third and short and we're on 12 personnel, we're running inside zone or power. So, okay, this is the first third down of the game. Let's come out and run speed sweep. All right, you got your linebackers playing low right now, downhill into it, bringing hard speed motion. We're going to get the, the backside edge. So we're calling inside zone to the left sweep. So line's going to block inside zone to the left in this picture. Backside tackle, control the backside B gap. Again, tight end's going to arc, take care of the uh, outside tight end here. It's going to arc, take care of the corner, right, who's in the sidewalk. Second tight end's got the alley. All right. Tailback makes it right. There's a good jab set by the by the tailback. Jab it. Stop the feet real quick. Boom. Go. You know, everyone's playing downhill and low. They're trying to stop the run. Boom. Here we go. So we'll get on the picture of it. All right. A good look in your insides in this game. Hey, this these are twitchy. These are really twitchy three. And when you game plan, like how do linebacks adjust the pullers? Well, you know, some linebackers, you know, they're reading through the pull and they're gone, right? They're gone with pullers. All right. Some there and that pullers don't mean anything or speed motion overrides pullers. All right. So as you, as you game plan, what's the better way to run it? Well, this is a twitchy three. The linebackers aren't that influenced by pullers. Let's run off the inside zone. Let that backside tackle control any potential issue to start. Then he can seal the box. All right. Some just coaching points to the tailback on this as it's coming. When do I need to block to the end? Okay. Well, if I got a DN and nine technique. Right, that Y is going to reach him, period. Now the clip of this coming up. All right. If I have a DN in a seven, okay, hand the ground seven, I got to be alert for that thing. It's just, just you know, quick, uh, you know, context clues, if you will. If he's in a seven, I got to be alert for him stepping out with the Y. If he's in a five inside hand down, I'm less in tune to it. All right. So in this picture, I got more seven outside hand down. Let me clear this right here. Jab it right now, stop his feet and pop. Good speed course, catch it on the run. All right. So, again, 88 singing, who can take the alley? Well, it's the will. Boom. I block the will. I'm decisive. Tailback makes the right hands up on the safety. And here we go. I got a block on the sidewalk. I got a block on the safety. I got a block on the uh, on the alley, the will. And I've got that tackle seal in the box. Let's go. Let your fast guy be fast. Big first down. All right. This is uh, – oh, here you go. This is Chuck South back in 21. Speed motion coming to the boundary. Here's a look at the stand up at the end. If you can, you want a formation, maybe formation to the sideline. You want, if you can, get it run at the hand of the ground defensive end. Right? The stand up guys can give you some trouble right, as they're reading through the line. Right? So if you get a stand up player, tell them the times to be a little more patient, big little shuffle step. So here's a look right now where you have the tight end. He ends up picking up that defensive end, right? That stand up rush. It looks like cross blitz right here with that guy dropping as well. So I'm really seeing he's in the alley. I had to find the picture. Right, so we're on speed motion. This is an inside zone sweep call. Right, backside, outside receiver blocks the corner. I've got the alley. Who's taking the alley here? The D end. Right, tailback sees it. He then makes you right. So good look at that one as this thing plays off. All right, stand up rush now. All right, I'm alert for this. Take shuffle, I feel him playing wide. Be decisive. If I block it, tailback will make the picture correct. And I'm getting that. There's a good look at the tackle too. I'm down through the B. Hard out I get enough. That's all I need. I'd, I'd say we stamped off a little too soon right here. So it gets a little dicey here on 90. But still, we get enough of the tackle spot and the speed of this kid doing it and the depth, we're still getting around it without much of a problem. I got a block in the alley. I got a block in the corner. We get around to the safety, and we're rolling here. This is another third down run. Good hard finish by 15. Look at that mentality. Balls in the outside arm is a weapon. Bam. Good hard run. Ass guys are tough. This is a good look at pullers. 
this is when you game plan. You know, this was uh, back in 19. So we've been doing this. This has been a big run for us. You know, we've got these fast slots. Lonnie Moore, NFL level kid. Dimir uh, Miller right now for us, NFL level kid. All, both all conference, all American type kids. How do we get them touches? Okay, and you look at this team back in the day in 19, right? Pullers, linebackers were gone, gone. So all right, let's come back. Let's run counter left sweep, second down, counter left sweep. I right, got a block on the corner. He's gonna run him off. He's his man. He runs him off the block, which is fine. And it's got the alley right there's the the, the back safety in the alley right now. We're running to reach that thing with the pullers. The linebackers are gone. They're gone right now. We get the speed guy to the edge and we're rolling. We're still running. Big explosive plays. Explosive plays. Right, again, I'm arcing. I've got the alley. Alley's full right now. I'm trying to run to reach the alley. Run to reach the alley. All right, tailback. All right. I think one more threat step on the defensive end, but with the pullers here on the wrong way run, you've eliminated, you've eliminated these guys right now. Center, good job in the block back. We're going to seal. Get your fast guy the ball and let's roll. All right, one more. Let's look at this one real quick. So now we're coming from a huddle. We got 12 person on the game. We're breaking the huddle. We're an unbounced. So we've covered up. The tight end here, right? Taking the back. They were putting Dimir, the fast guy, back here off the ball. All right, now we're going to run speed sweep back to the field. This is student body right. We're going to pull the line left, right, to try to hold the linebackers. All right, now I've got really two hats in the alley. So, again, we're going to block the outside receiver, runs him off the block. I can live with that. All right, the H, he's going to go handle now the alley. Boom, alley's full. Run to reach it. All right, now I've got the Y. He's thinking what? Can I seal it? All right, the pull got rid of that linebacker. He goes and takes care of the safety, and the back is bonus here. Speed, speed course, snap it off edge of the tackle box, right? Pop it. Good job of the back here. Circle the field till I can't. Cut on heels of the block, then ride the way back out again. Good hard run. First drive of the game against New Hampshire, tackle on the one. Don't get tackled on the one, Dime. You're too fast for that. And again, same picture, right? We come back right now. We're going to pull that backside guard and tackle. Just get this. Just get this hold. Get the hold of the linebackers and give it to the fast guy at the front door. Nothing but, nothing but green grass there. All right, so that's the mentality of the play, guys. All right? A couple more is the same. Houston, same kind of pictures. Oh, I'm sorry. This one, this wide spot here, okay? Now we're in twins of the field. All right, tight end to the boundary. There's your speed guy. All right, we're going to run it to essentially the open edge. He just now becomes the alley blocker. So he's going to try to pin the alley right now. All right. So he's going alley to seal the safety. So in that number two receiver now, he's going to go square to outside leverage in the alley. If you got immediate fire, let it go. The tailback is still coming with you, right? I still have a block on the on, on the on the corner. I've got a block in the alley. And we're still adding the, the tailback into the picture. So any immediate field fire, tailback picks up, makes it right. We survive through in the next play, hopefully get around it. So right here, with being smart here, recognizing the coverage, right, weak rotation, he's going to run off the block on the alley here, right, knowing that, hey, 13's got to respect him and carry him, right, he's going to run off the block. Really smart by him, right? We're pulling the backside guard and tackle to try to hold the linebackers. All right, tailback's going to threaten set the end, and he's looking right now. He's got to make a decision right here. All right, so he's going to seal. He's going to end up sealing, right? He ends up sealing the mic. That's fine. Leave the safety. Run, good hard run. This is Sam Houston back in the playoffs during the COVID 2021 uh, spring. They won the national championship. This is playoffs. They end up winning the national championship. We lost this game by five points. Um, and they were really good up front, man. Really good up front. Big rock team on motion. You'll see some stuff later on what we came back to off of it, right? So just, as you're calling this in the box, okay, how'd they react to this? Well, you're getting a heavy rock. Let's come back next. Let's go weak. Can we run our pin post game week? Can we get pass game week? Maybe we get a little pass game smash going week off of a five-man pro, all right? So we can come back to this now, all right? We call us early in the game, right? Make the defense, make the linebackers run. Make these guys turn and run and chase. Try to tire them out. It's hot out here. We're in Texas. It's hot. Tire out the defense. Get your fast guy the ball. Get him running. Make him rock. Make him roll. Come back with some later on. Set some stuff up later on. Smart job by the tailback, make a full speed decision, cut and run, ride the way back out again. You're picking up 12 yards right there. There weren't a lot of early runs. There weren't a lot of inside zone runs against these guys that were nice. These guys were very, very good up front. Probably the best Elon we've 
ever played against, to be honest, all the way through. So, hey, how are other ways we can get some touches early, get these guys run, soften them up, then come back later on with your counter game? All right. So that was better city blocking of it. Let's go here now. Let's go the run game on it. Okay. So we set them up with the speed sweep. The first thing we'll come back to was counter. All right. We're going to run around counter. Okay. So in this picture, all right, if we were to come out, and this is so you guys understand traditionally, if we run counter left, okay, we're looking over here right now on the left side. If we're running counter left traditionally for us, you guys understand that we come out, all right, the offensive lines are gap run point rules. I mean, we're always going to have a, a point, a plus, and a minus. So it's a left, we have a point, a plus to the call side, and a minus to the back side. The clear alignment to the call makes the point. Okay, so we come out, if we're on counter left, we would say that the tackle – is the first clear here. So he's going to point the mic. That's that's the point. Great. The next adjacent linebacker to the play side is a plus. The next adjacent to the back side is a minus. All right. The first double or attack is, is, is declared by that clear. So in this picture, we get it down on the nose. I lift, protect myself, and I track to the point. All right. The backside guard, you're going to pull and kick the C gap. All right. The backside tight end, you're going to end up pulling and trapping all right, the plus linebacker. All right, all your gap rules apply. If there's an inline tight end, right, he's going to make a double or an up call based on where the minus is. So if it was a true 4 3 defense, he might make an up call right now, get the minus done. If I had him prone on the ball like a 3 5 9, I definitely want to run weak at this picture. He's going to hard double in, protect that tackle. All right, so he's going to double in, take two hards in, stab it. When he feels he expand back out, he'll expand back out, build the wall on the backside. Right, that backside tackle as well. He's got a hard right double down, right? But he's protecting the center on the block back, right? Guards pulling, kicking the end, centers on the block back on the three, tackles on a hard gap down for two hard stab it, feel the center there, expand back out, build the wall on the backside. All right, tailbacks and take a jab step, flat line exchange, come flat through the, the mesh point here and get into the hip of the second puller. Keep it tight. We're gonna work the trap, the plus, all right, down the point and create a hole right there. All right, that's our base world. Same thing. This would be counter right, same mentalities. This time, the first clear would be the guard, okay? Right guard's clear right now. So he's going to make a double call to the tackle, to the will. There's your point. There's your plus. There's your minus. All right, so now we bring – so I'm telling you guys this. So we we make hard double calls. Like we make hard combo calls to, to men on the field. If I'm bringing speed motion, okay, so I'm bringing motion from the left here. So I'm going speed motion now, and I might get a bump. All right, I might move these, or I might get a full-on bump. I'm going to put another tag in here. This is that turf tag now. So what, when I say counter, this would be counter left turf. And by saying counter left turf, I'm telling this tackle, all right, don't make a call hard to, like, number 56, if that's the mic. Call to that, that spot on the turf. You're blocking for this spot on the turf. And as you attack that track, that will might take that spot, and the mic might leave. Don't chase it. You keep attacking the spot on the turf. All right, and whatever shows there, you block. So we can still get double. So good in this right picture, right? They're going to call a double here. If I was going speed motion from the right-hand side, and I might get a heavy rock, all right, all right, or I might get a heavy bump, I'm sorry. They're going to call the double. They're going to make the same double call. Hey, we're going to say deuce, but instead of to the will, they're going to deuce to that spot. So whatever shows there is there, so I can still get that good hard double. I'm not just straight down and everything. I can still get good hard doubles with the motion coming. So whatever shows on that spot in the turf, right? That's where we're doubling to. For the puller, right? For the Y. He's not necessarily pulling and kicking the mic. He's whatever shows in that spot on the turf, that's who's going to trap. So if this dude leaves with it, trust something else is coming in. All right? So we're, we're getting doubles, we're getting the same pulls, but the spot's now on the turf when the motion is coming. All right? And if, hey, maybe they're rocking with it or running with it, I don't know always what the defense is. All right? That's fine. So if there if there's hey, a rock and roll team on, maybe it's their course team, but they're playing some cover three and they're rock and rolling, I still call counter right turf with that motion coming. All right, I'm still going to get that double. The, the will will still be there. I'm still going to end up on the will linebacker because he should be in that spot when it's all said and done. So that turf tag really helps us still get doubles and get that mentality of them knowing, hey, if this dude leaves, don't chase. Something else is coming. That's one. Two, when you run the counter, what's the hardest blocks? Really, I'm pulling this backside guard and tight end. This guy's gone. Right, you think you're getting a hard double here on the three? Like, ah, listen, I love, I love power, I love counter, I love double teams. Okay, but in real life, as you pull this backside guard and tight end, that will's gone. That double doesn't even really exist. So this is where we like to. I like bringing the motion from the front side of this thing 
to hold that block. This speed motion from the front side of counter, right? If you start, especially if you run some speed sweep to start, this holds and lets you sit this double longer. I can truly get a, a, a two, you know, two on one double on the three here and give this time to develop. So it's going to hold the will, even for if it's another half second, it's going to hold them. And I love that aspect of it. I can sit in on doubles more with the speed motion. That's what we've seen more of anything else. Okay. And again, when you're calling out 12, I got a hat here. When I'm calling out of 11, I got to have an answer for this dude over here. Now, the quarterback's live eyes are there if you want to RPO it or even go off it. But if I'm speed motion, it's great. I've eliminated him. You know, how much bump am I getting? Am I bringing someone to the box, this spot in the turf? So the turf call helps us know, hey, we're getting the spots in the turf. And the motion really helps us sit in on doubles longer, especially on the front side of the gap scheme. That's why we like it. So let's go to the tape on it now. Okay, so this is literally, we talked about that Stony Brook drive. This is the next play. We ran that speed sweep, okay, and the two-man offense. We, we broke the ball all the way down here. All right, now it's first down. And right, now we're going to come back with the counter. All right, to the big hit, big speed sweep. I'm sorry, it was two plays there. So first now it's the second down. We probably uh, we might, you know, probably ran inside zone or something for three yards on first down. Come back, speed motion. There's your bump. So now he's running as well. So someone's wrong here, right? So we're bringing the speed motion, right? So we're going speed motion here, all right? And we're running counter left, counter left turf. All right, and off the speed motion, look at the bump I'm getting on the linebackers. All right, and the base world of this, this play side 10, he's your corner read player, right? I'm not expecting him to run with it with the bump, right? So as this happened, as I get it bump linebackers, the tight end is going to block the most dangerous low player. So the corner was sitting low, he'll block the corner. The corner played high and the safety came screaming down, you know, he's going to block the uh, the safety. And we're going to leave the high player. And then there's six, have the six. So off this motion, I'm thinking I'm eliminating this, this outside linebacker. I'm getting a nice bump here. And I still have a hat on a hat. Or I have a hat on the low player to the boundary. With him running with it, because you know maybe we gave it to a go. So he's going to run with it now. Maybe he's just wrong. We're all we're all evened up here. We got all of our hats on all their hats. We, I love what you got out of the bump here. We'll get it from the tight in a second. So here we go now. So if we come out, the call will be, hey, we're going to work our double, our deuce, not to 42, to the spot on the turf. All right, trust that. We're going to double to this spot right here, man. And this is a tough double. If we're running just base counter, okay, the second he sees pull, this there, there's really no double here at all. This is, this is not a real double. But by bringing this motion here, all right, we're saying we're allowing them to sit on the double longer. Right here comes – there's your bump. I just got leverage back. I got leverage back to 73 and 77 to sit in on it. As right, so we're pulling on the, the guard point the kick, he ends up he ends up logging, right? Rubbing the ribs of the last down block, which would be 77. And he's going to win vertical. All right, tight end. He's saying, I'm pulling to the spot in the turf. He's trying to get just a spot, not the 39, the spot in the turf. He comes around it, right? He's going to run the last down block. So that log by 76 is the last down as we see it. So 88 is going to come through square. I right, get very good. Boom. I got into my guys. Got a hat on that still that will. Got a hat in the mic off the motion, off the bump. And I got a climb and strike on 27. Like the back to cut it in tight here. And they really take a need to win because we're in downtime. Don't go out of bounds. But again, that's the mentality of the play there. Another look at this is the same, same thing. This is Stony Brook again. Speed motion from the right side of it, running counter back right. This kid's a really good athlete. He's not great in the box. This kid's really firm. All right, he's not great in space. So off this motion with the bump we're getting in their in their uh, quarter shell, I'm eliminating the will and I'm bringing this guy into the box to have to, to play in the box. So he doesn't want to really live, as you can see right there. Really good player, just that that's not his world as much. So in this picture off the bump, I feel like I'm getting A, leverage, and B, I'm, I'm eliminating a better defender. All right, now I'm putting a lesser run defender at the point of attack. There's that same mentality of the tight end arc in here. In the corner, re corners low, he sits on it. Good coaching point here coming from the tie. So, again, good six, seven yard run, but let's get to the tie of this year now. Same idea right now. We come out, first clear is a tackle. All right. He's really working, all right, attacking the track to this spot in the turf over here. All right, as we come through it, all right, he ends up capturing that end coming under. That's fine. We're back to bonus here. As you go with the motion, I'm saying the motion, I'm going to eliminate 38. All right. I'm eliminating 38. I'm leveraging up 42. And I'm making 17 now become 
you know, the, the puller, right? That tight end, I'm the, the tight end's pulling for a spot on the turf right here. Who ends up there? All right, really, I'm looking at hey, it's 17. All right, so that's what we're trying to get to on that on that bump deal. And I'm you're getting a lot of action here, speed motion coming through. Like, where's the ball at? Where's the ball? Where's the ball? All right, so make him fit it. You know, I like as, as Justin comes around, as 88 comes around, right? With the capture, we just go one for one. The puller ends up kicking his, right? He ate mine, so I ate his. You know, we want 88 to search this thing inside out. That'd be the one thing I'd tell you on this turf. I come around, search it inside out. Nothing's immediately there. Look it inside out. I like, I, I want them up on 42 and we leave 40. But again, we've got some good misdirection bump. You'll take the five or six yard gain. There's more me on the bone there, but so good run. This is a good picture here. So good coaching point. We come out right now, right? We're giving you a formation, a sideline picture, right? You've got the uh, nickel Sam here. We're trying to get the motion to get the bump and then come run hard back at it. Quarterback comes. This is Kenji Bahar currently playing for the Houston Gamblers. Played the, for the Ravens a couple years. He's a phenomenal player. And this is the reason, little small things here. He's bringing the speed motion. The guard's not set yet. All right, so I've got an illegal, this would be an illegal shift, two guys moving. He sees it, so we have a mayday call. If you're doing a lot of different motions, any hey, mayday, 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 everybody stops. Everybody stops, get set, right? Get set, get set, get set. Now bring the motion, right? So it's a good, just a good clip of if you get to, if, if you see it, hey, mayday, 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 stop the whole procedure. We got time. Get it set. Boom. Here we go. Again, speed motion bump. Right. Eliminate go. Bringing the the, uh, the nickel salmon to the box. Getting the bump we want with the linebackers. Right. Running counter back out the front door of it. Looks like speed sweep. No, here comes counter. Boom. Good hard run. Get us clean up to the safety. Good finish. Right. Trying to get leverage on this double. Right. We're going to call a double to this spot in the turf right here. Get 70 leverage, get 65 leverage. Again, don't, you know, you'd say if you were going to coach in the O-line part of it, right, you want them to shuffle and pick a work gallop team, so there should be a brace hard lift by 65 and a shuffle into a hard high knee gallop four on two, trying to deliver the three into the A-gap and then attack a track to 45. All right, so we'd say, all right, 70 right here, not great on the shuffle, comes in too shallow on it. You know, I don't think, I think the tack of the guard's really fine, right? Brace lift hard there, hard lift it. We got to be in deeper on this by 70. So he's too shallow on the block. But again, there's a kick. I've gotten leverage though on 45. I'm able to still get myself up. 65 still gets up to that guy, right? Gets up to 45. There. There's a pull around. Boom. There's a trap. There's a divide right there. Let's go. Love it. Same thing. There's that same uh, same Houston team. All right. We came out. We ran that speed sweep to the field. All right, now we're coming back second and two. Now we're going to go speed motion run counter back to the boundary. There's a heavy rock now, right? We've run speed sweep. I mean, we ran speed sweep eight times in this game because we just had to find, even if it was a four or five yard gain, make them make them run lateral. Make them now they're heavy rocking, right? Heavy rock right here. Right? Take away the speed sweep. Let's come back with counter. And make, and again, the same idea of make this low safety, right? The three safety defense, make him transitioning it from high. Bad make the tackle. We can live with this. It's second and two. You get a nice first down gain here. You hold the whole backside of the defense, and you get your running back one-on-one -on -one with the safety. It's, that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day. Good hard run here. Right in the same mentality, right? So we're going to call our double right now to this spot in the turf, whatever takes it. All right, guard's going to pull, kick the C gap. Right, Tan's not pulling for one. He's pulling for this spot in the turf, whatever takes it. And we're going to create some leverage here on. As, as you look at this right now, we end up on the, hey, the you pull, me pull, that three over the top. The tackle ends up on the three coming over the top. Hard speed motion eliminates 43, and we're back out the front door here. You can change your calls, right? Hey, you can go that whole counter talk of, if I get a backside three, let the center pull. I'm all in on all that stuff. We have those things in. This is more just on the mentality of the plays and the hard, hard scheme of the play and what this motion gets you. Okay, here we go. All right, now there's that same student body left. We broke the huddle, right? We've covered up the Y, all right? So we've taken the boundary speed guy off, all right? We've run the speed sweep out to the field. They're hard rocking down to it. 
Now we're coming back and running counter. Now we're coming back on counter. So boom, here's, here comes a hard rock. All right. And a kick. And I think that if in the perfect world, they want to adjust and tell this the end, the hard spill it with the corner, the boundary corner sitting there. We get a kick on the D end. There's nobody left. Hard rock and hard strong. Take away the speed sweep. Come back on counter to the boundary. This is the first play of the second half. So you come out. There's your middle eight right there, man. First play of the second half. Come out. And this kid's really good. Right? Is it, it, do, I, do I think it's a good play call? Yes. But this back makes it a great play. Great great job in the line, too. Great job blocking it up front. And the back is phenomenal. Get him clean through a hole. He, fast he is gone. It's good, you know, it's called a second place. You know, touchdown to start the second half, the first play of the second half here. It's tight. Enough. So, again, we came out. We broke the huddle, you know, trying to get them to overplay. So we come out right now. Again, we're just attacking spots on the turf. I'm attacking a spot on the turf right here. I'm pulling to a spot on the turf. Off the speed motion, it all rocks away. I've kept leverage on the back side of it. I've, I've gotten everyone run out to the field to the front side of it and run out the back door. Again, well, hey, the corner should have told the DN on this to spill it hard now because of the motion. Great. You got a second to get that all through. So you get two guys fitting outside in the D gap. The end boxes it. Corner plays outside, doesn't fit it right. And again, your corner now has to become your, you know, he's going to become your, your fitter, right? You're saying he's, you know, you're making the corner kind of fold himself in and become the tackler. So either way, I like that. Make the corner, make the tackle. But how much has he ever done that? At the end, you trap, you work the trap 33, and we're out and we're running. And there's just a lot of – I love this part of it too, guys. I love the – I love all this. Who's got the ball? Where's the ball? Hey, look at this guy trying to fit it around. Boom. Hey, rock. You know, come back. He's trying to find the football. There's a lot of traffic there. He can't leverage it. And this kid's really fast, right? If you have fast tailbacks, this is, if you have a fast slot and a fast tailback, this is a great two-player package. Come with a fast guy, and you're getting speed sweep with a fast guy. All right, here's Villanova. All right, you saw the speed sweep to start the game. All right, now we're going hard speed motion, running counter back. Okay, really, we liked it against the odd front. All right, against the odd front, so we could hard sit in on the front side. Right, we were going to double back up to this rip linebacker. All right, ace it with the center nose. So instead of having to bash it back with the tight end backside in this thing, we had a double going back on the nose to the backside inside linebacker down on the four eye. All right, we're going to pull and kick the overhang. Work to pull and trap, right the uh, the play side, the the defensive left inside linebacker. This was going to hit wire to begin with. All right, the speed motion was going to was going to deliver that that overhang to the puller, and it would also hold the will because that's a really hard double on counter. So you're seeing it's going to hold twenty on the backside. All right, and you're having some force issues here. Now, who's the force player? If it's Reed Force. It should be back or force. He comes in, right? He gets stuck in it, almost works to spill it. The safety's gone, and the ball, boom, spits one wire even. Fast guy counter, make him chase him, make him catch you. It's a good 15-yard gain. So, again, as we came out in this things, we schemed it up, right? We wanted to ace this thing back to 20 right? and go hard back in on the backside of this deal, right? Take care of the four-eye and the backside cut down uh, right there with the backside tackle and have the backside attack for 31. The motion held 20 to give us true leverage on that ace right there. Down on the four eye, knowing that down block on the four eye is not ideal, so it's going to all hit wider. So deliver, all right, deliver. As we're pulling the kick, 42, all right, the pulling guard, right, sees eight there. He naturally just logs that. Boom, tight end takes it one wider, get around the last down block, ends up on 42, and run it. Just bounce. This is like counter bounce here, guys. What's your fast guy to run fast? Another look at it. Okay, same deal. Same game later on. Speed motion coming. All right. Again, we're still getting that same hole we wanted here out of the backside world for the front side double. You can see 78 in this on the side view, even getting up to it. Now I get pulled. Now I get a true force. No, he plays force correctly now. All right. So he sets the edge of the defense sitting right here. We can all right, we end up not truly on the mic. We're going to make the safety as a fit and tackle it. And again, make safeties move. Make them move, make them adjust, make them react. Make him fit it. Make fit this, and he can't. He can't make the tackle. And our running back job blocking out here by outside receiver, right? Great mentality. It's a big, explosive run. Explosive, fast runners. Let them be fast. Give them schemes they like. So again, off the speed motion, right? 
with doubles of turf, and this is what you like on this on this counter combo too, right here. That double, good job on the shelf on the uh, on the little skip gallop right there. I think he's gonna jig gallop by seventy six, right? Brace lift by seventy four, hard high knee gallop right there, and we're keeping that linebacker backside after motion. So I've created a wall there on the backside. All right, we're down the four. I know that's the toughest block of all. That's a hard block. So we knew it was gonna kick wide, and we're delivering the overhang to the first puller. All right. And now I get a true kick. He sets the edge of the defense after the last time it bounced around him. But then now sees, he gets around the last down. Boom, ends up on the mic. Make seven fit it. Make him fit this whole thing. Make him run and fit it. He can't. He's a good player. This is just a hard thing to fit. There's a lot of things going on here. We've run the speed sweep. Now we're running speed count. First time in, fit it right. Now seven has got to make the tackle. He can't. And now we're working this in here. Same thing at 12, to the boundary, speed motion. Now we're getting that bump. Here comes the bump you're looking for right now. All right, we're bringing the linebacker into the box. So again, my puller, he's not pulling to a specific spot, right? That H is pulling to a spot in the turf. Then we're going to deliver someone to him. Good hard run, right? You'll take nine yards on first down. All right, we're calling our first double, right? As we're working things. The initial call should be, hey, we're going to do to this spot on the turf. Speed motion to deliver someone there. All right, they're bringing, it looks like a field fire picture from the pressure. So the line stunts moving. So now I'm not just randomly raking stuff out. We're still working our doubles. He's going to brace lift. That works wide. Eyes go to the A gap. All right, cross face boom. He sits in. Now I'm on a, on a natural ace here. All right, the back block on the nose, all right, with the hard stunt became an ace on the run here. And I've got 39 waiting, so I still kept the leverage off the speed motion. We run the speed sweep, right? 39's not gone. He's still got to be patient. patient. I got my, my, my guard up to it. So we have the brace, lift, right? Come back down to a high knee, sit on a double, and still get the 39. I didn't know, hey, we're going to bring someone in the box here. He ends up really pulling for who? 41. That spot where on the turf, that spot right there. We're going to deliver someone to that spot in the turf. There it is. Boom. Let's go. The down on the uh, on the three, working out turns into an inside hand drive. All right, it's, looks like it's supposed to be some sort of te twist game that gets screwed up on the back side of it with all the moving parts. So we get double kick in trap, and we're going into the safety. All right now, just doing it with power. I like power. It's like every every red blood American. Right, let's go. Let's run power. Let's run power, man. This is what like this is third and we're not in a good spot here, guys. This is this is third and ten, third and eleven on our two yard line. I'm trying to get the ball to the five yard line here. Get it to the five, get your base punt team out, punt it. Let's live to the good next drive. Okay. But I don't want to just line up and run power. So we're coming out right now. You know, show information to the sideline, bring a hard speed motion to hold the backside edge of the play. All right, and let's run power. No different. Now my kick is just the H, H back off the ball. Simple as that. All right, now my second trap puller is the guard. Same same mentality. Put a turf tag on it, and let's roll. And this tailback does all the rest. All right, trying to hold the backside. Hold this line. Don't make him come over the top right now. Hold it. Set me up to double. Boom, set the double up. We're doubling a three. Let him double a three. There's a double on three. There's a wall right there. We should be arcing out and corner reading at the uh, at the Y spot. He gets right late on it. Don't chase back in the box. All right. He gets he gets right late on it. Leave the corner. We're going. It goes 99 yards. Mm. Awesome. When you take power for 99 yards, about as good as it gets. This doesn't make me smart. That makes this kid really good. That's incredibly the more you got you knock down over here. Oh, <laughs> Doc, that's all you know who this is. That's your old line coach right there. Cause he's getting me the front. He's getting he's standing down here to see everything. That's Coach Gabe right now. You think he's fired up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he went down. Awesome. There you go. He got up. I promise you got up. But again, what do you love about it? Right. Hey, we're going turf. So they're thinking doubling in, right? If the four three linebackers say four three linebackers, we're doubling really all the way back to 41. I'm trying to bring the motion to get him back to a 4-2 linebacker deal. So I'm trying to eliminate 41 and create leverage on 43 up the double. So this is power left turf. All right, simple as that. So I can get more sitting on the double there. Hold 43. Hold them. Get the hat on it. Right? 
We're gonna pull, we're gonna kick out number nine here. I want the pen arc and going corner to safety, right? You, you're really gonna corner read this thing. He doesn't have to chase back into 42. He gets right late on it, which is good. All right, and the puller knows, right? That guard knows a nice skip pull. Here's a great job, coach. He has a great job, coach. These guys pull clean through the hole. I'm going to that spot in the turf right now. Boom, make it clean. Let's go. We're out, we're running. All right, two minute, four minute offense score. You're up by what 27 to what 10, 17 points out of Campbell here back in 21, 520. You got to run the ball, they know it, we know it, and we're going to run it. Unbound set. All right, so you got the yeah, you got your two tight ends here. Outside is a cover, so it'll give you a different formation, and then let's motion it. So let's let's change the formation on you. What's your unbalance check? Go ahead, call your unbalance check. Now, how are you handling motion? Come back the other way. If they give you a picture, you can run speed sweep out the back door with this thing too. All right, you can run the if they crank the whole thing over. I like that speed sweep. So now we're going speed motion. They're running with it, and I'm getting a bump here. Look at the will here. I'm getting a bump. I'm Holding the backside, uh, I think it's corners over here. So I'm in the backside safety playing wide. Right, so the corners over, corners running with it because it's corners over. He's got him man to man. So he's running. I still get a bump out of the will. Now we're running power out the front door. I've got a great I'm whole side leverage of it. And again, I'm tr I'm pulling the spots in the turf. Trust we're going to deliver something to that spot. Boom for 76 on the turf right there. And let's go. First down, stay in bounds. I gotta keep working. I gotta keep coaching the four minute offense, right? Well, actually, with, with over four, with over four minutes to play, you can go out of bounds. It doesn't matter for the clock. In college, I don't know if they change some rules, but I think that's still a rule as of right now. So getting the leverage you want, all right? The initial call should be a deuce up to the spot in the turf sitting right here. Pullers kicking the spot in the turf sitting right there. Yeah, coach, you, you got two minutes. Slope. Um, I'm, that's I'm, it. I'm gonna bring. I'm going to bring – Coach, you've been going for 50 minutes. I'm going to bring Coach Doran on so you can meet Coach. Hey, Coach. Awesome. How you doing, Troy? Yes, hey, I got Jeff Gallo here, Coach. He's the uh, offensive coordinator at Monmouth. Just wanted to introduce you uh, to him, Coach. How you doing, Jeff? Hey, Coach, how are you? Doing well, Great thanks. To Great to meet you. I'm sorry if I'm taking too long for you, Coach. If you're ready to go, I was – uh. No, you got plenty. You got time, man. I'm just getting on yeah. here to be ready when they're ready for you. Well, coach, I'm glad I don't have to play against Monmouth because they motioned that guy across and running counter back the other way, and I don't know who's got the ball. But Jeff, thank you for it's, coming it's, on. It's, yeah, appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. It's, it's and like I said, Coach Gibbs, those guys, great guys, great guys, great cause. I'm glad he's coming here and talk football. We've been out in the road recruiting. Came off the road here about two hours ago and just wanted to jump on to talk some football, which is awesome. Which is Thank awesome. You, so thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you, brother. Well, thanks, guys. Definitely, man. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Hey, coach. How you doing? I'm doing good, coach. I, I got my friend uh, Ian Tatum here, coach. He's uh, the offensive coordinator at Walkertown High School in North Carolina, and he's a big NC State guy, coach. So I, I, I asked him, would he come on? So. Coach, I appreciate you having me on. And Coach Dorian, it's great to meet you. Great to be on here. Um, I appreciate everything you've done for NC State football and athletics in general and beating Carolina two years in a row. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry you guys lost your quarterback, man. So am I, but, you know, we readjust yeah. and we're going to make it happen. Kid's a really special player. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, Coach, I uh, I, I helped get your uh, your thing all set up, Coach. If you want to present it, we'll just walk through it like yeah, we did. Yeah, are you ready for me to put that up? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, share screen, right? Yes, sir. All right, let me find it. And, Ian, I was looking on Twitter. I saw your, your tweet, what, what you uh, you asked. And that's why I was like, hey, man, I was like, I got, I got to send Ian the link because I, I yeah. knew you was a big NC State guy, man. No doubt. Okay, Coach, uh, we see NC State football hard, tough, and together. So if you would just uh, present that and it would go full screen, full screen. Yeah, it's full screen on my end. Um, can you see the next slide now? Uh, no, sir. We, we might have to go to share your whole screen like we did the other day. I thought that's what I just did. All right, I'll try it again. Um, 
So I've got to present, right? Yes, sir. I'm already on share screen. Okay. You want me to stop sharing it? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And now, if we could just go back and just share your whole screen. Share screen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Entire screen, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, All right, coach. You pull, pull your pull your PowerPoint up. I see your screen right now. Okay. Okay, and we got it right now, coach. All right. So I asked Ian to come on, coach, and uh, he, he had a question, um, and it was about your reputation. Uh, and I would like Ian to ask you that to start to start off. He was just sending out a basic tweet, coach. I thought it'd be pretty cool to bring him on here to listen to you because he's a big NC State fan. Uh, but coach, uh, coach Doran, for the people that don't know, could you uh, introduce yourself? Just tell us a little bit about you, coach. Uh, yeah, Dave Doran, head coach, North Carolina State University, uh, going on 11 years here. And, uh, you know, I've coached in now four Power Five conferences. Um, but the journey began as a high school coach uh, awesome. 28 years ago. And uh, at, in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, where I grew up, um, at least for half my life, lived in Kansas and uh, as a young person. Um, was a high school coach for one year, and then my college coach brought me back to Drake, where I played in Iowa as a GA, and I uh, was a defensive GA for two years, and then promoted there as a defensive coordinator at 25 years old, and, and did wow. that for one year, and then uh, went to Southern Cal to be a GA again to try to move up um, to Power Five football. And so I went to Southern Cal as a GA with Paul Hackett was our head coach and mm -hmm. uh, Bill Young was our defensive coordinator and did that for two years working with the secondary and had a, a great group of guys to work with. Um, tremendously talented group of guys. We led the nation in interceptions there twice and then went to uh, the University of Montana for two years and, and played in back to back national championships at the FCS level and won. The second one uh, beat Furman and then went to Kansas where I grew up, University of Kansas, uh, for four years with Mark Mangino and rebuilt that program. Um, was a recruiting coordinator, linebacker coach, co defensive coordinator there, and then moved from there on to Wisconsin for five years with Brett Bielema. Uh, ended up being the Rose Bowl, um, Big Ten champs and Rose Bowl uh, team that lost to TCU in the Rose Bowl. And that was my last year as an assistant coach, and that was 13 years ago. So went to Northern Illinois then as the head coach, first-time head coach, and took over Jerry Kill's squad. It was a really talented team. I was fortunate to inherit really good players from him and recruited some good ones too, but won back-to-back -back MAC championships there and, and then uh, went on uh, to play in the Orange Bowl against Florida State and then came here uh, as the head coach. Wow, Coach, what what a journey starting in high school in Kansas and yeah. all those different stops. And I asked my friend Ian Tatum to come on because he's a big NC State fan. And I the only reason I even thought about Ian, Coach, was because he tweeted something. And I was like, man, it would be pretty uh, cool to get him on here. So, Ian, would you like to ask Coach before he gets going, what, what did you tweet? And I think he'd be a great guy to to answer this question. Yeah, yeah. Um... I just very simple. I just was, you know, thinking about just reputation and how people perceive you, uh, not necessarily listening about outside noise, but just who you are as a person, your character, what, what people think about you. And uh, I was asking, which one do you think is harder, building a great reputation or working to keep it? Um, yeah, that's probably a tough answer. I think. Um... You know, it's kind of like trust. You know, it takes a long time to build, and it's pretty easy to lose. Um, mm. I would say it's probably harder to build one and easier to lose, you know, a reputation. Um, 
would be my quick answer for you there. I appreciate that, Coach. Yeah, and we had a player at LC Bird. I didn't coach him, but you got a heck of a player, an Isaiah Moore, and nobody in Virginia offered him. And you, you, I told you when I first met you, Coach, you're the smartest coach in America. I mean, Isaiah looks like the Under Armour mannequin. And you got him down there, and they're yeah. just a great character kid, Coach. Could you talk a little bit about Isaiah? Just got picked yeah. up by the 49ers. I uh, got picked up by the Chiefs. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Coach. You're exactly right. Yeah. Now, Isaiah was the best leader I've ever coached. Um, wow. Three-time captain at NC State and uh, wore the number one jersey here, which represents uh, – a lot in our program. <laughs> uh, great young man. Taught me a, a lot as well. Um, and he's one of these guys you coach that's kind of generational and in, in the type of human being that he is. He's a really good football player too, you know, don't get me wrong. But uh, in my opinion, a way better human being than he'll ever be a player. And uh, physical, downhill, smart. But what he did in the locker room with our team, uh, what he meant to our staff, what he meant to our university, yeah, he's special, 100%. So I wouldn't say I'm the smartest, um, but I am good at evaluating talent. And, and uh, it's one thing as we go through this presentation, you'll see we've kind of made a name for ourselves at the school with identifying the proper guys for our program and developing them the right way. I appreciate that, Coach. So I, I guess he, he is the gold standard for hard, tough, and together. No doubt. Yeah, Coach, so I, I appreciate you being on here today. And uh, it's it's 2 o'clock now, and, you know, we'll go till about 2.50, and we'll see our next guy uh, when he jumps on here, Coach. But I just appreciate you doing this and taking out of your, your uh, busy schedule to, to help this uh, family initiative in Florida for autism, Coach. No, I'm proud to do it. You know, my one of my sons is uh, on the spectrum, so this is something that's personal to me, and um, can you help me a little bit? Because I don't get a look at anyone in the way this is set up. What What is the audience that I'm speaking to? Uh, right now, we got a couple high school coaches uh, on, Coach, and uh, the other coaches that paid, um, you know, to watch this. Uh, you know, there's a few college guys uh, that will watch it at a later date. Um, so, you know, mostly high school guys, Coach. Got it. All right. I'll jump in here. Um, yes, sir. As the slide says here at the beginning, you know, this presentation is a leadership and culture presentation I've given a few times, mostly to high school coaches and college coaches. Uh, sometimes there'll be some businesses involved. But, you know, I think the, the first thing um, when you talk about coaching and leading is, you know, what kind of person you're going to be uh, in the building. And, and for us here at NC State, it's about action more than anything. Uh, we talk about building the family culture. Uh, which means including your families. And uh, one thing that's unique about us, our, our wives and children of our coaches are invited to every away game and home game. So they travel with us. They're in the hotels with us. They're on the planes with us. It's it's not just a one-time deal where you see them. You see them all the time. And to me, that's really important. We talk about building these young men in three ways uh, as athletes, students, and men. Uh, you can't build them as men and not show you show them who you are, you know, as a man. And and so we try to do that in every way possible. Um, and I think, you know, for me, coaching is is a calling. You know, I, I did not grow up wanting to be a coach. I didn't go to college thinking I was going to be a coach. It's something I lucked into. And a high school coach hired me to come home and run the seven on seven my junior year of college and introduced me to something that the servanthood of, of the sport that I loved. Um, and I was hooked, you know, and, and I think being able to wake up every day with a calling is a blessing and uh, something I tell my own sons, you know, I hope they find something that motivates them that when the alarm goes off, they're excited to go get to do what they're, they're on the planet to do. And um, so that was one thing that really stood out to me in this journey. Um, you know, as a program, you know, um, at a school now going on 11 years, which in this business is very hard to do. I'm um, seventh in power five for tenure. And um, with that, we've you know had the ability to put a lot of guys in the NFL and uh, win a lot of games. And obviously if we didn't win, I probably wouldn't still be here, but um, been in eight bowl games in 10 years, won a lot of games, put a lot of guys in the NFL and 
graduated more players than, than any coach in school history as well over my time frame. Uh, and we've built, you know, a pretty good product here in the state. You know, last year we were undefeated in our state and played three of the four uh, teams that you can play in state. So, you know, proud of that and look forward to continuing that. And when it comes to building our culture, I think it's something that doesn't just happen. It, it takes time uh, and it's daily. You know, it's it's literally like a plant that dies if you don't water it and tend to it and think about it. And uh, it starts with the roots. And, and for that, you know, that's the youngest people in the program, you know, nurturing the roots of our program and and not ignoring any part of any piece of it, you know, from any single person that is a part of dealing with our athletes. It's making sure they all understand what we do and why we do it. Uh, our staff, it's its not a head coach only thing. It's its through me uh, into them and down to the players and constantly putting our arms around it. Um, the commitment of being who you are and who you want to be never ends. And, and for me, it's I want to be the best me for these young men. I want them to be the best versions of themselves. And, and it's just trying to hold them accountable to that and myself accountable to that. And I ask our coaches this question a lot, you know, um, would you want you coaching you, you know, and a lot of people speak to it in other ways. Would you want to, would you want your son to be coached by you? I think that's a good way to look at it as well. Not everybody's a, a parent, you know, but I think most of us that coached something played something and we understand what that's like. And sometimes we lose sight of that. And so we have to challenge ourselves uh, all the time as coaches to be our best for them. Um, you know, to me, this is a great definition of leadership uh, in its purest form. It exists when people follow and they don't have to, uh, which really comes down to the training that they're going to be doing when you're not around. Um, for us as a program uh, in the area uh, of, in, in the, I guess, era of entitlement that is so prominent for all of us, regardless of the level you're coaching, we preach earn, not given uh, in every way. And there's so many different things that happen where guys want this, want that. And uh, I have to do a good job being a guardian against that. You know, I think a big measurement for us in our success here is grit. Um, you'll see that come up several times in this presentation. But we're the only team in college football history that won eight games with four different quarterbacks last year. Mm -hmm. Did that. I hope I never have to do it again. It was terrible to go through it. But it was impressive to see our team rally. Uh, we did it with – you know, the number one defense in the ACC, the number one special teams in the ACC, and it was complimentary football. And our offense was really good at one thing. They didn't turn the ball over. They protected the defense, and we punted the ball a lot, but we gave them long fields, and we found ways to win the game. And uh, we were down 21 or 20 to 3 to uh, to one team in Virginia Tech and came back and beat them. We were down 17-3, and to Florida State and came back and beat them. And, and uh, those were with second team, third string quarterbacks. And then we went on the road and beat UNC at their stadium with our four string quarterbacks. So, you know, grit is a big deal in our program and it circles all the way back historically to Jim Valvano here um, and his, you know, great speech about never giving up. You create that through sweat equity uh, and shared adversity with your team. You know, it's those long hours, those early hours, those late hours, uh, putting them through tough things and, and things that they can understand, too, not just sweating the sweat, you know, going out there with a purpose and for them understanding this is a society that really wants to know why they're doing things. But I think when you get guys doing hard things together, they create a bond. Um, the next thing is just holding players and coaches accountable. Um, it's leading, encouraging and being constructive with the teammate to your right and to your left. And we talk about leadership being just that, you know, are you making sure the guy to your right and your left is doing the right thing? Shed entitlement and crave enrichment. And this goes into recruiting. You know, we really look for guys that are not entitled. Um, if you could grade entitlement on a zero to 10 scale, I tell our coaches, where does this guy sit? Uh, if he's up there in the upper half, we're going to have a hard time with that guy on our team. It, it's going to be a battle. And, you know, I tell them this in recruiting, don't come here if you want me to kiss your ass because I'm not going to. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to treat you right and fair. I'm going to love you like you're my son, but I'm not going to make things pampered around here for you because that's not the real world. And we want kids that really desire that kind of environment here. 
Uh, our staff culture, I think this is important. You know, it's if the staff isn't connected, doesn't have chemistry, it's really hard to have it on your team. And so for me as the boss of this thing, the, the, the head coach, I have to create opportunities for these guys, whether it be a golf outing, fishing together, doing staff outings with our wives. But just again, just like we're telling the players to create <clears throat> that glue and that bond through shared adversity and sweat equity as a staff, we have to do the same thing. And it's important that you do it outside of the, the workspace, you know. Uh, and whenever you can bring the, the significant other, that's important. You know, I think that staff buy-in on the, the wife and um, significant other side helps a lot, too, during those tough times. And bottom line is it's easier to protect the foxhole when you love who's in it with you. And that goes to hiring the right people. So for me, surrounding myself with people I can trust and respect and and then coaching you know, recruiting players the same way where I look up to them. And I think that's the one thing here that's unique. I mean, I am the head coach. I am ultimately, you know, dictating things a lot, but I'm also a fan of these guys. You know, I, I completely in awe at times of some of the things they're capable of doing athletically, and I want to see them succeed at a high level. You know, I think for me, uh, you have to take time out of your calendar and invest time with these guys and you know, come up with nights on the calendar or days or, or eat breakfast or lunch or dinner, just do something special with them. Uh, I have a very experienced staff. You talk about who's with you. Um, there's 334 years of coaching experience on this staff. And I think I have two of the best coordinators in the country uh, on our staff, Robert and I on offense and Tony Gibson on defense. And, and then Todd Goble on our special teams unit. We finished second in the country two years in a row in special teams efficiency. So for high school coaches that are on this that want to come visit, you know, I would tell you, you get a lot out of your time. And we do have an open door policy to coaches that come in and, and unless they abuse it. Um, obviously, we don't want people coming in and recording things and copying things and then taking them to our opponents. But they come hmm. in and respect our process. We're going to give them open access to everything. Uh, our culture can really be summed up visually. I think this is something, you know, growing up as a kid, I was a big John Wooden uh, fan. I uh, grew up in, in Thousand Oaks, California until I was in the fourth grade. And that was when Coach Wooden was still at UCLA. And uh, he had the pyramid of success, and that always hung with me. And over time, as a head coach, you know, I've had my core values and, and standards. Um, but this has become the visual of who we are here at NC State. With the foundation, you can see one pack, one goal on the, the bottom of our house, I guess you would call it. And that's our mission statement, a united mission to win a championship. Um, the front door, you see the words hard, tough together. That's our identity. That's what we search for when we recruit. These kids that play hard, they play tough, mentally tough, physically tough, and they play together. They're good teammates to their guys on the field. Um, our core values are the pillars. You can see there's 12, which represent the 12 games we play in the regular season. And each one of these is, is touched on throughout the year, uh, particularly during training camp. We have coaches come up and present on each core value. And then at the end of uh, training camp, we get into game weeks. Each game, week one is urgency. <clears throat> we'll be talking about that core value that whole week. And, and then the second week, perseverance, the third week, focus, and how that core value really fits with the game plans and the film. And when we get into games, it's amazing how many times these things come up when you're watching the film. And lastly, the roof of our, our program, uh, which keeps us dry and safe is our standards. And there's five standards to our program. No underachievement allowed. Don't beat ourselves. Don't make excuses and don't let people make them for you. Invest in each other and the team and control the controllables. So this is everywhere. If you come here, you'll see it and it's something we're very proud of and something that we have to constantly talk about with our guys. It's not just slapped up on the wall and, and you know, kind of ignored. It's, it's really a living picture here. Um, I think, you know, for, for me, it's like, how do I bring this stuff to life? It's by constantly talking about it in different ways. And, uh, you know, our mission statement, I think, when you talk about unity, um, a united mission, it's really challenging in, in the football space. 125 young men uh, from all over the world, different backgrounds, socioeconomic, uh, rural. Some of them are urban, one parent, two parent, no parent. 
you know, uh, big school, little school, winning program, losing program, all of them have the same goals, but they don't know how to get there, you know, and you got to teach them how to get rid of their ego and become a great teammate. And uh, it's not just the team now, it's the staff from all over different, you know, career goals. Some of them want to move up the chain. Some of them are happy in the role they have. And so trying to get everybody united all the way down to the janitor, understanding the importance of our locker room being clean and, and how much pride they need to have in that because it keeps our players from getting sick and the quality of food, the way we serve our food, how we clean the cafeteria, all of it. Um, and not forgetting where we came from. You know, I, I started this conversation off with kind of the, the background of myself and, and, um, I think this happens to a lot of people They get in the job they have and they want to start complaining and being negative. And, you know, for me, it's, it's a blessing to have a job like this. And at times you have to kind of remember what you've been through and not risk it or undervalue, you know, how important it is. The goal here is to be a developmental program that gets better every day. And uh, every day is different, but the challenge is to improve in one area every day. And it's, for everybody in our program and it's identifying that one percent that you're going to focus on and then grading yourself did you get it done yes or no there is no in between uh if we're in a practice session there's 100 players on the field each of them have what we call a one more what one percent are they going to focus on hand placement first step eyes finish you know whatever body language leadership communication at the end of practice, they grade themselves on that. And, and your goal is for 100 players to get there one more. And now you have 100% improvement in one day. And so that's what we do over time. And um, you have to look at the negative sides of these things, too. Uh, you know, here's how we win a game. And then you also need to talk about here's how we can lose a game. It's no different in your growth. You know, here's how many people grew. Here's how many people didn't. And for us, we want to be efficient. You know, we, we don't want to win 70% of our games. <clears throat> Goals and actions, I think, you know, you start with a big goal. I want to be a state champion or I want to be an ACC champion. I want to be a national champion. And then from there, you go back to the daily process of getting it done and, and having an action plan and living up to the goal. Um, I think it's interesting just – kind of a sidebar here, but it's very tied into what I just talked about. You know, we talk about the dash here. Um, that's the dash on your tombstone. You know, you have your birth date, the dash, and your date of death. And that dash stands for your legacy, your life. And if you could write your own obituary, what would it say? And it's very similar to the long-term goal. If you're going to say you're an ACC champ or a national champ or a state champ or a conference champ, then what is the actions that need to take place look like for that to be reality? And I think it's a great way to live. Uh, it's a great way to train as a player because uh, you can ask the guys as they're in there, is that what it looks like to be a champion? And they're going to answer you quickly. You know, if a guy's missing a rep or coasting or bent over, all those things. You know, I think this is for those of us that are spiritual. This is a really important quote for me. Your life is on loan for a while, a short while, and one day God will call time out and take it back. Um, you know, the action to me is way more important than the verbal goal. You know, what does it look like when they're out there working? And for us as coaches, we have to help them create an action plan that is very narrow and focused. You know, I'll ask kids all the time, what is your goal? And if a kid says, oh, I'm going to get better, I'm like, that's not a good goal. I want a specific thing you're going to be working on uh, and tell me exactly what it is. And then they tell me, and now they can go get better. And you can't climb a mountain looking at the peak. You focus on the path. And it's just another way to say the same thing. And your goal with these guys, in my opinion, is to just stack great days, competitive championship type days on top of each other. How many can you stack in a row? It's like shooting free throws. How many can you make in a row? You know, do the daily actions match the path that leads to the goal? You know, and I think that's our go uh, job as coaches is to be the guardians uh, of that. This is a really good leadership book. If, if uh, people like to read or listen to books, it's called Legacy by James Kerr. Um, it's about the all black rugby team in New Zealand, but it's a tremendous book on how to build a culture, uh, a hardworking blue collar, 
team-based culture. I, I loved it. One of the best books I've read in my life. But uh, we talk about this with our team. You know, a true leader is called to leave the jersey in a better place than when he was handed it. So win today ownership, that is the process. You hear this used, maybe abused a lot, the process. It's a daily elite structured grind and focus on winning the day we have and, and try to really, really hone in on this with social media and all the stuff that goes on with parents and, and people outside the program to not allow the outside influences into the mission. You know, when you have that mission focused time, keep it that way. And then come in after practice or after the competition and study, respect and reflect on that body of work and grade it, you know, and, and work to learn, own, accept and refocus on each day. Uh, you have to study your past to know yourself and see what your opponent's going to see. And then after that study, we move on to planning, goal setting and attacking our new day, always searching for our personal best or one more. And again, it's aggregate team improvement that we're focused on here at NC State. There's a couple things that we define. Uh, GSD is an acronym, stands for Get Stuff Done. And uh, these are the type of kids that I like to recruit. We call them one time guys. You tell them something once and then it's fixed, it's done. And as opposed to you tell them something, they screw it up. You tell them again, they screw it up again. You tell them again, they screw it up again. That's a hard guy to coach. And it's similar in your staff. You know, if you have guys with GSD as one of their traits, Hey, I give you an assignment. I need you to do a third down report or I need you to go get this done. You don't have to think about it again because you trust them and you know their quality work is going to be really high. Those are the kind of people you like to work with and you end up promoting. Um, but it is who we have to be and, and, and love being that way. And then grit, <clears throat> learning how to deny yourself quitting, teaching your body and your mind that you will not surrender and having positive body language versus poor body language. And we talk about this a lot. How do you do that? Well, when you train here at NC State, our guys are not allowed to put their hands on their hips when they're tired. They're not allowed to bend over and put their hands on their knees. They're not allowed to have their hands up over their heads. We literally have our hands hanging down, our arms hanging down, our chest is out, our chin is up. If, if they're in a position where they need to lean on someone, they lean on a teammate. But we do that for a reason to train them so that on game day, we have that body language that intimidates. And, and when our opponents are in those fatigued positions, it inspires our guys. They know they're about to go out there and finish the guy off. This is another leadership book, a great author. I think this is one of his four books now, but it's called The, the Obstacle is the Way. And, and for us, building this program starting 11 years ago, there was a lot of obstacles that we had to overcome, and a lot of them were mental. And um, it's really about taking what's really hard and, and sometimes what feels impossible and then getting it done and turning that into the reason that you are who you are. Um, it's been a huge, huge thing for me. We had a really challenging season here one year and I read this book and it was a great way for me to kind of get back on track. Um, so then, you know, you talk about how you do these things and it's about three phases of their life. And this is a picture of Peyton Wilson. He's, Coming back here for his sixth year, he's going to be one of the best defensive players in the country, the best linebacker in the country for sure. Um, but, you know, we spent all this time on him as players. Obviously, that's why they're here to play football. But then getting their degree, Peyton was the first college graduate in his family of all the people in his family. And so that was a huge thing for them. And then as a person, he's one of the, the most generous guys when it comes to giving up his time to a special needs community here in Raleigh and back home where he's from in Orange County. Uh, and so along the way, it's been cool to see just some of the public things said about our program. And, and Coach Belichick was kind enough to come to our pro day a few years ago. And, you know, I think, again, what people say about you is more important than what you say. But uh, we have a program that the, the NFL scouts respect. And. Again, how do you prove it? Well, we just had Pro Day. There's 32 NFL teams. We had 32 teams here. My first year here, there was like six or seven. And so they respect our guys, the way they come out of here. They're tough, and they know what they're going to get. Um, we've really made a, a living in-state. Uh, these are players drafted from the state of North Carolina. 
Uh, you can see where we stack up since 2018. And this is not including the most recent draft. Um, so this is up until then. But you can see where we stack up of signing our own talent from our own state and then getting it to be NFL talent. Uh, in the last 16 years, so I guess it's now 17 in the last six years, uh, we just added Chandler Zavala to this list. And then this is one of the ones that's pretty cool. You know, we've signed a lot of three-star or below players that probably don't get celebrated when we sign them. But we've also turned more three-star or below players into NFL draft picks than anyone but Iowa and Wisconsin. So, uh, again, a tradition of development which takes place here. And if you look at what we've done with these kind of guys, uh, this is the last five signing classes and where we finished, you know, sixth out of the teams you can see listed and then where we finished in correlation to those teams and wins since 2014. So, again, I think, you know, it's a great visual of proof in the pudding. Um, developing the student, that's Isaiah Moore on the far right of the screen there, um, holding the ball with two hands, who Coach was talking about earlier. But these are five of our guys that graduated recently and, and uh, very proud of them. How do we do it? You know, we bring them in here with a plan to graduate them in three and a half years so that if they play as a true freshman and don't redshirt, they're graduated by the time they leave the field on their last football game. Uh, and then if they do redshirt, they just have extra time to work on a master's or a second degree. And one of the things about Raleigh right now, this is one of the hottest places in the country. It's the fastest growing city west or east of the Mississippi, and it's the number one real estate market east of the Mississippi. And it's because all these tech companies are moving their secondary um, and secondary businesses out here. Apple, IBM, Amazon have all moved secondary headquarters to Raleigh and, and the surrounding areas with jobs. You know, the person, this is a pretty cool part of our program. You know, we're, we're over 9,000 hours of community service since I've been here probably closer to 15,000 now. That's Trent Gill. He's a starting punter for the Chicago Bears uh, two years ago. He went home during the bye week and saw his his uh, old elementary school playground, has no toys in it. It was all busted up and rusted out and came back and wanted to figure out how to raise money and uh, put together a GoFundMe account, raised $10,000 in, in a matter of time and went back and used that money to build a playground at his old elementary school. Pretty cool deal. Um, teaching all these things, how do you do it? You know, I'm fortunate to have Ruff and McNeil on my staff. Ruff was a head coach for a long time at ECU and, and a 40-year-old vet in college football. And Freddie Autry Lindsay, who played at NC State and coaches here now as our Nichols coach, they teach our leadership and our culture to our new players every semester. So there's a class that they teach every Wednesday morning to these guys so that they're learning the ins and outs of our culture while they're living it and not just hearing it one time. They're hearing it weekly for 16 weeks. So that is the end of that presentation there. And yes, sir. Uh, hopefully I can figure out how to get back on the screen with you. Yes, sir. All I right. got you right here, coach. Cool. Uh, so you know, up for questions or anything like that. Yeah. A college coach told me recently, and it made a lot of sense. He said, Troy, you know, I can't make the NFL take our guys just like you can't make colleges take your guys. And it made a lot of sense. So what can we do as coaches? I mean, I guess it's just what you just presented. I mean, the best way to – prepare your players for the NFL or through the next for the next level for you coach and for college for me I mean what is it really that that we should be focused on as coaches is making our players what I mean, it's probably the whole I, mean, I, I think I just told you what to do but you know to me it's hold kids accountable you know more than anything I think I said this to this high school clinic I just talked at I, I think high school coaches have uh, in a lot of ways, started to cater to kids more than uh, hold them accountable and try to get them out of things and keep them from failing out of classes by going to their teachers and helping them. And you know, I think kids are coddled way too much. Uh, if you want to help them, love them harder and tougher. Uh, that's my opinion. I, I just think the real world's not a nice place. And if they want to make it 
to the NFL, that's 3% of the college football players that do that. So they've got to be in the top 3% of everything that they do, you know? And so I think, mm. you know, for you guys at your level, I don't know what the percentage is of high school players that go to college to play football, but it's not a high percentage. You could probably find that out somewhere, but you know, it's someone that, one of the things I say to our players, like you say, you want to play in the NFL. Well, that means you're going to do what only 3% of the world does. And clearly that's not it. Like, you know, I mean, you have to call them out a lot and they need to hear the truth more than anything right now, I think, because they get so much pampering. Um, and, and I think your parent group is really important. You know, in my opinion, it's making sure they understand the reality, you know, and, and that you're going to have to coach their kids hard if they want them to play at the next level, because entitled kids do not make it. They don't. When they get to this level, they're not going to survive. Um, and you know what I mean by that. Kids like Isaiah Moore will not let them on the field. I mean, they're never going to play in front of the kids that have that intrinsic motivation in their life. Yeah. Uh, Coach once told me, he said, unspooled kids from unspooled programs. Yeah, and yeah, that's well said. I mean, and that's one thing you say about Isaiah Moore is that he got coached hard. I know his defensive coordinator because I, I played for him, Coach Tony Nicely. And you know, he played right next to Rashard Ashby that was a captain at Virginia yeah. Tech. I mean, yeah. two captains, two ACC captains, and nobody could take a butt chewing better – than Ashby and Isaiah Moore. So that really says something about their toughness. And yeah. like toughness, uh, Coach Al Grow told me and when you were talking about, you know, getting a guy, you know, get a, a guy who gets stuff done. He said Bill Parcells would say, How many times do you have to get hit in the face with a skunk? Like, how many times does that, that kid not have to go to class before, you know, something happens? Right. Uh, so and he said, Troy, you need to show your players on video what toughness is. So what what what's your definition for toughness? You might have had that in there, Coach. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at it. You know, there's mental toughness, there's physical toughness, there's emotional toughness. Uh, and you're right. I think the visual examples are huge. We we do a lot. We call teachable moments, and it doesn't have to be our own team. Like if we see something on NFL film, or if we see a high school play, even that shows great effort. You know, a guy getting knocked down and he pops up and sprints 50 yards down the field, makes a game saving tackle. Like if those things are ever captured on film, we make a huge deal over that, you know, a finish. Um, after we win games, we bring in like the, the team and celebrate finish plays, you know? And so we really celebrate what toughness is on video around here and, and not cheap shot stuff. I mean, like real, putting your hands on a guy, driving him 10 yards down the field and putting him on his back. Like we're celebrating that play, you know? So I think it's just part of who our program uh, or what our program's about. And, you know, same thing in the weight room. Our, our strength coach does a great job, D'Antonio Burnett, of, of breathing our culture and celebrating the blue collar mentality that we have. Yeah, I loved how you put the, the quote from Bill Belichick. And every time I, you know, get to meet somebody that knows coach, the one, the one thing that people tell me is that he's – I mean, Tom McDaniels told me this, uh, Coach Josh McDaniels' dad, that Josh said he's probably the greatest listener of all time. And how how do you become a better listener, Coach? Because you seem like you're pretty good at it. Boy, my wife would not agree with that. <laughs> but, uh, I think you got to be conscious of it. You know, I, I was not a great listener early in my career. I can tell you that. You thought I thought I knew a lot more than I did. <clears throat> I think you got to fail some. You know, you got to get humbled, and and then you realize you got two ears and one mouth for a reason. And the people talking deserve, you know, for you to hear what they're saying and listen to it and take it in and try to breathe a little bit before you respond. You know, and show them the respect they deserve. Doesn't mean you have to agree with what they're saying, but you can learn a lot, you know, just from gathering kind of the pulse of what's going on in the room uh, and formulating a, a educated opinion. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, as a boss, you got to make choices, you know, and you got to live with them. So you know, for me, I do like to get input when I need it and, and really marinate on it when I need to, and then make the decisions that need to be made for the greater good. One of the things uh, I've done about a hundred of these podcasts with different coaches. And one of the things the high school coaches uh, tell me they really like to hear 
is when a coach like yourself, if you were talking to a parent or a high school player, like what should they be concerned about? You know, some guys are worried about Twitter and offers and going and getting pictures and what camp they need to go to and how many stars. What really should parents and players that are 10th or 11th graders, what should they really worry about? What should they focus on? Yeah, I think those are all like uh, the things you end up with. You know, I think you got to worry about the process of getting them. It's similar to what I was talking about. Like if your goal is to get a lot of offers, well, you do that by being a really good player and a good teammate. And, and so how do you become a good player and a good teammate? Well, you do that by working out, being on time, giving maximum effort, paying attention, you know, doing what your coach asks, your teachers ask. I mean, you have to do all those things right in order to get the reward. The reward is the offer, you know, or the invite to go be a part of a camp or whatever it might be. And I think so much because of social media, it makes it harder because now there's all these comparisons, you know, they're seeing all these other kids get their offers every day and it puts pressure on them, you know, and I think that's hard for these families that <clears throat> some of them are counting on that, right? The scholarship to go to college and uh, but they can't get lost in the fact that they're not getting anything if they're not good where they're at, you know, and I think that's something they probably need to hear more um, from a parent standpoint, you know, don't over schedule your, your kids, you know, they, they need to be at their high school. They need to be in that weight room and they need to be at the workouts to the best of their ability. Sometimes these kids go on a world tour and they're gone for 20 days in the summer at 15 different camps and, I, I don't know how they're a good teammate doing that. You know, I think there's got to be a happy medium, you know, where you're going to the schools that are very interested in you and where you have a legitimate chance of going to school and uh, spend the rest of the time, you know, being a leader at the school you're at. Yeah, Coach, I, I totally agree. And, and for the high school coaches uh, that are watching or will watch Coach at a later date, is there anything you would like to leave them with? Um yeah, sure. as, we, as we end the clinic. Coach. Yeah, you know, I think all of us just need to remember what the opportunity is we have to to really mold young people into what we need in our country. Um, our country's a mess. It's an absolute mess right now. And uh, we're in one of the few positions of mentorship that matters, in my opinion, still. And every day you may have the opportunity to train, uh, coach, um, a young person that needs you in their life. I think all of us as coaches are coaches because we had one in our lives at some point in time that got us in the right spot, you know, and steered us in the right direction, kept us from screwing up our lives and, and really directed us in a positive way. And I think we forget that sometimes, you know, we take for granted the role we have, the power that, that the role we have really has in it. These guys that show up to work at whatever time the school opens and rush home as soon as they can. They're, they're not getting the job done, in my opinion. You know, you need to spend more time on the phone or in text or in person with your players, helping them. Uh, it's truly why you became a coach, in my opinion, is to serve young people and help them get somewhere they couldn't go without you. And uh, so, you know, relish the, the opportunity and, and would love to see that, I don't know, that, that coaching – push our young people a little bit better than it is right now. I, I just really struggle um, watching what's happening sometimes at these high schools when I go to practice and just not seeing the, you know, the motivation that you used to see in the profession. And uh, would love to see that continue to, to grow and emerge, you know, as something that can help our society better. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Coach. Uh, stay in contact. I want to come down there and visit y'all and see how y'all do it. And thank you for everything you did for Isaiah, Coach. You bet. Well, we're proud of him, too. Thanks for the time today, guys. Go Pack. Thank you, Coach. Have a good day, Coach. Now you do the same. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'm going to take a brief break. It's 2.40 right now. Coach G is going to be coming on at 2.50. All right. Thank you all.
What's up, Coach? What's happening, man? Can you hear me? Yeah, um, we're live. So oh, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, it, it, your your talk hasn't started yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's streaming out there. Oh, it, sweet. That's cool. If I press in broadcast, dude, I'm worried that that link won't work. So gotcha, gotcha. It's just it's just going. We just had Coach Dorn on in yeah, State. man. Well, and, uh, it's a tough act to follow, but I'm gonna do my best. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. But, yeah, no, I, I – what you were saying before about, uh, you know, being on since 10 at – trust – hey, you know, I know that struggle, so. Yeah, uh, we uh, – I did five hours on Saturday with Coach Bob Wiley. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he was oh, – Oh, that was probably tremendous, yeah. Endless by knowledge. The end, by the end, he was – I'm at five hours right now. But yeah. uh, by the end, the, he was asking his own questions and answering them. <laughs> And he, most, we, didn't, we didn't even know for three hours that we were five seconds behind because he, oh, wow. he was watching it on YouTube. Oh, you know, wow. Yeah. Yeah. The most I, I remember, uh, you know, I obviously I did all those those clinic talks during the pandemic. And one day I, I, don't know, I, scheduled, <laughs> I didn't I do any. I scheduled, I scheduled all of these in one. I scheduled like 10 in a day. I remember the first one was at 730 in the morning. And then the last one started at 10 p.m. I was wiped. I was cooked. Wow. Cooked. See, I didn't watch one clinic talk over COVID, dude. No. So everybody's like, yeah, I didn't watch one. I it was yeah. I, I was I was 20 years in. Yeah. I was yeah, 20 yeah, years yeah. in, so I took a break. But now now I started this podcast. I've done 120 since January. Dope. Um, so everybody was like, Troy, you're late to the game. They people were doing <laughs> this over COVID. I, was like, I didn't know. For real. I over, didn't know. Yeah. Over COVID. I guess all I everybody else is kind of like um you know it's kind of settled down yeah it has it has over COVID man I mean just just during that time alone like I, I probably I think I did like over 350 just in the just in that those few months 350 months. yeah wow and, that, and, and you know so you know if, if you if you go on my profile that that link is to my Google Drive that's where all the clinic talks are literally every single just about every single one I did is on there. We had some where coaches asked, you know, that it not be recorded, but I mean, there's a ton in there. It was wild. Why am I even doing my own? I mean, every <laughs> everything's already been talked about. Man, it, you know what though? It, it's it, yes and no. It's like you still get something. You always get something out of it. You know what I mean? Everything is a little. Someone brings us just a little bit something different there, and um, it just it's 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 awesome, man. I mean, because. From from the pandemic to now, there's been endless amount of clinics, and and it's still you still look forward to like when you see a lot like when when this lineup came out and you see all the coaches on there, you're like man, like I can't wait to listen to him. I can't wait to like yeah, we're that'll doing- never that'll never go away as long as yeah. as long as we're pro- you know looking to progress in the in the in the field, it'll never go away. Yeah. So do you? I mean, you probably teach me how to use this thing. Do you want to present your screen? Uh, so, you know, it's funny. I, yeah. I never, I never use this, but let's see. Oh, sh- I can share my screen. Yeah. Present. It's down at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got it here. Perfect. You see that? Yeah. I'm adding okay. it to the screen right now. It's, it's up. Okay. Is it just, um, let me see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Well, weekly ske- weekly schedule. Yeah, and yeah, every day. Yeah. That's pretty that's pretty cool i can kind of i can i can look on it like i can still i can see it from how we see it and then i can also see it from like my screen it's kind of cool yeah if you oh, if cool. you have if you have two screens it's it's good but if you only have yeah. one screen then you can't see yourself yeah you just kind of have to go back and forth i think yeah right. back that's and all right forth, yeah that's all right yeah, yeah this so, is good this is good coach this is but yeah um, go ahead coach i'm sorry I was just, I was gonna say this is my first time getting to meet you. So you know, for people who are watching or gonna watch, like, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Where you're from? I mean, know you're at a great program. Sure. Yeah. Um, definitely blessed to be here at uh, Jackbird High School. Um, you know, it's uh, it's definitely something that, you know, I've uh, I came in here. I moved to North Carolina uh, back in 2013, uh, November of 2013, and. I started coaching here in the the spring of 2014, and then obviously the first season was that fall, 
And uh, yeah, just a, a phenomenal place to be. Um, you know, great academic school. Football program is always strong. Um, I've now now worked under two head coaches. Both have been tremendous uh, for, you know, obviously for the program, but also for my growth um, as an assistant coach and just a coach in general. Um, I've been coaching since 2008. I started at, uh, did some JV work one summer and then you know, you fast forward in 2008, I'm, I'm, I'm coaching at Pace University's Division II school in, in New York. And um, it's just kind of remarkable how uh, God opens up doors, you know. And um, I mean, because i be honest, I didn't <laughs> didn't really deserve to, to get that job. But it just so happened, like, you know, they were in a they needed a coach. I was I was available. And uh, it's really where everything kind of grew for me as far as like loving what I'm doing, um, because. You know, I just learned so much under some really great dudes and uh, it was so much fun, man. Like just the the game planning, the the technique, all that kind of stuff was 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 awesome. Um, you know, I was doing a lot of like GA type work just because I was still very new and I wanted to learn as much as possible. And uh, yeah, I just I, I learned so much during that that time frame. We weren't the best, um, but, you know, it was just it was something where it was a great experience. Uh, it's awesome to see that program. I should be really successful now. So that's that's awesome. And then, you know, once again, now I'm here um, at Jackbird High School and, you know, I had some really good seasons, had some, you know, not the best seasons, but uh, it's been awesome. I got a chance to coach with a lot of really great dudes and, and more importantly, coach a lot of really amazing kids. And uh, now I currently serve as the offensive coordinator. I coach receivers and uh, I'm our team's recruiting coordinator. So it's been a lot of fun, been a lot of fun. Right on, Coach. So what, what are you talking yeah. about today? So I'll be talking about um, some of uh, my wide receiver everyday drills, um, and I'll kind of touch on our weekly schedule, just, you know, what we do in the game weeks and whatnot. But I uh, really wanted to just share these, you know, a few everyday drills that we do that I feel like are, are super beneficial and that anybody can really implement right now. It's low-maintenance stuff. Um, you know, you don't need, you know, any – crazy equipment or anything like that. It's just, you know, it's just bodies and, and, and footballs here and there. But, um, you know, it's receiver play has definitely become a passion of mine. And uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to to be able to continue to coach it. And I'm, I'm really excited because since I took over wide receivers in 2017, this is literally the first time I return two starters. It's been it's been wild. Uh, every year it's just something goes on or whatever. If a kid comes, if a kid comes in, he, it's maybe like he never really played the previous year or whatever, but this is the first year, knock on wood, that um, I return to uh, starter. So really excited. The group I have is, is, is very good. They work hard. So I'm excited to share what I got. Right on coach. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it should be fun. Should be very fun. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, any any time I get the you know get a chance to talk ball and, and share, and hopefully, you know, someone gets something out of it. You know, it's 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 awesome. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. So you, you, is this your first slide right here? The fight club, the flight club, because I was yeah asking yeah that's fight club. Yeah, There's no, flight flight, club. it looks like it. Like yeah, so flight club, yeah, flight club is uh, is is our kind of moniker. I guess. And uh, yeah, I was just um, kind of coined it off the, the movie Flight Club. I wanted to give a different spin to it because, you know, you've heard flight clubs before and and which are which are all great in their, their own regard. I wanted to give it a different kind of feel. So I went with the Fight Club um, uh, feel to it, you know, for our group. And yeah, um, they really adopt, you know, they really kind of um, really took on that that role. Like they really took on that that group name and, and they take a lot of pride in it. Uh, so it's been, it's been fun to, to see that happen. Yeah. So I, I'm going to take myself out of this. Cause I, I think some people, they're, they're sick of looking at my face. So I'm going <laughs> to let you, I'm going to let you go coach. All right. Thank yeah. you, brother. I'm gonna no, no. Me. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. So I'll kind of get rolling and, um, uh, just a heads up, uh, there, there's a little bit of work going on in the building. So if you hear anything, that's probably why, but, um, I'll get rolling here. So yeah, like I was saying, um, this is uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, our, our everydays. That's the main focus of this presentation. You know, uh, I'll touch on some of our weekly schedule stuff and, um, you know, just kind of go from there. And of course, I mean, I, I think, I, I, you know, I, I know it's 
this live stream. I don't know if any questions come in, but I'm willing to answer whatever. Um, but if you see here, uh, you know, above the picture, uh, the standard above everything, uh, that's our that's our saying this year as a program. Um, we, you know, obviously we, you know, people are constantly talking about, you know, the standards and upholding the standards of this and that. Um, so we're very much in that same boat, of course. And, you know, we're going to put that above everything. And then um, for our group, you know, <clears throat> going into this year, we're talking about standard over feelings, which I'll kind of explain how I got that. Um, so this is where I got it from, uh, David Pollack you know, was, was on a podcast and uh, he was talking about standard over feelings. And he said, elite is hitting a standard every single day. Elite is standard over feelings, you know, meaning, right. Whatever's going on, we all have stuff going on. And, uh, you know, we have to be able to still um, hit those standards, right. No matter what, I mean, you're going to have bad days. Like the easiest thing in the world is to practice when you have a great day or when you're feeling good, right. You, you, you wake up, you're feeling energized, fresh, um, you know, you have a workout and you go because you feel great. But then the next day, you know, you have that same workout, you wake up feeling crappy, um, didn't sleep well, I don't know, stuffy nose, maybe, you know, you had some bad news and it's like everything, everything within you is wanting you to hold back. Are you still going to be able to rise to uh, the standard of, of which you set for yourself and, and, and what the program is set? So that's kind of, you know, what our focus is it's always to think about our standard over feelings. <clears throat> so here's our every days, which I'll, which I'll kind of go into. So angles, um, big on big on blocking here. Like raw receiver blocking is, is probably the number one thing for us. And I know that may sound crazy, but um, for me, when I'm coaching these guys up is I want to really establish that buy into the run game. You know, Coach Marion says it all the time and it's it's one of the best sayings I've, I've heard, to be honest, but what you do without the football determines how much you love your teammates. And, uh, you know, we want to constantly show how much we love these guys, um, you know, and, and, and we're going to really show that in our effort and our attitude in the run game um, in the screen game, things like that. And we're going to constantly make sure, you know, we're playing through the whistle. Um, so how I teach blocking has progressed over the years and now it's become more playing on angles. I mean, if you think about it right, I know some O-line guys, guys have been on here. Um, today and I know there'll be some tomorrow, but you know, I mean, they're blocking all the time, and 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 a lot of it is based on angles and which angles they're taking. Well, shoot, if the if the guys that are blocking primarily are doing that, you know, why isn't everybody else? So um, we really adopted, you know, taking the proper angle to get places, and uh, you know, and that's how and that's how we really uh, make sure that we're effective in the run and screen game. Um, while we do that with our with our every days and these angles, we you know, we also work our stance and start in a, in a sense. Right. Because we're able to come out of our stance to get to certain angles. Um, you know, sometimes like, for instance, if we're an inside foot up team. So, you know, if I have my left foot up and I'm going to my left, you know, to roll off and cross over is not the most is not the best always. So um, to just kind of throw a variation to the drill, we'll work on different um, different releases to do that. And that's something that you know, the guys are getting more comfortable with even this spring. Contested catches, we know that if we want to really make an impact out on that field, excuse me, we got to be able to make a tough grab. Plain and simple. Um, it's never something where we should expect an easy pass. Like we sh should always know that we're going to catch with some kind of contest, you know, somebody contesting us, whether it's it's one defender, whether it's two, whether it's a safety, whether it's a linebacker, something we got to be able to do it. And I want our guys to constantly think about attacking the football and, and doing so and really showing it um, with aggression in the air. If we are there or anywhere, we just we know if that ball is in the air, we're we're getting it. We're coming down with it. We're going to get it, whatever the case may be. And it's something that I feel like needs to be worked every day. And you can definitely see um, you can definitely see the progression um, when you work that every day with guys. OK, so um, we'll talk about and you'll see some of the variations, a little backpedal high point, um, side shuffle, high point, hold the line, stack and box okay, and down the line stuff. And then hip drop, our free throws, we call them. It's just one of our many free throws. And we call them that because it's something that we do every day. And it's for the fact that we want to make sure that we have the, the, the most perfect form, 
and technique um, as we're as we're performing this movement. One of the core fundamental movements of receiver play um, is the hip drop. And we we do it every single day. And the guys hear me say it every single day that we are we are here to do things until we can't get them wrong, not until we get them right. All right. And, and this is absolutely one of them. Obviously, we know, you know, if we're running routes and, and we're working on break points, well, it starts with the hip drop. If your hip drop isn't great, then, you know, the your, your route is probably not going to be as, as effective, you know, and, and you're not going to get um, that separation that you want. So uh, we'll show stationary drop, step and drop up and back and then down the line. OK, um, this is just our game week and I'll kind of just buzz through it quick. But um, man up Monday, we, we get out there and really um, we really work on our, our, our blocking stuff. I want these guys to get out there and, and bang a little bit. You know, you see on the bottom, no case of the Mondays, right? I don't want guys coming in off the weekend flat. You know, it takes us a day or two to get kind of, you know, acclimated to the practice week all over again. Like I got to wake these guys up now. So when they get an Indy, um, we're going to, we're going to get right to it. We're going to, we're going to make contact. We're going to throw the tire out there and do some tire tug of wars and get them competing and being physical um, to really set the tone of the week. Tuesday uh, and Wednesday just kind of depends on the game week um, and or sorry, the game plan and who we're playing. You know, if we're playing, say, like a, a big time press team, then we'll probably work more um, releases and things like that. Um, but it just kind of varies. And I'll, I'll structure that depending on the opponent. Um, <clears throat> Thursday, we have our AM walkthrough um, and then the JV game in the evening. Friday is obviously game day. And then um, uh, Saturday, you know, we have a, a team stretch and meeting where we'll watch uh, the film after we stretch uh, special teams and then we get into with our position groups or or a certain side of the ball. You know, like a lot of times I'll take receivers, running backs, quarterbacks, you know, and the O-line kind of goes separate. We'll say, well, I'll take tight ends as well. Um, and just to kind of backtrack, we'll just see on the next slide, you know, Friday um, before the game, I always play book test them just to kind of keep them fresh and make sure that they know what they're doing. All right. This is just an example of a playbook test. Always kind of some generic basic questions. Um, just to make sure that they know, but it's just, you know, I, you know, I want to put some stuff on there, build that confidence. Like that name of the opponent, what kind of defense they run, all stuff that we, we discuss. All right. And then you'll see towards the bottom, it's, you know, draw the formation in the play. Um, and, you know, once again, just to make sure that they're, they're on point with things. All right. <clears throat> um, so our every days, so it says uh, quote from Kobe Bryant, where, um, you know, uh, it was uh, from a book, um, and actually, this book right here by Alan Stein Jr. Both of these are really great. Uh, but he's, you know, he, he's a basketball trainer, he's an author, so he goes to check out Kobe Bryant um, practice, and he asked him to practice because he was working or he was at one of his camps. And you know, Kobe told him to meet him um, very early in the morning, and and Alan Stein goes a little earlier than he said, and Kobe's already there. And long story short, he's watching him practice, and he's just watching him do just basic basic level stuff like very fundamental movements shots things like that nothing crazy um so you know at the end of the workout obviously he's talking to him and thanking him for inviting him and he's speaking on the fact that you know he asked him like you know kobe like you're the best player in the world you know why are you why are you sitting here just working on the basics and this is what he said you know why do you think i'm the best player in the world because i never get bored with the basics so um, I want our guys to know that and buy into that. And they hear me say that all the time, like be obsessed with the basics, be obsessed with the fundamentals. That's what I'm going to constantly preach every single day. Um, and they know that. And, and, you know, they really buy into it and they enjoy doing it because they know it's going to get them better. Once again, we do things until we can't get them wrong, not until we get them right. OK, so here's our stance and start and our angling um, blocking stuff. OK. Um, it's all about angles and we call it, we, we play bully ball. That's what we call it because we, we want to set a precedence. We want to set the tone early um, that we're going to be pushing you around. We're going to be giving relentless effort. We're going to chase you down. If you're, if you're looking to get over top, like you're going to know and feel our presence from the first whistle to the last whistle, whatever it is. And I'm a firm believer in when you establish that physical presence um, in the run game, everything else starts to translate. You know what I mean? You become physical at the line of scrimmage. You become physical at the break point. You become physical at the catch point. It all it all correlates at the end of the day. And that's what I want. All right. So a couple uh, a couple of the bullet points here. Right. Take the angle to beat the defender to the spot. Right. It's better to be early than late. So we work on both stationary getting an angle. And we also work on with with uh, player movement. So, hey, if that dude starts to work a little faster, you may have to flatten your angle set up um, just like playing basketball defense. 
right? You want to almost sit in that chair, get your, your base a little wider so that I can move laterally and cut people off. All right, wait for the defender to pick away, patient but sudden, just like how we release. Um, that's one of the commandments for releases for us is we want to be patient with our approach and our decision. But then once that decision uh, needs to be made, it's got to happen real fast. And uh, we just like yesterday, we did a screen drill with um, the DBs and it was the same thing. It's like sometimes those guys were, were over aggressive and, and really looking to get after them. And then, you know, we're kept, uh, caught lunging and things like that. Sprint, get to your spot, set up, all right? The defender has to pick away sooner or later because if you get down the field, set up, and he just stands there, well, the guy behind us with the ball is gaining yards the whole time, all right? So let's force his hand, force his hand, all right? And that's what we're going to do. And once, all right, once we are patient with that approach but sudden with the movement, then we just have to attack and be aggressive, okay? So here's an example, all right? You have obviously – a head up defender here and what our receivers are going to do is work on an angle so they're going to work on this angle and set up this is actually later in our progression um one of our progressions will this will be our first progression is to get here and set up okay you want to keep your feet buzzing but this is what we want we want to sprint to the spot and set up i don't want to be too tight to the defender because in my mind if i'm too tight that means that dude is going to beat us over top all right. We work hip drop here because once again, I have to be able to come to a stop abruptly and, and, and have a good base and have my feet ready to roll and, and be able to move a certain way. OK, we um, we once we set up. OK, like I said, if it's the first progression, this is where it'll start and then they'll reset. OK, then there'll be another progression where they'll get here. Right. Set up. And all I'm going to have this defender do is walk towards them so they can learn their strike zone. Because everybody has a different strike zone. Our arms are all different lengths. The way we strike is all different sometimes. So I want them to get to learn their strike zone. So once they set up, um, this dude will walk towards him and then we'll attack. Then the next time he'll jog towards him just so you see it's visually a little different. Now that dude's moving a little faster. All right. And this is kind of the last mood, uh, uh, last mode in the progression or last level is once they set up, now the defender is going to jog, but he's going to pick away. And this is what you're looking for, okay? This is what you want. These receivers to set up. The defender is going to look to, to fake them out or whatever, all right? And once he commits away, he turns those shoulders, that's when you have to attack, okay? And when you attack, you, you just take him where he wants to go, okay? Let the ball carry behind you. Do the rest. We cannot sit there and look behind us and, and, and do all that. My thing is this. If you want to sit there and watch – the play, all right, you want to watch the, the, the runner do his thing, you can do it one or two ways, I tell him. Either Friday night next to next to the coaches and, and the rest of the players from the sideline, or, you know, like, like us on Saturday, we're going to sit there and watch the film together. So, um, you know, if you really want to watch it in that game, okay, then you can watch it from the sideline. But we're not going to – we're not going to sit there and look back. Trust that your guy is going to make the right cut, okay, and find the right crease. All right, but – you see, right, we want to make sure we're striking, get the hands inside. We don't want to overstride, you know, with our hands. We don't want to get caught leaning here. But, you know, you can kind of get away with it sometimes once that dude commits away. But I would still like to see him, you know, a little bit tighter at first and then extending. Like, you know, here, you know, obviously you just got to be careful with that hand. If I'm blocking from the side, I want to get my one hand on the, you know, the, the, his breastplate here. And I want to get that other hand maybe right under that shoulder pad and just kind of drive them out. And worst case scenario, we teach a, um, I teach a, a technique that will help us get out of bad situations when that dude starts to beat us over top and we're just going to long arm it. So like right here, um, I know it's hard to see, but it would essentially be like this where his hand, his hand comes off. Okay. His inside hand comes off and this outside hand is on it. And we would just drive through that shoulder and just push him out and whatever happens happens. Okay. Okay, here's some examples, right? We're going to set up. He's setting up, taking an angle, and now he's in the way. Here's basketball defense, right? He's set up, all right? His hands are ready to strike. He's being patient, right? He didn't go lunging at him. Once that dude commits, here he commits. Now we attack, okay? And there's the long arm that I was telling you about, right? He's attacking. Right now, this dude is starting to beat us across the face, okay? So we're going to transition. We're going to now – shot put if, we're, if our arms are inside or if we just get it here we want to, we want to shop i say shot put because i want to drive through that that long arm because obviously one arm is longer than two okay i'm gonna drive them out and now this is what it's about and i was i was telling these guys this 
force application, right, and force redirection. Okay, so this dude, right, he's got a driving force here. If I can, if I can drive through his shoulder pad and get his arm to come up, he loses a lot of his force, and now I can get myself back in the driver's seat. And that's what happens here. This is not a bone shattering block. It's not a pancake, but he will not make the play or he's going to have a tough time making the play because our body is between ball carrier and defender. And that's what we're looking for. OK, here at the top. Same thing. Watch the angle right off the bat. Right. He's not he's not running at him. A lot of times you'll see this. Right. A lot of times you'll see fast forward. You see this guy go here and this guy breaks off and then he, he goes to cut like this. And this dude has beat him to the spot. And it's just a wrap now. OK, we want to ensure that doesn't happen. So I'm going to set up here. Now we say ABC, always be closing. So obviously it's a lot of distance here, but I'm under control. I can continue. Right. I can continue just like he's doing here. You can do it a little bit more, but I can continue to eat up that cushion to get him further down the field. But I'm going to keep eating up that cushion. I'm going to set up and then here he goes. He's got to pick away and now I can engage. I'd like to see his hands a little bit further inside. Um, but you know what? It'll it'll he'll get better at it as he progresses. This is a freshman, okay? So he's still learning his own. He's still getting stronger, okay? And we'll continue to just get better that way. Nice pancake there. Okay. See, like he now look here on the bottom, a little bit different, right? He's starting to work on the angle, but then kind of slows up. And now we're engaging. Okay, that's fine. He ends up taking himself out to play. We could have just made our jobs a lot easier. Okay, up top, okay, angle, takes the angle inside, sets up. Here's a perfect example of, of why this is so important. All we have to do is get between defender and ball carrier. That's it. Doesn't have to be crazy. Doesn't have to be a pancake. None of that. All right. This is what we this is what we need. We just get enough hands on them to help spring this run. Okay. So just in that little piece right there that he got, just in that that little bit, okay, a little bit right there, we were able to get six more yards, seven more yards. That's it. Doesn't have to be anything crazy, y'all. Doesn't. All right. All right. At the bottom, here's an example of working a release to set up. All right. So like I was telling you before, right, we have we have our releases where we work on that um, as part of our every days and angling. It just it just allows us to. Um, you know, work some different stuff and it comes in handy. Like you're going to see it comes in handy right here. All right. He works a hard single to the outside, gets the dude to lunge. Okay. And now sets up. And this is the position you want to be in, right? Here it is, right? That basketball defense. Okay. Hip sunk. And now I'm good to go. Okay. <clears throat> gets a little bit lungy here at the end. All right. I'm not mad at that. Like I'm always cool with these guys. You know, you want to be aggressive. You want to be physical. That's fine. We don't want to be super out of control, but once in a while you want to look to, to, to deliver a shot. All right. That's cool. We got to do a better job staying on that and keeping our body in position. All right. But, but this is a good example. Now, in theory, in theory, right, that play, that play is going to the opposite side. What I would really like them to do is get here and cut this guy off. OK, but uh, I, I threw this clip in because it showed our release to the angle, which was nice. All right. OK, so next we got uh, contested catches. All right. So once again, we have to be able to make those contested catches. We got to be able to make catches in traffic. We have to be able to take the ball away from defenders in air. We have to do all those good things. OK. All right. Here's a, a, a clip of Justin Jefferson from a couple seasons ago. I mean, I know he, he obviously has the sixth sense and he's you know, clearly he knows the defenders with him. All right. But. Nothing matters. Nothing matters except the football. OK, he knows he's got to He knows he's got to make a contested catch, but his focus is so laser that everything else. All right. Everything else matters except for that defender. He's going to do what he's got to do to keep that separation and fend them off. But at the end, at the very end, at the end of the day, we got to come down with this ball. All right. He does a pretty good job high pointing it right. Gets in the hand, and then here's the defender. And now what we're going to do is execute a pullback, and that's just kind of get our body away just so that defender can't rake at the ball, all right, and then he's got to come down with it. But this is a great clip of him doing that, all right, with the defender. You're going to have to make – you want to be an elite-level receiver, okay, wherever you're at, high school, college, 
doesn't matter. All right, you got to be able to make these grabs, plain and simple. Okay, we cannot, you know, it, it can't always come down to, um, you know, you're only making catches when you're open. No, that's not that's not how we make our money. That's not how we make our money. Okay, first one we're going to talk about is this pedal pull, uh, pedal drop or a pedal uh, to a pullback. Okay, I um, got this from Coach Marion as well, and uh, just a just an a way to, to work this pullback and work uh, attacking the ball in the air. Sometimes, you know, receivers will get into that, that little pedal, especially down in the goal line. They may be running a fade. All right. And they kind of get around the defender and that ball's coming and they just, it just happens naturally. You transition to a pedal. All right. And this is what we work. So it's a high pedal. All right. Our job is to high point the football. Got this from coach Bowman elbows above the eyes. So I used to tell guys, man, you know, and we all said, Hey, you want to high point the ball, man, get your hands up. Well, dudes are sitting there like this because my hands are up. All right. I want to ensure there had to have been something to say to ensure that we are high pointing. When you say elbows above the eyes, you're absolutely going to get that full extension. And that's what we're looking for. And then violently pull back. All right. We want to force the defender out to play through the body. A pullback um, is whichever side the ball is taking you. And we always talk about obeying the football. So that ball is up here. I'm here and I'm ripping this way. If that ball is on this side. I'm catching it and ripping the other way. And I'm doing it violently because if that dude does get a piece of my arm or something, I'm going to rip through it and be able to um, break that contact and come down with the football. All right. Here's a couple examples, right? Here. Great job, right? Elbows above the eyes. Good. All right. Now we're going to, now we're going to, Snatch it, all right, and then pull away from the defender, just like that. Now I want to see him be a little bit more controlled with the ball, right? It's kind of slipping out a little bit, but you know that's the idea. Um, I'd, I'd also say I want him, I want him to stay a little bit more square. The reason is is because when we start turning our body in air, we're easier to push. So I want to make sure that we're firm and square, all right, and, and and honestly attacking through the ball, which is something that we've been working on a lot more. Okay. Uh, here's an example here. Um, once again, this freshman, and I'll go to this. I'll go to this other clip in a second. But you're gonna see pretty good ball, right? Um, you're gonna see at the other angle, it's a little bit better. But you can tell his arms are down. He doesn't pull back, and the football comes out. That's freshman on freshman crime right there. Okay. Here you go again. Watch the clip. All right. Ball is up. Doesn't doesn't extend the elbows above the eyes. So now we're catching the ball here as opposed to catching the ball here. All right. The sooner I can get the ball in my hands, the sooner I can put it away. That makes sense. Right. So I have to now wait for the football. So while I'm waiting, he's gaining a little bit more ground. OK, now we catch it here. This is what we don't want. We don't want the defender. We don't want his hands or any part of his body to have an opportunity to play through the ball. And right now we're absolutely doing that. If he had caught it here and pulled back right now as the ball is secured, now this dude is having to play through his back, and it's a catch. I don't care what it is. But as you see, he didn't. Okay? So here comes the defender, punches right through the hands, all right, and gets it out. It's a great play by him. Great play by him. But we're getting better. We've learned our lesson, and we're going to continue to improve. Okay? All right, here's Ruggs. Maybe this is Ruggs here. Okay, we're going to go up and get, oops, sorry. Okay, we're going to go up and get this football. I like this clip because obviously it shows a really good um, execution of, of the pullback. You know, it's good, pretty good elbows above the eyes, but watch him start. Right when that ball hits his hands, look how he starts to turn his body. See how his body's starting to rotate? Because here comes the hand. But now this is what you want to see, all right? You want to see defender to our back. Okay, we want to we call it taking the air out the ball. I want to pull that ball into myself, okay, to ensure that it's not out here and he can rake my arm. These long when my arms are extended, right? Obviously, it's it's more of a uh, more of more of something to pull on and grab on. So if I take the air out, I'm harder to uh, it's, the ball's gonna be harder to lodge out. And you add that with the pullback, and it's super difficult, super super difficult. But another great picture, right? Catch rotation. Love this view right here. You can really see it. Pull back. Rotation. Good to go. Okay. And he did a great job of obeying the football. Okay. It's back shoulder here, back shoulder to my right. So I'm going to turn that way. Okay. Shuffle. Same thing. Just another variation. Okay. I'm shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Balls up. High point. Elbows above the eyes. Pull it in. 
Okay. Once again, I'd like to see that ball get tucked away a little bit better, but this is the idea. Catch it, tuck it away. What I do like is watch the violent tuck. He's now waiting. That ball is literally ripping. He's ripping that ball down through. Okay. And that's what you want to see. Get the ball away yesterday. That's what I tell the guys. Get the ball away yesterday. I like this clip right here, right? Elbows above the eyes. Watch the violent tuck. Okay. Same thing, right? Tuck that ball away. But there it is. Violent tuck. Okay. You're not waiting. We're not waiting. Get it away. Get it away. Okay. The JV film, one of our other freshmen. Okay. Um, I showed this clip because we're kind of getting into, we're starting to get into that right there, kind of shuffle almost get into a back pedal but does a great job of catching that ball and then tucking it away unfortunately we weren't able to pull back here but we were able to get that ball and, and secure it and come down for six all right win the line all right the key is keeping your shoulder square this is the picture you want to see and you're going to see this clip exactly what happens is a lot of times right i'm fighting for position right i'm holding my fade line and that ball goes up and what a receiver does is he starts to turn his body like this all right. So I tell the guys all the time, if I remember anything from middle school bas basketball is to tag and box. We take our forearm, we drive it in the dude's chest and then box out. So I kind of equate it to what happens here. When I turn my shoulders, all right, now I'm giving him my chest. And now that DB is going to squeeze us all the way to the track. And that can't happen. All right. So you have to hold it. You have to fight pressure with pressure. OK. And then late wing off. All right. That ball is up. You do what we've been doing, elbows above the eyes, pull back, okay? I tell them this, right? If we have our fade line, all right, and it's it's five yards from the sideline, every time you get pushed a yard, your catch probability goes down 20%. I just want to give them, um, you know, just a, a you know a, a numerical equivalent to, um, to make my point, okay? Chin tucked, right? The chin, the chin is pinned, and I should say re really chin – you know, you want to pin your chin, tuck it, whatever you want to call it. OK, but I want to keep it here so I don't have to I don't really, I don't have to look all the way back. I can just be like this. I can be running with my chin pinned. All right. Here, once that ball is up, late separation, high point, obey the ball, come down with it. OK, but you want to see this. This is what you want to see. This dude's going to be leaning on you. Right. He's going to be leaning on you. You got to make sure you're leaning back or you are going to go that way. Okay? And if you're going that way, you, you now allow the DB to put himself in phase. And that's that's what they want. That's not what we want. Moving off, high point, pull back. Okay. All right. Now we get into what I, stuff I really love. <laughs> I mean, I love all of this stuff. Don't get me wrong. But hip drop is just – it's been the game changer for us. Um, I got it from Coach Dub. I remember seeing um, – I remember seeing uh, Coach Dub do this years ago, and um, it just made so much sense. And I've adopted it to the way I coach up receivers. And honestly, it's it's like I said, it's been a game changer because at the end of the day, all right, to 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 stop, you got to put force in the ground. Like I said before, force application. Well, one, how are we applying the force? Two, how much force are we applying? All right. And to sound smart, right, I always say force equals mass times acceleration, all right? We want to be able to drop our body mass down as fast as possible to create max force, okay? I love this clip down here because you're going to see this is a, a perfect hip, executed hip drop, all right? <clears throat> Why it's so perfect is because the body language is great. Nothing changes. There's no change in, there's no change in pad level as far as um, raising up to come down or anything like that. The only time the pad levels change is when, when he gets into his drop. But everything's a fade until it's not, okay? And then we're stopping on a dime, right? <clears throat> your foot striking in front of your hip means deceleration, but you gotta do it with some force if you wanna really come to a stop. Which he does here, boom. And that's what you wanna see, right? We wanna get this DB to do this. We wanna get him to, to flip his hips and open up. And the only way we do that is by threatening, threatening with speed. And the only way we threaten with speed is when we're confident that we're able to stop. And the only way we're confident that we're able to stop is by executing violent hips. And the only way we do that is by practicing. Mastery is in the reps. This is why we do it every day until we can't get it wrong. Mm, got it. This is the close-up version. Same, same clip though. Close-up version. Look at the violence in the hips. Look at the speed of which he's attacking. 
But right now, he's threatened to take the top off the uh, top off this defense and get past his defender. So he has to, he's forced to open up his hips while he's decelerating. And now this is the separation that it creates. Okay, good job, right? Catching the football, obeying it. Ball is out here. All right, so go that way. All right, don't fight the current. Okay, like I said before, core movement, right? Change direction doesn't happen without dropping your hips. Okay, the faster you move, more violent. Uh, uh, the faster and more violent that occurs, the more force that goes into the ground. And that's what I put put here, right? Is that equation? Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, I use the car brake analogy. Like if you were driving a car and needed to st uh, stop abruptly, uh, I, you're not going to sit there on the get on, on the brake pedal, lightly tapping it and hoping to stop. <laughs> stop in a hurry. If you want to stop, person in front of you um, cuts you off, or or they or they jam on the brakes. You better jam on the brakes, and you're not stopping. Same rules apply. If I'm not driving force into the ground, I'm not going to stop. Not not effectively. Not as fast as I can. Okay. And, and this is this is like the roadmap, right? Is you know we start with our stationary drop, of the, which I'll show you. And I feel like you know an 18-yard comeback is is not something easy, right? It's it's something that's pretty difficult. Um, you, you know you're you're running full speed, you're getting down the field, and you got to be able to snap that thing off, all right, and get out of that on a hard angle break. So uh, you know I'm like, how do we get there? We have to work and progress in different steps to eventually get to that end result. Okay, starts with here, right? Step one in learning how to drop the hips violently. And I wrote, do not overcoach. And you're going to see in this video, all right, you have guys that are all different. You have some new guys, you have some young guys, you have this and that, and, and they're dropping their hips differently. Um, but, you know, especially in the beginning when I'm, when I'm coaching these guys up is I don't want to get to a point where, where if I'm overcoaching, which I used to, because you don't want to, you want to make sure you're, you're not whipping your upper half. You want to make sure your arms aren't crazy. You want to make sure that your, your, your fir, uh, feet are firmly planted. The issue is when a dude and a kid is new and he's just learning how to drop his hips, if I give him 10 different coaching points, he's now thinking about 10 different things. I need his focus to go in one box, and that's hip drop. So however it looks, I don't even care. I want you to learn how to drop your hips. We will clean up everything else after the fact but now we just have to focus on the hips okay and this is what it looks like and it's on a verbal command you want to drop get down and up as fast as you can fast as you can okay and honestly i got to the point and this is this is kind of early on um but i like this clip because you can see just kind of different body positions body you know and all that stuff but um i don't even care what they do with their hands like they don't necessarily even have to move them i just want to make sure everything stays tight okay everything stays tight and we're compact and we're just dropping our hips and getting them back up. But this is a stationary drop. The next one is the step and drop. Okay. Um, I start, I, I used to do like a lean and drop. What was happening with newer guys when they were leaning, they were hopping to it, like hopping with two feet. And I didn't like that. It's just not something that would work. Um, so we do a step and drop. So it's just a way to make it just a little bit easier. It was translating a little bit better for us. So essentially, it's just like what I'm saying, like you're walking down the block, you take a step, and now the second step, you're driving your hip and all that force into the ground, okay? In this clip, you'll see them do it with a, a slight progression where they run out. It's just to throw a little another element in there. But snap, you want to hold it. You say gymnastics floor routine. You get max points for sticking the landing. And the reason is, all right, you know, we always talk about entering the break and we talk about exiting the break. Well, the exit to your break is a lot of times is going to depend on what you do in the break. Are you balanced? Is your body in the right position? If you're off balance, your exit is not going to be as efficient. All right. So I always make sure they hold it. Right. We're having a good job snapping. Snap. Okay. You can see them like get the foot out, snap, hold. And now now they're doing a variation where they drive out. Okay. And when you and when you drive out, you know, you want to see. This, this foot firmly planted so you can really maximize all right the force of uh, the force of your exit it's like a pitcher being in the stretch like if the pitcher didn't pitch off his his flat foot the, the velocity is not going to be the best because he's not he doesn't have all that driving force okay so if we're if our heel is spinning like with this kid right here see his heel is spinning that means he didn't drive off that foot fully okay here firm plant and now I can really drive off and get there but that's what you want to see. You want to see good snap. You want to see good snap. All right, and go. Not the best of some of these guys, but, you know, once again, we improve every day. 
Okay, and then up and back, it's just we're adding a little bit more forward momentum. Same rules apply. I want to snap and hold. You know, watch. You know, watch him up here. Right, he's going into it. Snap and hold. Come back out. Snap and hold. Come back out. Okay, just a little bit more forward momentum. Um, we'll go left, right. We'll go right, left, just so they have a, a frame of reference. When we start to run down the line, we we kind of get out of out of the whole steps thing or or the sequence. This is just another variation of up and back. All right, but we want to get to them, get them to a point where they're they're pivoting, right? They're they're really getting their bodies turned. All right, and that's what's going on here. All right, because when you're breaking, especially on those hard angles, those curls, those comebacks, you want to turn into the break so we can get out faster. We don't want to just plant at the last step and now have to throw my body all the way out. So this just this just helps us learn how to turn and snap. And that's all we're doing. Okay, and then it'll you know you can kind of come down the line, turn. Hold, right? Reset again. Reset again. Down the line. Okay. Now come out of it. Solution. Okay. And then down the line, we just want to work down the line. Literally, what it sounds like, I set up. They just have to break somewhere around me. And I tell them, you know, whether it's me, a cone, a line, a rope, all right? The, the marker is a guide. It's not a restriction. So why I say that is because everyone has different stride lengths and leg lengths. OK, if you're looking to stop on the same line as everybody else, well, somebody's going to shorten their stride at some point because because of the difference in the stride lengths and leg lengths. So I don't care. I, you know, if at the end of the day, like if you're running a 10 yard route and, you know, your stride length takes you perfectly to 10 and a half. That's all right. We'll be we'll be we'll be fine. OK, but that's what you want to see. You want to see dudes get down the line and snap. All right. Now here, when we're going full speed, we just want to snap our hips down. However that looks as far as like, as far as like, you know, your steps, your feet is, is whatever. OK, we just want to snap. Remember, once again, it's about it's about the, the snap of the hips. OK. All right. And then another another picture of down the line. Um, and this one is, is the same guy. You're going to see him. And it's just different body language here. OK, sorry, it's it's where I'm showing you the angles of, of the body language so you can see it. So it's going to see be at different angles, but you can kind of see towards the end. Right. We want our body language to say the same right here. It starts to change a little bit. All right. And I know it's nitpicky, but, you know, like I tell the dudes all the time, like we want to be able to combat and, and compete and beat the elite level DBs. And if an elite level DB can pick up on that slight change, then that's a problem. All right, so we want to make sure we work it. The way I, the way I, um, the way I describe this is like, you know, you're driving your car, right? You're going fast, but somehow the, the car gets slapped in neutral. You're still going forward, but there's a change now, right? There's a change. You can hear it. In this case, you can see it. Okay, same thing, right? Different angle. All right, what we want to do is avoid any change in stride length, right? Right there, he kind of, he always, you know, we've been working through this, but that little short step that set himself up, we look to eliminate that. And we've do, been doing a better job because once again, you know, an elite level defender may be able to pick up on that. And that's not what we want. But nonetheless, good drop, right? Good snap, okay? Comes to balance. He's, if he was breaking, if he was coming out of there, he'd have been fine because he's, he's balanced, okay? Another view, you'll see that little short little hitch step. OK, but look at the snap of the hips. Snap. All right. I stay up. And this is just going straight down the line to get the ball. But you see, man, it's just snap. That's what you want to see. OK. All right. Now he's coming out of it. Boom. All right. And watch how he breaks. When he breaks, OK, he's turning as he's breaking. So now he can get out of there and run out of the break a lot more a lot better and a lot more efficient okay if he waits till the end to plant and pivot he's now having to drag his whole body from facing forward to going back turn into the break and run out same thing turn right that's where he's breaking and he's turning and watch how fast he can get out now that's what we're looking for turn get out clean Right there, right? Turn into the break. Snap, turn. 
right? Got to catch the ball, but good break. All right, get out of there. Just stop it right there. Okay, and now just the you know just some clips in in game. All right, this is our freshman down here at the bottom. You're gonna be able to see. Okay, he's gonna run right and drop his hips. Okay, it's a good job of just dropping the hips, snapping it violently, and then I love this right here, obeying the football. Okay, here comes the defender. He he turns quick. We don't want to waste time. Get a field. All right, and that led to you know ten more yards. He's not waiting, right? You can feel the defender. You know he's, you know he was, he was set up uh, inside leverage, so you know that's where that's where he's coming from. So you're gonna spin opposite. Ball was placed pretty well, but it's all about the snap of the hips, right here. Get upfield. Okay, down here at the bottom, he doesn't get the ball, but you'll see. Boom. I mean, that's real quick with the hips. Pop. All right. Dub says flinch, right? Coach Dub will say, you know, flinch with your hips. Like, you ever be play fighting and someone jumps at you and quickly flinch? Like, that's what your hips got to do, okay? Up top, right, even though the ball is getting to him, hip drop isn't great, all right? But, you know, he still has some separation. But, you know, you want to you wanna see that snap. You want to see that quick snap right here. Okay, and here, same thing, right? Watch how he gets a defender to come up. Now this – now it's it's coupling two things. We have our hip drop here and we have our contested catch. Ball is not great. Ball is thrown too far inside. This is pick, this is pick six written all over it. All right. But we're physical to the catch point. But watch this. Runs with speed. Now, right here, you can see his body language changed. So we, we gotta fix that. It's like he's in neutral, but snaps the hips. He's getting more separation here. And look at that ball inside. But now we just gotta be a tough grabber and go and get that ball. Should have been picked. Snap. Okay, ball, give me that, get a field, and do what you got to do. That's on a, a third and 15. Okay, so that was, a, that was a big play for us. Okay, <clears throat> and here this is just a clip from uh, this past season when, with Dotson. As you see, right, he's, he's everything's a fade until it's not. He is sprinting up the field, right, to get – the DB to flip his hips. This is what you want. And now we just got to win. Now we got to be able to stop. Because remember, at the end of the day, he doesn't know when we're stopping. We know when we're stopping. Okay. So we just got to get him to commit up field. Once we do that, we're good to go. All right. And this is what happens. He's breaking while the while the DB is still running. All right. You're going to see the violent break. Right. The foot is striking in front of the hip to cause deceleration. All right. Working a little throw by. And now catch the football and obey it. All right, it goes outside, so go outside. Okay, uh, this is one of the kids I work with. All right, UMass. All right, you're gonna see, boom, all right, snap. But look, look what he's doing, right? He's getting this dude to fly up field, fly up field. All right, that's what you want. That's what you want. Snap the hips. Okay, this is a great job, great job. Violent hips. All right, so this is a really good player right here. Snap. Ball. That's what we want, okay? And everything's a fade till it's not. Plain and simple, right? We want to make everything look the same, all right, until we snap it off. And the only way we, we become confident in snapping it off is by working on our hip drop. We know that we don't have to slow down to stop. We know that we can run at high levels of speed and stop because we're going to drop our hips violently. I think that's it. This is my contact information, guys. All right. Um, my Twitter's on there. That's my cell. Um, that's also my email. If you ever want to contact me for whatever reason, you want to talk to ball, um, whatever, I'm um, here to help. Receiver play, offense, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm always down to talk football. I, mean, I think we're all in the same boat, right? We just love talking ball. We love um, interacting with coaches. We love learning and growing and getting better. Um, and I chose this picture because, you know, it's – I mean, we're, we're blessed to do – something so great right like we're, we're coaching football there's literally nothing better and if you're not having fun doing it then i, I just don't know what to tell you <laughs> so um yeah please guys if you, if you have any questions or you want you want to reach out that's my contact information and uh i just want to thank uh i want to thank coach for allowing me to come on here and and spend some time with you guys and hopefully i was able to offer up some some bit of information that you could take back with your programs and um yeah i had a blast and once again coach thanks you thank you for the opportunity this is one of the most thorough wide receiver talks i've ever heard 
Clyde Christensen when he went to UNC and gave a talk. That's that, that's about the only one I remember that's as thorough as yours, Coach. Appreciate it. I that. loved it, man. Appreciate I loved that. it, man. And no, blocking, really, that means a lot. It means a lot. You actually believe in wide receivers blocking. Absolutely. And, and you know what? And you know what's crazy? And, and I know I butt I know I butt heads. I butt <laughs> heads with <laughs> I butt heads with some coaches sometimes because you know, and, and I understand the mentality. You know, you, you say you have a real like a stud out there. And, you know, he's just kind of like kind of lazy out there or whatever during the run. But, I mean, he's going to go up and get the ball and do this. But my thing is, once again, going back to Coach Marion's um, Coach Marion's quote, right, is what you do without the football determines how much you love your teammates. And for me, it's like this. Blocking is, is the majority is, is effort and attitude. If you can't get out there and give effort and have, a, and have an, uh, an attitude that you, you refuse to lose, then I, I just don't know what to tell you. I, I, think, that's, I think that's easy. I think that's easy. Um, I, I, you know, everybody can do that. So that's why for me, I'm always like, I don't care who it is. They can get out there and block. You can give effort and you can refuse to lose, plain and simple. I don't got to teach you, Jack, about technique or nothing. If you go out there, you're good to go. Uh, Coach, Coach G, can you put your email? Um, just put it in the comments. Oh, comments. Yes, sir. Yeah, put it in the comments and I'll show it up there. But how? How said thank you, man. He was yeah, very, no, very we, impressed. Appreciate that, Coach. Yeah, appreciate that. I know, um, you know, I could, I could talk about this stuff all day long. You know, I know I, I wanted to get make sure I got everything in within that that 45 minutes. But um, if anybody wanted to talk further and kind of dive into some stuff, then we certainly can. But, yeah, that's my email right there. Please use that. Like, my cell is the best way to contact me or Twitter. Uh, but I'd love to chop it up with any of you guys. And and uh, this is a lot of fun. I Like I said, I could talk about this stuff all day long. And for you to say that, Coach, um, you know, I, that's high praise. So I really, that really, really means a lot to me. Yeah, man. Well, I want to get you on the podcast. Yeah, love to. Um, love yeah, to. We'll get you on there. Um, if you have to. another presentation, what else? Do you, I mean, you said you've done 200, what, 350? Yeah. So, like, man. And, and, that's, and that's doing, and that's um, getting, that, that's me hosting. Like getting oh, all these okay, right coaches. Yeah, yeah. Getting oh, all these I was like, coaches on. Yeah, no, nah, not me. Not me. I don't got that much to talk about, but uh just different coaches, you know. Um, but as far as I as far as for me, like I do, you know, I, I could do a, I do a recruiting presentation. We can talk different aspects of receiver play as far as you know, releases, or I can, you know, I can dive into blocking really uh <laughs> really deep. Um, or just whatever. I mean, you just let me know. But I, I'd love to come on in uh, the podcast and chop it That'd up. That'd be great. Sure. Yeah, it'll be yeah, fun. Appreciate you, Coach. Yeah, man. Have a absolutely. Great weekend, brother. Yeah, you as well. You as well. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, y'all. We're uh we're waiting. How we'll be go coming on at four o'clock with Coach Speck from St. X in Cincinnati. That's where Coach McNally used to be a coach, Cincinnati. They got some great high school football in the state of Ohio, especially in Cincinnati. Hal, thank you for uh, coming on. I'm going to jump off here. I'll be back on when Coach Speck gets on. We got two more, Coach Speck and we got Dub. And then in the morning, we got um, Coach Galesh. All right, y'all, stay tuned in. We'll be right back. Yeah, the the replays will be um, just like you um, signed in uh, signed in on this with that same link. But I don't think it uh, I don't think it's able to be replayed until I end the broadcast. And I didn't want to end the broadcast because I'd have to make a whole new link. Um, but I'll edit them and everything like that for y'all.
Hey, Coach. Hey, Troy. How are you? I'm doing good. We're, we're live right now, Coach. Um, I just kept the, the live stream going the whole day because I didn't want to end the broadcast and end up messing all the links up. Uh, but if you want to present anything, Coach, I can walk you through uh, that. Yeah, I'm going to be presenting. Uh, it's all PowerPoint. So if, if you press we'll, present down at the bottom, yep, you, you can um, share present. screen. Yes, sir. Your whole screen or the window or the tab. Um, screen sharing. It's a bunch of, bunch of different uh, ways to do it. It's usually the, the entire screen. It's usually What's, the easiest with PowerPoint. Got it. All right. Now, I'll uh, let me see how this works out. Uh, okay. I, and, and now I just, if you pull up your PowerPoint, because I can see, I can see us right now. Okay. So when I add it to the screen, you won't be able to see us. Now I see transformational uh, coaching, coach. <clears> that's it. On the screen. Okay. So I, I'm going to take this off and we'll talk for a little bit. Then when you get going, I'm going to, um, I'm going to put it up there for you, coach. I just add to the stream and then people are sick of looking at my face. So I'm going to take <laughs> my face off here. I've been, I've been on since 10 a.m. Coach, <laughs> I, I, you're from Cincinnati, right, coach? I am. I am. Cincinnati, born and raised, been here ever since. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up some names to you. I, I had Tom McDaniels on here. Classic. He yeah. actually, Tom beat us in the state championship game back in 1998. Wow. And <laughs> was Josh the quarterback? He was. Okay, yes, yeah. He was. He, he's the only guy that I could not get on this. He did not have a camera. Um, he couldn't get his smartphone to work. So I actually recorded it from my webcam, and I was just recording him on FaceTime, Coach. So, oh, wow. yeah, and then it ended with, hey, this is Josh calling me. I got to take this. So oh. It was like about two hours. And then Bob Wiley had Bob Wiley on. He he broke the all time record over five hours. Wow! Um, Hold on, five. what did he talk on? Just O line play. Uh, we we finally got to some O line play after about four <laughs> hours and thirty minutes. We coach we I got cussed out by Coach McNally at about the fifty minute mark, which is a highlight. I mean, it is one of the funniest videos you'll ever see. He got <laughs> mad because my buddy paid on cameo $59 to Dick LeBeau for Dick LeBeau to make a message for coach McNally and coach <laughs> McNally got so mad because he said Dick LeBeau basically was greasing him up saying he changed his DB technique because of him. He said he was giving him a eulogy that you would give George Washington or general general MacArthur. He, he I'll have to send you the link, Coach. Oh, wow. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I got Jim McNally on Twitter, Coach. That's oh, my... that is, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's the highlight of my career. I said, anybody can coach Anthony Munoz. I said, but <laughs> to get you on Twitter, it took me an hour to change two pictures, Coach. <laughs> and change. Oh, yeah. oh, that's great. So, you knew Jim McNally was on Twitter, right, Coach? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I was the guy that did that. Um, that's, and let's see. Yeah. I can't think anybody else from Ohio that I've got coach. So thank <laughs> you for coming on. Uh, you know, coach, you're at a legendary program and I, I'm from Virginia and we have a tremendous amount of respect, uh, for Ohio. So if you could just tell the guys watching or the guys that will watch a little, little bit about yourself, coach, and you know, this topic right here is something I would like for you to come on the, uh, the podcast and to share, not just for the people that paid for the clinic, uh, but for all coaches, because this is something that um, is it, it's important. So, Coach, please introduce yourself to the, the clinic, and thank you for coming on. No, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for the kind words. A uh, little bit about myself. I was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. I graduated from St. Xavier High School in the 80s, and obviously came back to my alma mater. I've been been the head coach at St. X going on 20 plus years. I've been in this profession now. This will be my 35th, 35th year. And I've had an incredible journey. Was able to meet some great people along the way. 
coached some great kids along the way. And, you know, I, I think that in coaching, we all try desperately to impact lives. But I, I really believe that our lives are impacted by the young people that that we we coach and we we try to teach. I think they teach us an awful lot every single day. So I've been very blessed in my career. Uh, I like to think that as a coach, we can measure our success not by wins and losses, but you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the road to see where these young people are and how they're giving back to the world and how they're impacting the society in which they live in a positive way. To, I think that's how we measure our success. Uh, and that's really why I, I chose the topic that, that you see on the screen. I think in today's day and age of coaching, you know, we started to see, I think we started to see it with the advent of social media and we really saw it after the pandemic and the shutdowns. The mental health of, of the young people in today's world is its much more fragile than it was years and years ago. And that, at least that's my opinion. And, and I think that it's incumbent upon the coach to meet kids where they are. And one of the things that we've always prided ourselves on was trying to stay on uh, the, the cutting edge, try to stay out in front, you know, whether it was GPS tracking, cue collars for concussion, you know, awareness, whether it was analytics. We've tried to stay on the front edge, but ultimately, in my opinion, we get back to X's and O's and really developing kids and managing their mindsets and trying to be transformational in our coaching. You know, how do we how do we produce a big change in these kids? How do we improve their situations, not just on X's and O's, but but as people? Uh, you know, it's the old adage, all, all men were once boys, but not all boys become men. I think as mm. transformational coaches, I think we help produce men. Um, and that's hard. You know, coach, that's hard in today's day and age. So, you know, that's what I plan on discussing here, managing this mindset. Um, yeah, I, I added your, I added it to the screen coach and, uh, the quotes up there right now, if you could just go back to the last slide. Sure. Right there, right there, coach. You got it. Perfect. Uh, no, I appreciate that coach. So that's really, I want to talk about something we're using. There's a, there's an app. It's a new app that I've been pirating or piloting. Shouldn't say pirating. I, I still was like, great. great I, might be, I might be pi uh, pirating it, coach. I'm, I'm very capable of that. I was about to say, I, th I think any great coach is, uh, he steals pirates, more of the good ideas from people that are a hell of a lot smarter than him. And that's what I did with this full charge. But we're really trying to be proactive coach in the mental health arena. I I'm so tired. And I, I think all the guys that are tuned into this right now, they, I think they're thinking the same thing. We are so reactive in today's mm -hmm. day and age, when all of a sudden we're reacting to a, a poor student that's suicidal or we're reacting to somebody that's dealing with, you know, societal stress. And I am so tired of being reactive. This is an opportunity for us to be proactive. It's also a way for us to help work on positive mindset is really challenging kids to go above and beyond and, and focus on the positives. Yeah, coach. Uh, you know, I know you're from Cincinnati. I know coach Meyer was the head coach there at Ohio state. And he was always talking about being proactive and not reactive when it comes to discipline. So I, they've had so many great coaches there in that state, you know, Ohio state particularly. No, ironically, uh, Urban Meyer was my position coach back in 1985. He was my wow. he was the secondary coach at St. Xavier High School in Cincinnati. Very wow. few people know. I give Coach, uh, we called him Coach UB at the time, but I've given Urban uh, a hard time. <laughs> he never <laughs> includes St. Xavier on his resume. And I always said that was your first job. It might be on Wikipedia, Coach. Because <laughs> co co Coach McNally has called me the biggest name dropper of all time. <laughs> and there, I find that very hard to believe after talking to Bob Wiley for five hours, because he can name every 
coach, <laughs> where they coached, who the head coach was, who got on the job, you know, and – yeah, because Ur- Urban Meyer, coach, I'm, I brought up Coach Meyer, and he was your coach. I mean, wow. my, se- my senior year, and and I wrote a book in, I wrote a book called Fourth and Redemption. I actually sent one to PJ, um, and Urban wrote the foreword to it. So, wow, coach, it's, it's funny. I'm a big <laughs> Coach Meyer fan. I've, I've only met him twice in my life. Once at Meadowbrook High School when he was recruiting, and then we brought Morgan Moses down there to Florida. And the one thing I can say about him is when you're talking, nothing else matters in the world because he is like that, ain't he, Coach? Oh, God, yeah. Great yeah. listener and intense. Man. He's, he's the uh, the Michael Jordan. You saw that docuseries on yeah. the Bulls. And there's a quote in that series where they said, Michael Jordan's greatest gift was that he was always completely present. Mm. And you, when you say that about Urban Meyer, you're absolutely right. That guy was able to lock in. You know, whether you like, love him, you hate him, he's a polarizing figure on many yeah. parts. I love him. He I reminds mean, me of myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's I mean, a great yeah, point. Yeah. I mean, I, I, he, he, I remember when he, he said, I know you from somewhere. And I was like, yeah, coach, I you sat right in my, right in my room. I mean, he, he'll remember you one time, man. I mean. Wow. <laughs> so funny. But yeah, he was. He was able to completely lock in. And that's another thing. I don't think kids today are able to focus and be completely present in, in the task at hand, regardless of what it is. So that's, you know, I think we're all fighting the same battles. And, you know, that's why, Coach, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, just just what we're trying to do and what um, – you know, how we focus on on managing this mindset and being transformational in the lives of these kids. All right. Should I just move on, Coach? Yeah, Coach, you're good. Okay. Yeah, good. No, I'm just, I'm just going to sit here and watch, Coach. I'm not – because this – I like this stuff. Well, good deal. I, I'm just going to throw a couple – of quotes up on on the screen here so that everybody can see it. I think the biggest point, I, and I don't like to insult anybody's intelligence by simply reading quotes, but I think the most important issue for a transformational coach is really to inspire kids to understand why we do th- why they do things, the purpose, living a purpose filled life and the why behind all of their actions. I think that's what great coaches do is not only explain that this is what we're going to do, but more so this is why we're going to do it. And this is why your actions are so important to everything that we're trying to accomplish, whether it be the success of any given play or what we need to do when we're giving back to the society at large through community service or whatever we choose to get involved in. So very important things. And we like to focus on this question for our kids. Uh, You know, the, I have two definitions for a purpose, a noun and a verb, but the reality is I'm not worried about why something exists as much as I am. The verb is what is the intention or the goal for yourself is really, what do you want to be? What do you want to accomplish? And I think by the end of this talk, you'll have a better understanding of that intention. You have a goal for yourself, but there's also a much a, a bigger, a bigger goal, a more macro approach is how that goal for yourself impacts the team. So we want to challenge even the coaches out there that are that are tuning into this is to focus on what the purpose is every day that they get up and why, why they do what they do. And I don't know that when I was, you know, I'm 50, I'm pushing up towards 60 now. I don't think I look at the world nearly the same as I did when I was a young coach at 23 or a head coach in the, at 30. I look at life uh, totally different. I wish I would have seen things from a, a more macro scale on what my purpose was in coaching, because if it's just about wins and losses, we're, we're missing the boat. I think our, our purpose has to be centered on making a situation better um, all the time. Not some of the time, but all the time. And we have a choice every single day 
as to how we we, we guide our principled life for, to achieve that purpose. You know, the motive. I love talking about motive. Um, when, and it, whether you're a co- professional coach, college coach, high school coach, it's the why. Why are you doing this? And, and I'm an old English major, so I'm going to bore all, all of our listeners or watchers here to tears with a little. I'm a big I love the classics and I love to compare Homer's Achilles with Homer's or with Virgil's Aeneas. They were they were just epic heroes. They were both physically gifted. Uh, they were both just incredibly good looking, strong, ver- virile they were wonderful in battle. They were great fighters. They were tremendous leaders. They had they suffered the rages of the gods. You know, they had to fight these, uh, you know, the the not the rages of the gods, but they had to to fight everything those gods would throw at them. As far as these these unbelievable you know, animals, what whatever, and they they both they both really taught you know, both really focused on great things. The difference, the fundamental difference between the two was that Homer's Achilles, his character is what they make movies about. They they get the best looking actors, Brad Pitt embodied Achilles. Um, but really Homer's Achilles, his hero was created simply for personal self-glorification. Uh, glorif- an, an, an ambitious drive for self-glorification. It's almost like when you see these these touchdown dances and the guys that are posing in front of the TV, all of a sudden we shift from the team focus to the individual focus. And that was really what Homer created with Achilles. He's a great, just an gr- incredible epic hero who won incredible battles uh, but Virgil was a little bit different. His his character was completely centered on team. You know, he was human. I think in the beginning of the book or the epic poem, Virgil, you know, he's out at sea and there's this incredible storm and he thinks he's going to lose all of his men and they're going to perish. And he starts to wonder, why did I leave my family and my wife at home? You know, what's my purpose, so to speak? But he gathers himself. He understands that his his commitment is to others, to his men. And he has to be a man for others. And ironically, Achilles dies a miserable death. You've, we've all heard the Achilles heel. Well, he and his men perish in a battle because Achilles wanted self-glorification. He wanted his name to be remembered in battle. Virgil, on uh, Aeneas, on the other hand, founds Rome, Right. So, so it's almost this, this conflict of, yes, we all have an ego and we all want to be successful, but do we want to do it for others? Do we want the team to be successful as opposed to the individual? You know, how many five, does it matter how many five-star guys you have <laughs> if the team can't succeed? So that, that's my boring lecture on, on the epic- no, coach is not boring because I this is what I actually like. I want uh, Odysseus is who I like, coach, because he, you know he, he was cocky, but he found out that um man is nothing without the gods or God, you know, and then he said that uh life is all about the journey. So, yes, I mean, I'm I like Odysseus, coach, but I know I, I Virgil probably just copy they all copied each other. <laughs> I mean, and, like you said, we steal Virgil just copied Homer. Yep, he was listening to the the sirens calling him to the shore, Coach. You, you know, for an old English major like me, I love that stuff. But um, no, you get it. You know, I, I think we all get it. But I think it's important to remember that you know, servant leadership is a is a head football coach, is an assistant coach. Our job is to help transform these young people, these young men that we're coaching, uh, into a warrior hero. That's that's really going to. Focus on mission and purpose and influence people for the world for the rest of time for centuries to come. I think that's our greatest legacy. So, so I want to focus on on that. I also want our listeners to to think about what their personal brand is. And I love show, throwing this slide up. I do it with my parents every year, my freshman parents, and I always ask them, you know, you're going to think when I. When I start flashing pictures of people across here, something's going to come to mind. 
And as you watch this, every single picture you see is going to evoke some kind of emotional response. It could be positive. It could be negative. It could be inspiring. It could be disgust. There, there's a lot of different emotions that come about when you watch these, these pictures flash across the screen. And it doesn't matter if it's a historical figure or as you see some of the great quarterbacks and great coaches of today's game, every single one of these pictures evokes a response. And the reality and the fact of the matter is every one of us evokes a response. You do, coach. I do. The, our players do. And the question remains, what do we want that response to be? What do we want to evoke in people? And I challenge our kids to, to think about this as they're building their brand as they go through life. And especially with social media, this branding is a big deal for kids. And I don't care if you're Nick Saban. I don't care if you're if you're Steve Specht. It doesn't really matter who you are. Your brand matters. Um, and it matters a lot. So, so we challenge the kids. Think about your personal brand. But then at the same time, we want, to, want them to think long and hard about the team brand. And I don't care what the team brand is. As you can see, Amazon, Google, all of these brands matter. They're all incredibly successful in some way, shape, or form. But as, as I try to remind the kids, it doesn't matter what logo you have on your, on your shirt. It doesn't matter what you know logo you have on your hat or what hat you're wearing. For my purposes, I look at, I look at the screen in front. That, that's our team brand. I've got 110 plus kids that are supposed to represent St. Xavier High School and Steve Specht in a positive way. So we have to collect all these individual brands, teach them to have a purpose. They have to mold that purpose into something that is going to help the team. And really that comes back to our initial conversation about transformational coaching, managing the mindset, building a brand, and being proactive in how we're dealing with that. So, so Coach, one of, one of my favorite quotes, and I think we've all used this in some way, shape, or form with our coaching staff, is uh, Teddy Roosevelt's quote, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, and that's, that's huge for us. And, and in the Jesuit, St. Xavier High School is a Jesuit school, Jesuit philosophy, Jesuit Catholic religion. We talk about cura personalis, which is Latin for care of the individual. And this is where it starts with us is how much do these kids know that you care about them? You know, how much do they honestly know? And, and this is where the mental health of the student athlete comes into place. And this is how we measure the mindset and, and, pre, and push the kids. And our mission is really to build the strongest mindset possible. And if you can do that with every individual – Ultimately, you, you build a team that's going to run itself. And I, I tell the teams every single year, we have a different team, obviously, and different set of kids. Kids graduated, young kids come up. But I've always said, if, if it's my team, we're not going to be very good um, because I'll have to police it. But if it's your team, you'll police it, and we have a chance to do special things. And as I look back on my career, whether it was a state championship year, whether it was a runner-up year, the uh, whether it was a conference championship, the great teams, the really good teams, they run themselves. Um, and, and one thing, Full Charge is the app that we've been using that I talked about earlier, and I highly recommend this. Uh, Derek Smith is is the guy that runs Full Charge, and he's he's different. He's uh, he's really helped me with this piece of the puzzle. I highly recommend anybody listening to this that if you really want to look into being proactive on the mental health front, help measuring these kids' mindsets. I'll talk a little bit about it now. 
But the full charge app is what we focus on. And it's a mind, body, and spirit approach. We look at six basic categories, everything from social stress to academic stress, to fatigue levels, to physical soreness, to nutrition and sleep. And we survey our kids on Sundays and Wednesdays in these categories. And the, the, the surveys are pretty simple. As you see on the screen here, we go from a five-star standard, five being the best possible and one being the worst possible. And when these kids take the survey, if they're incredibly fatigued and they're struggling to accomplish simple tasks or having trouble concentrating in class, they'll mark a one. They mark a one, it comes up in red immediately in the response category, and red means stop, right? If they mark a two, they're struggling. They're, they're not at risk, but they're really struggling. It'll come up in yellow, caution. You know, it's like a red light, green light, yellow light deal. If they're a three, four, or five, it's going to come up in green, go. And, and we're, we want kids to be threes, coach, but – the same time, we're trying to manage this, and and we take the fours and couple them with the threes, and try to teach those threes how to get to a four level, and, and monitor this, and and try to help guide the kids in season and off season. So that's just a general idea of of how we're trying to stay ahead of this from from a graph standpoint. So again, ones uh, got off a of worst and five's the best. So in full charge, you'll notice that there's a, a in red, it's going to have a self-assessment category on Wednesdays or Sundays. And when the kids click on this self-assessment, did you did that just go to a uh, screen coach? Yes, sir. I got a calendar up there. Perfect. So if I look at what my kids see, and I log in here, if they click on self-assessment and take this survey, you know, we want to know what their weight is. They'll put in their weight and then they're just going to click on. It's as simple as, OK, fatigue level, physical soreness. I'm sleeping pretty well. My academic stress, I failed a class. I'm struggling. They, it's, it's that simple. They, they go ahead and take it. They click finish. That's how simple it is, uh, is for the kids. And once they finish it, it'll take them back to a general screen uh, that tells us everything's good to go. And as a coach, then all I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. Let me see here. Let me find, sorry about that. Let me find where I am on my screen. Here we go. You got my uh, PowerPoint again. Yes, sir. I got the, ca the calendar with the arrow with the red circle in the middle. Perfect. So all the kids take this survey, and these are the kind of results I get. I blocked out their names, obviously, to keep them keep it private. But all I'm looking for from a staff standpoint are yellows and reds. I'm good with the guys that are in green. I'm going to take my fours here in personal life stress and couple them with threes and and have those guys talk to the threes about why they feel their fours, trying to increase that mindset, help the mindset. But all the yellow twos, the position coach is going to reach out to his guys and talk about what are you fatigued, what are you feeling. We're going to check with the, our, our, our training staff. Athletic trainers are going to get involved with the kids that are marking twos or ones in, in fatigue or physical soreness, uh, physical uh, life stress, academic stress. We're going to get their team involved, whether it's their guidance counselor, whether it's a school psychologist. But we're able to gauge where these kids are twice a week. Now, you can imagine, I want you to think, Coach, how, how you would change your perspective as a coach if you see during the season a boatload of twos in fatigue and physical soreness? How would you adjust your practice schedule to make sure your kids that are, are at optimal performance level on Friday evenings? This has been really good for me. We tried to do it with the GPS tracking, but the GPS tracking didn't account for the levels of you know, I, my son, who was a little five foot seven, 150 pound 
slot receiver could run miles and miles and never be bothered. He would never be fatigued or sore, but I would have a thoroughbred six foot three wide receiver that would get fatigued real quick after running a couple of nine routes. Um, Kids are different. They metabolize differently. So this is a way for us to gauge where the kids are personally. Um, and obviously you work through things, you know, some kids don't know the difference between, between being injured and being sore, but this is a great opportunity for us to at least identify kids that are at risk and get the right people involved immediately to help them deal with things. Now I'll give you an interesting example, coach, and this is crazy, but you talk about meeting kids where they are. You see this fourth column for academic stress, right? I had a kid that marked a one for academic stress. Now, the crazy thing for us is you'll notice here we do an academic survey on Sundays as well. So our kids will take an academic survey and you'll see we have all the twos. Those are D's and ones are F's. Well, I immediately went to the academic survey to find out why this player who marked the one in academic stress, what his grades were. And I was thinking he's failing subjects. He's he's on the verge of getting kicked out. And I pull up the, his survey results on academics, like the ones you see here. He had all fives, which is an A, and one four. So he had one B yet he was marking a, a, a one, I am at risk with academic stress. I'm really struggling here. And I thought it was a mistake on his part. So I called him, asked him, I said, what's going on? You, you, you're doing great academically. You, you've got all A's and just one B. And the poor kid breaks down and he starts sobbing. And in the conversation, I find out he's got a grandfather that graduated from Harvard. His father graduated from Harvard. And that B to him was going to keep him out of Harvard. He felt so much stress and pressure to live up to that expectation that one B was it, it was the end of his his world in many ways. And, and I think, my God, when I was in high school, if I had all A's and one B, I would be tap dancing. I'd be doing backflips because I want that, that stellar of a student, right? Um, but it was very real for him. And, and we needed to intervene immediately. And we contacted his parents and his parent, his father was just beside himself. He said, I feel horrible. I never, I don't care if my son goes to Harvard. I want him to be happy. All the things we want for kids, but being proactive, we were able to get out in front of that. We were able to, to talk to the parents and something that nobody would consider an issue was a very big issue for this young person. And we were able to, to, to at least help the issue before it snowballed any further. So those are some of the things that we've been doing that have been very helpful for our program, not only just how we adjust practices, but also how we help to work with kids when they're struggling, struggling in certain areas. Now, in, in a nutshell, what has this done for us? Number one, I told you, we're, we're proactive now. We have a proactive approach to how we're dealing with these kids from all those categories. We meet them where they are, not where we want them to be, right? Uh, the third thing, our coaches are involved year-round. They're, they're not just involved in X's and O's in the summer. This is a transformational opportunity. I think some of the greatest work that my staff does is in the off season when they work with these kids on assessments, uh, helping them deal with fatigue, helping to teach them about good nutrition, how to teach them on how to develop better sleep patterns. That's when you win. I think the off season is when you win the biggest battles more so than in season. Uh, it opens lines of communication. Our kids, I had a young guy, a power five recruit whom uh, was just meticulous about what he put into his body. And he was always a four or a five in nutrition. And he ran, a, one day I saw a two in nutrition. His position coach talked to him. And two weeks later, I saw a one 
I reached out to him and find, only to find out that you know, he came from a single parent, single mom, and she had working two jobs, had lost a job and was unable to put put the all the food on the, the right kind of food on the table for him. And he came, I called him into my office. He would have never in a million years come into my office to discuss this with me, but he didn't have a problem putting it in a survey knowing I would reach out to him. That's a big, that's a big difference for a kid. The difference between being called in be, as opposed to going in and talking. So he came into me and he was telling me the story. And I, I just, I said, Cam, this is crazy. I said, we're here to help. And we always get our kids, our, our kids that are at risk, we'll get them uh, Kroger gift cards and then go out and buy, buy groceries for themselves. You know, we've got a lot of, a lot of, we ended up getting his mother connected with a, an alum that uh, got her a job and, and it all worked out and he was too embarrassed to come in and talk to us. And all it took for him was to put a one in red, knowing I'd call him in and we were able to, to help him. And as I say at the bottom, the community's involved. It takes a village. You can add as many people to each player's team. We, you know, the strength coach is on his team. The physical or athletic trainer is. His guidance counselor is. If you want to add, if he has somebody that really impacts his life in a positive way that the young man wants them involved in the survey results, we can add whomever it is team we want, and it becomes a community event. And that's been very, very successful for us and our program and what we're trying to accomplish. Now, the next phase for us is Cura Apostolica. That's Latin for care of the institution. So we have Cura Personalis. We're trying to care for these kids, but at the same time, we have to have care for the institution, care for the program. So once again, how does that individual brand impact the team brand. And this is the overall health of the program. So again, what do we do with full, the full charge app? Well, we all have our core values. Every single program that matters has that purpose that we talked about earlier, has a mission focus, and that's the core values, the beliefs that make up uh, the identity of your program, the culture of your program. And then you're going to have standards uh, that that support and defend your core values, the actions that support and defend your core values. So how do we utilize uh, the full charge app to do this? Well, here's our this is our mission statement. Develop faith, develop leadership through character, develop the concept that we are true men for others, that we are servant leaders. And that's our school's motto is men for others. And oh, we have one expectation. We want them to be champions at every facet of life. So these are our core values, coach. This is this is who we are. And this hasn't changed, I mean, ever since I've been a part of it. This is what we are. And the kids know that this is our ultimate expectation. So how do we get to this? Well, this is where leadership development comes into play. You know, the, the standards that we set for our kids have to achieve the core values. Now, I believe there are two things that impact our place in this world more than anything else. The people you meet, and crazy enough, it's the books you read. Now, for me being an old English major, the books I read, and I, I, I love to read. I am an avid reader. You, you give me a good book on leadership and I'll devour it. Uh, kids don't read as much nowadays. They said, Coach, you should you should change that to the, the TikTok videos you watch or uh, the, the books you listen to on tape or the podcasts. And, and he's right. Uh, these kids are right. There's a lot of change that needs to be made. But I think you get my point. People you meet, you know, books you read, podcasts you listen to, whatever. But what we want to do is develop a council on leadership right? That's going to help us develop standards that lead to core values. So the first thing we ask ourselves is what is the potential of the young person to be a leader? Everybody says they want to be a leader, but as you can see on the screen, one of my favorite quotes to the kids is, do you guys know why it's lonely at the, why they say it's lonely at the top? Because it's lonely at the top. Leaders have to make tough decisions that aren't always celebrated. 
especially when you're a kid. If you're a leader and you're doing the right thing and you have to point out that one of your peers is doing the wrong thing and you have to challenge that peer, that's tough. That's hard. So you have to identify, at least we want to identify kids that have potential that aren't worried about being lonely at the top. And as we build our council on leadership, I always tell kids, we need to find more of you that are willing to be lonely at the top so it's not as lonely at the top. And then you guys can challenge the guys that aren't buying in. So we're looking for potential. We're looking for purpose. Do they buy into the core values of the program ad nauseum? Are they willing to go the extra mile for the core values? Do they believe in the purpose? Number three, we try to create a curriculum. I'm a big fan of, of reading a different book every year with this council. This year, we're reading Extreme Ownership by Jocko and Lee, Jocko Willink and Lee Babin. I, I think it's wonderful. There's an accompanying workbook that the kids work with. And this is what they chose to read as their curriculum. And then a question for us, and I think this is the biggest, the biggest issue, again, being men for others, once we identify potential, we get guys in there with purpose, we have this curriculum, how do we expose that curriculum to the rest of the team? How can these guys honestly learn to lead based on potential purpose and curriculum and what we talk about? So what we'll do is identify a, a core standard that will lead to the core values and focus on that standard every month. So for the month of March, the kids identified accountability as what they wanted the rest of the team to focus on. So in, uh, again, in full charge, we go, went ahead and linked an article on accountability. So everybody on the team can go on the 1st of March, click on accountability, and it's going to pull up this leadership article on how to take ownership or responsibilities. The kids all read the article, and then for that entire week, they're going to discuss all of the things in this article. This is student-led now, Coach. This is not something I tell them they have to do. This is completely student-led. And you'll notice, uh, let me go back here. Let me go back here to the screen. The following Monday, they wanted them to watch the video, Make Your Bed, by Admiral McRaven. I think we've all watched this. I think this is one of the greatest presentations that I personally have ever heard in my life. And I didn't choose this. The kids chose this. So now we have a vehicle for the entire team to learn about accountability to read that article on how to take ownership of responsibilities, to watch this video and listen to Admiral McRaven talk about the importance of making your bed and the importance of teamwork and being accountable to one another. I don't have to teach it. I don't have to focus on it. The kids take care of that on their own. So what are we doing? We're, we're developing that individual brand, Cura Personalis, into the team brand, Cure Apostolica, which is very important to us. So what I'm going to end with, and, and then you and I can talk a little bit, coaches, I want all the coaches out there to think about the pyramid effect. I, I, I stole this or pirated it years and years ago. And if there's any young coaches out there, young head coaches or aspiring head coaches, take this to heart because I can't remember whom I stole it from but it had a huge impact. And I had a coach tell me, you know, there's a perception of team. It's a pyramid effect. And at the top of, of the team, you have mom and dad. They're going to watch their son. They're going to watch their daughter. I lived it. My kids are all grown out of the house. I, I might shoot. My daughter just gave birth to my second grandbaby uh, yesterday. So, so I'm on the back nine and I'm enjoying that. But you watch your kids. You're not really worried about much else. You want to see your, your, your son or your daughter succeed. A little bit lower on that pyramid, you have your assistant coaches. I was an assistant coach. I, I wanted my guys to do well, and we were territorial. And I remember, man, if I was coaching the secondary and all of a sudden the receiver coach wanted to take one of my guys, I was like, yo, if you're taking him, you better play him. All right? Well, well, he's a backup for you. Yeah, but he's my guy. 
you know, assistant coaches are funny. They're very territorial. I was one. I was also a coordinator, defensive coordinator. I want the offensive coordinator to run the ball and run clock and shorten the day and let's win field position and let's play great defense. And then the offensive coordinator, hell no, let's spread it five wide, throw it all over the place, run tempo. I want to score. You know, and all of a sudden at the bottom, though, you have the head coach, the strength coach, and alumni. What do we – we want to win. I don't give a damn if we score a million points or we score two points and win the game. I, I want to win. And, and really, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. It's human nature. You study human nature long enough, that is how the perception of a team comes about to play. I think the great teams – are able to flip that script and flip that pyramid and get to the essence of team. And what does that mean? You establish a shared vision. You're focused on the standards that we talked about that lead to the core values. And as we get back to it, we're developing those individual brands, Cura Personalis, that are going to create the team brand, Cura Apostolica. I think that's how you win more importantly, Coach, I think that's how you become transformational as a coach in the lives of young people that, let's face it, 99 point what percent of these kids that we coach are going to go professional in something other than football. So what can we do every single day to challenge these kids to develop an individual brand with a purpose that will impact whatever team they decide to be a part of in as many ways as we possibly can. That's that's what I think is great, great coaching. It's what I've learned through 35 years of doing this and watching the great ones coach and stealing from the great ones. And, man, I pale in comparison to the guys that I've learned from and I've studied and I watch, and so I'll tell you, there it's not. It's at every level. There are there are grade school coaches, youth coaches that I've taken great ideas from. Great high school position coaches, coordinators, head coaches, all the way up to the NFL. There are so so many great people in this profession, and so many great people that want to be a part and get involved and help one another. And I think that's what I love about our profession. I love what you're doing today, Coach. I love what PJ did getting this together. And I'm I'm very humbled that you guys allowed me to be a part of it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to uh, I think uh, try to see our stream here. So that's all I have to offer you guys today. I appreciate you giving me time, Coach uh, Taylor. I don't know if you have any questions. That was or- awesome. Coach, I thought it was awesome. I'd like for you to come back on my podcast to put it out there for everybody. Um, Because this is what, uh, you know, coaches need to hear. It's what's important. It's what wins. I mean, how successful have y'all been, Coach, at St. X? I mean, one of the winningest programs in the history of Ohio, correct? We've had a great run. We really have. We've – you know, we, we've won four state championships, big school state championships. But as we've talked, that's not that, – that, I take great pride in, in the kids that we put out there. I played golf in Houston, Texas uh, Tuesday with my starting quarterback from our first state title team in 05. And, and think about this. He is a, a pediatric, uh, pediatric cardiologist. Wow. And he's explaining what he does. And I just laughed and I thought, man, I have no idea what you do. I I can't even begin to fathom it. Um, But looking at him and and you knew, you know, you've got these players, you've coached them. You see guys every year that you can point at and say, I don't care what that cat does. He is going to be so incredibly successful in whatever walk of life he chooses and those guys feed off other guys feed off of those guys. Um, and that's where I think we really define our success. The state championships come about because we define our success in a different way. And that gets back to purpose. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate you coming on coach and we'll stay in contact. I'll get you on the podcast, but so impressed with you coach and your no. program, how you do things. 
Thanks is all mine, Thank Coach. You. And if you ever need anything or any of these coaches need anything, my my email address was on the first screen. Please reach out. Uh, I wish I wish we had secrets. We don't <laughs> take from good people and, and give back as much as you can. So you guys have a great one and, yes, and good luck with the rest of the rest of the clinic, coach. Yes, sir. Thank you, coach. Have a great one. Appreciate you.
Dub just texted me, and he'll be on in 15 minutes, y'all.
What's up, man? You hear me? Hey, how's it going, Dub? Good. Sorry, can, can you hear me? I can't. No, it's, I appreciate you doing it. Yeah. Uh, sorry I'm late. We had a, a longer practice today. We had went too long, so. That's all right, man. I appreciate you doing it. Um, I'm going to introduce you, then I'm going to get out of your way and let you go. I'll be sitting here and listening, but I think everybody's sick of looking at my face. I've been on, on here since 10 a.m. Oh, wow. <laughs> you need to go treat yourself after this to steak dinner or something. Yeah, Bob, Bob Wiley, he he did five hours uh, last Saturday. He broke the record. He's the man. So, I bet it was five the, hours old, too. Yeah, we got to football around four hours and 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we're running right now, man. But I'll just introduce you, and um, I appreciate you doing it. Yeah. So we got Dub Maddox, y'all. Thank you for everybody that's that's hung around all day. Um, you know, Dub, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, and are you you're, everything you're going to do is from that back that um that screen right there, right here. Well, that's sweet, man. Okay, yeah. right on. We got the okay, set. so. You, you, knock them out, man. Appreciate All right. you. All right, thanks for being on, guys. If you have any questions, you can just uh, hit Troy up. We'll pause and, and we'll get those answered. Uh, my name is Doug Max. I'm the offensive coordinator, assistant head coach at Union High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we're going to talk about um, how we operate our progressions with the R4 system today. And I'm going to show you some stuff with our spring ball. We're one week into it now. So I'm going to show you some of the things uh, that we're always growing through and we're struggling with early with kids. I'm going to show you how we're trying to coach those out of them. And but we got to get to the, the framework first. OK, so let's just start here and talk about the problem that we have when it comes to throwing a football, uh, particularly downfield. OK, so we have to understand the rules of engagement. And so the main thing that your quarterback and your receivers, we teach our receivers like quarterbacks, they have to understand is what are the boundaries or the limits of the game? OK, there's three fr frames that frame in the picture of how football is played in its space. It's time and talent. And you have to have a language structure and you have to have an operating system that teach your quarterback receivers how to maximize and find and create space, but how to do that within a time constraint window. And then you have to know how to manipulate your concepts to your talent level on the offense. But you also have to now also know how to read and evaluate defensive talent to know how to create those space in those windows. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm really going to going to hone in today and keep this really dialed into the time standpoint and we're really going to talk about the framework of time and how we get timing you know is if you look at any good passing football team it's all about timing and being at the right place in the right time and i'm going to talk to you about how we teach that and the first thing you have to understand is your quarterback has to have a, an understanding of the timeline that he has in front of him and that timeline changes changes based on the concept that you call it changes based on the defense of structure and the uh, anticipated weapon that they're using against you. So you have to have to know how to manipulate the timeline. So when we teach passing progressions from a day one install, we're going to operate under the five step drop back timeline. So if we were under center, this would be five step drop back concepts. If we were in gun, it would be a, st a still a like a three step or a punch three step drop timeline. And what you notice when you look at that five step intermediate pass game timeline the last step of the drop, whether he's under center and gun, is going to hit at 1.8 seconds. Okay, we call that the rhythm phase. We have to be able to throw on rhythm on the last step. Now, if you've been coaching quarterbacks or maybe you want to coach quarterbacks someday, you're working with lower level kids, the hardest thing for them to master first is the ability to throw on rhythm. So I encourage you to do that first and make sure your guys have the ability to catch through weight on the last step and distribute the ball on the last step of their drop and we can talk about some mechanical things later on how we teach that. But that is the rhythm phase. Now, if he hitches up or resets up in the pocket, four tenths of a second have expired. Now we're at 2.2 seconds in the timeline. So one reset step gives us a chance to look at another space on the field. And then if we hitch up again, we're at 2.6 seconds in the timeline window. And now we want to look and reset to another space on the field. So we want to essentially tie our feet and our eyes together to be looking at a different space, right, based on how our feet work after we establish that rhythm phase, okay? So there's really three key categories that we have to teach our quarterback. First thing he has to do is master what type of drop am I going to take on this play, right? Then he has to master pocket movement and finding windows, throwing lanes, right? Stepping up, staying, hanging tight in the pocket, 
and, and manipulating and creating space and vision for him there. And then he has to master scramble rules, making plays when everything breaks down. So we break those, those segments up into parts in spring ball, and we drill those individually, then obviously we want them to be put together in a full play. All right, so if our quarterback hits the last step of his drop and he resets twice, he has to have an alarm go off in his head that, hey, it's time to get out of the pocket now. I have to release and scramble. Here's the bad thing about seven on seven is the quarterbacks lose that innate ability. All right, and so that's the number one thing right now that I'm trying to get out of my quarterbacks. You'll see this on some film. If everything's covered, they're just stopping and hanging in the pocket, and they're taking a sack. And so you have to work those things out. So if you're taking notes of just some, some things I really have to identify early, okay, the first thing would be a throwing on rhythm, right? We have If our quarterback can't throw on rhythm on the last step, all right, and he can't, we can't get him to that point, then we need to find another guy, or we need to go wildcat or single wing. Right, because we're not going to have a very good passing game. Right, the next thing they have to be able to do is they have have to be able to work the pocket. Right, you have to incorporate drills where you got a bag and you got guys in there and they're moving in the pocket and not just staying stagnant in there after they hit the last step or their drop. Right, and then the third key thing is what I talked about is they have to make sure if everything's covered in their progression. They have to, what we call release strategies, we call them gap escapes, okay? They have to release and get out of the pocket in seven on seven. If you're doing that in scale with your team in spring ball and your quarterback stops and stands there, my guys is doing, you know, five up downs, push up something to remind him to make sure um, that we can't do that in a live fire. We've got to create space, okay? So we're operating from a three second timeline in a perfect world. That's how much time we're going to have in a perfect world. But as you know, and I know, that's not always the case. I mean, very rarely do we get past a one reset step for our line is giving up pressure. So, again, your quarterback has to be able to operate. operate. So that's the first thing that we established first is this timeline from an intermediate passing game. And I'll talk to you about some concepts here in a minute and when we use this timeline. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next um, slide here. All right. Let's talk about this. Okay. Let's talk about the next thing that we have to master with our quarterbacks. All right, the next thing that we have to master is the different drops we can take on a concept, all right? So we have five families of drops that we can utilize based on the concept that's called or based on the defensive situation that they're seeing. And so each family of drop has a definition of when and why to use it, right? And your quarterback has to understand that. The first type of drop that you're going to utilize is what we call a one-step we call it a pop drop or a sliding step drop. It depends on which side we're going to. So if I'm, I'm a right-hander throwing to the left, I'm going to work a slide step after I catch the ball. These are heavily used on RPO concepts, right? Or maybe I've got a quick now screen or something out in the perimeter. I'm just going to um, flick the ball out there, right? If I'm going to the right, okay, I might use what we call a, a rocker step and just take a one-step drop. But again, this allows me to get the ball out very quickly at 1.2 seconds, maybe 1.4, depending on the speed release of the quarterback. So, right, so that's the quickest I can get the ball out, and you have to practice those types of situations. All right, the second family of drops is the two-step drop. All right, so this we, we teach our quarterbacks left foot in front of the right foot with a staggered stance so we can move in four directions if we get a bad snap. And that set that that first step with the left foot up is going to be the first step on the drop. We're going to take what we call a punch step as we get the snap, and then we're going to set the hallway with our right step. So if we're throwing right, we're going to anchor that ankle around, and we're going to set that ankle with the hallway that we're throwing into. That's a two-step drop. That gives me a little bit more processing time to evaluate if a receiver is going to be open. So this is used heavily against man coverage when I'm throwing like a fade or a go ball to a receiver with press man, or it might be a quick slant by a single side receiver. So anytime I got any kind of single quick game matchup against man coverage, we're going to use that two-step drop. The difference between a one-step and a two-step, the difference between those tools is the two steps gives me a little bit more time to process if that receiver got collisioned off the ball or if he got open. All right. So again, I give the tools to the quarterback and then he selects which one he uses based on his intent to throw in the game. OK, now let's go to just your standard three step drop. That's the third family. OK, that's the most common drop we're going to use in shotgun with an intermediate concept like four vertical Y cross or flood. All right. We're just simply going to catch the ball and take your standard one big step, two small 
and then we're going to throw on rhythm or either reset up in the pocket. We're at about 1.6 seconds there when we do that. Okay. Um, Sometimes my quarterback will take a quick three and not cross over on that if he knows the guy that he's looking at first is open. So, again, he can adjust that crossover. Sometimes he can just take the quick three in place, or he can take one big and two small, and that's when he knows that that initial route is going to be there, and he's very confident that window is going to be open. Okay. If you need more processing time, you're going to use a punch three step. All right. So the difference between a, a three step and a punch three is they're going to catch the ball, catch the snap, they're going to take this punch step with the left foot coming back, and then they're going to go into their three-step drop, and this gives the quarterback more processing time. So if he's not sure of the coverage, maybe the defense is rotating or giving different looks, or he's not sure if his initial rhythm route is going to be open on the play, he's going to incorporate a punch step to buy more time to process if that route's going to be there or not. All right? The last step uh, that we can take in the shotgun family is what we call a punch five step. So this would be used on very deep – um, flood concepts, all right? A lot of play action concepts. So anything like uh, a drive concept, um, a deep uh, post sale concept, this gives the quarterback the most time possible, 2.2 seconds. So if you have a really slow receiver or you're running deep crossing concepts, right? This is when you use a punch five step, all right? So again, the quarterback, this is his clock, all right? The drop is his clock. And he has to know how to manipulate and bend that timeline curve to give himself the favorable uh, processing time and, and matchup time that he's looking for. All right. So once we establish those drops, we teach out in class, we'll have a drill segment. Where we'll just adjust those. I'll mix them up and we want to practice selecting different tools and getting the ball out on rhythm. Okay. On all of those five families. All right. Any questions on that? If not, when we pause, Troy, you can tell me I can go back and go more detail. All right, next thing that we'll talk about after we get established the drop timeline, the drop family for the quarterback. Okay, now we're going to get into the receiver uh, part of it. The receiver has a timeline as well, and his timelines have to match the quarterback's timeline, and so he has to be operating from the same one. So when we talk to the receivers, the first thing that we're doing is we have to understand the three categories of a receiver that he has to be able to understand on the timeline is he has to understand his stem, OK, and that's the initial exit off the line and how he's going to win leverage back against that defender. He has to master the route break. It has to have good break mechanics. And then he has to be able to know where he's going if the play breaks down, the quarterback gets flushed out. So that's the three different sections that we're going to work and, and chop up in spring and summer with our guys and make sure they master their exit and stem. They master the different breaks and then they master the ability to know their scramble rules. OK, receivers right, are running routes. There's going to be certain routes that break at 1.8 seconds. We call those rhythm routes. Right. So we're defining our route families right now. I'm going to get more detail in a minute on those. The second type of routes that can be run by receivers are read routes. Those break at 2.2 seconds. So there's more time that they have to set up the defender. And these routes are deeper down the field. OK, rush routes are hit at 2.6 seconds, they're check down routes, okay? Now I'm going to talk about some unique properties of rush routes in a minute, but as we install this from a day one, they understand that rush routes are check down routes, routes that break under five yards or less, all right? So now we've broken up the timeline into three major chunks with routes. The last phase of the receiver timeline is the release, and that's when the quarterback releases out of the pocket, and now we have to go into the scramble portion and find different levels based on whatever you teach your scramble rules to be. All right, so again, that's how we teach the receiver footwork. Now, we want to be able to match the quarterback's progression with the different breaks of routes with the receivers so he is in a position to throw the ball just before the route is breaking open. So in order to get that timing down, we have to put these routes into families and understand how they sync up. All right, so let's get to that now. The first family of routes when you're teaching quarterbacks and receivers are the rhythm route family. Okay, so let's define a rhythm route. Okay, what makes a route a rhythm route? Because here's what I want you to understand. Every route that you can draw in football will fall into one of these three families. Routes have DNA. They have space and time properties that place them in a certain space in a certain time. So we can organize those into families. And now our receivers and quarterbacks 
know when to throw that ball and know when they're going to get the ball in the space that it's supposed to occupy. So the vertical rhythm routes are what we look at first. So these are the five base vertical rhythm route families. All these are routes attack over what we call the hard deck line. And so we have a seam ball run by a slot receiver. All right. That window that that ball is going to be released at is anywhere from seven to nine yards, usually on the receiver's sixth step. Okay. It depends on the speed of the receiver where that ball is going to be released anywhere from seven to nine yards. Okay. A cross or a crash route. A crash route is the number three receiver and four vertical working to the opposite hash. A cross route is a number two receiver splitting two safeties down the middle. Right. This is also a rhythm route. These routes have to be thrown. Okay. On the last step of the drop. Okay. If you throw rhythm routes off a reset step at 2.2 seconds as a read route timing, the probabilities of incompletion interception go through the roof because defensive backs can recover and they can make a play on the ball. So our quarterbacks receivers have to know if they're a rhythm route. Okay. They're the first option in the progression. All right. So you, this is critical for your guys. If I'm a rhythm route receiver, if I got a rhythm route, the quarterback is looking at me first and the quarterback needs to understand that as well. All right. So if we're uncapped, we're banging that seam in cover three. Right. If we're capped, then we can reset to another route. But these are some of the properties. So they break on the last step of the quarterback's drop about one point eight seconds. They're the first option in the progression and there are blitz weapon. OK, so what I want you to understand is if we're getting pressure and we're getting blitz, we're getting man coverage. This is our blitz. Right? We want to go to these styles of routes versus man. All right. So understand the value and the benefit of rhythm routes. All right. We have a rhythm corner, which we run off six steps. OK, our outside foot's back here. We're going to run off six steps. We're breaking to the back pylon. If we're inside the 25, we're breaking to the front pylon if we're beyond the 25. Right, it's a rhythm corner for us, not a read corner. A read corner would be at 12, 10 to, or 12 yards off more steps, and that would be a different type of, of route. All right, and then we have a post and a glance. There's really two types of rhythm posts. You have the skinny bang eight post at seven steps. The splash down for that's about 22 yards on the scene. And then you have a quick post we call a glance route that can snap flatter anywhere from 15 to 13 yards. All right, so we have two different types of posts in our offense, the skinny bang eight, and we also have the quick glance route that can snap flatter against certain coverages. All right. The last one is the fade or the go ball, depending on what you call that. That's originally run by an outside X receiver. And those are your five core families of rhythms. You have to master these if you want to be a good football passing team. All right. You have to be able to throw on rhythm and know where you're at in progression. Right. So we have to establish those first. All right. OK. Now, once those are understood and done, that's the rhythm family. I want to go to a subfamily in the rhythm family to make sure you understand, OK, why these still fit in the rhythm phase of the timeline. OK, so now let's look at the subfamily of rhythm routes. These are horizontal rhythms. All right. These attack horizontal space, but they still maintain. They still break open in one point eight seconds. OK, or less. All right. So these are these are still the first option in our progression. Right. Because they break. At one point eight seconds. OK, and there's still a great. OK. Blitz beater for us. All right. So if a defense is playing, OK, our line maybe doesn't hold up as well. We don't have a lot of time to get down to feel vertical. Maybe you don't have a lot of vertical speed. Maybe you're seeing soft zone with some zone pressures. These are great routes to go to to attack um, the defense. So. Every horizontal rhythm is the little brother of the vertical rhythm. So a sit route, usually used in a spacing concept, an eight-yard sit is going to still can still be thrown on rhythm. All right, a seven-yard spot route, typically by a tight end or a number two receiver over the ball, over the center, that's a great rhythm route, and that's the little brother version of the cross or the crash. That's a spot. That's a horizontal rhythm. OK, a speed out is like a corner that snaps flat. All right. Ten to 12 yards off the sixth step that attacks horizontal space. The corner attacks vertical space. So once you start getting into, if you get a really good quarterback receiver, they can read. All right. The cap of a defender. So if that corner is falling off cap in the corner, he can win back horizontal space underneath and snap it. We say if they cap it, snap it. So there's certain routes will give the receiver the ability to adjust post snap. 
um, the corner and the post are two of the most common, and we want to make sure those routes are breaking in the same direction. We don't we don't give our receivers the ability to go from a corner to a post, all right? But we can we can have them break in the same direction, all right? Uh, a glance route could snap uh, to a what we call a speed dig, we, or some some people call it a speed glance. So that so you have the skinny the skinny glance, and then if he's capped, he can snap and attack horizontal space there. That's still a rhythm. And then the fallout, the back shoulder fade at seven yards, that's still a horizontal rhythm that we can throw on the last step of your drop. So the main takeaway here is now, if I can get good at the rhythm route family, because that allows me, one, to throw at the last step of my drop. So if my protection's not good, I should still be hit the last step and get these out. And I should know how to win the best space because if there are capping vertical space, I need to go to this subfamily and call concepts that have these rhythm horizontal breaks. All right, so that's one of the main things we do in game planning. We're seeing a lot of teams capping vertical space. We'll call concepts that have horizontal rhythms, and we'll start there or we'll flip it vice versa. All right, let's go to the next family. We'll go a little quicker now and get to some film. Okay, the next family of routes is read routes. Okay, and so we're defining these for our receiver. And quarterbacks. All right. So let's talk about read routes. Here's the five main read routes in football, all right, that every team throws from the NFL all the way down. Okay, let's talk about read routes. These are horizontal read routes. Okay, horizontal. All right. Most read routes are ho attack horizontal space. Right. Any good concept, you're gonna have a deep rhythm route, you're gonna have an intermediate read route, you're gonna have a rush route underneath, all right, creating stretches, vertical stretches. All right, so the, the why, why are read routes, okay, classified different than rhythm? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is they're the second option in a progression. Why are they the second option? Because they break open when? They break open in 2.2 or it could be 2.6 seconds based on the depth of the route or the speed of the receiver. So that's why we can never look at these first. A lot of quarterbacks will make the mistake, and this is all the way at the NFL level, the dig route is the most intercepted ball in the NFL, okay? And when you study the dig clips that are intercepted in the NFL, the main reason why those dig routes are intercepted is because the quarterback is dropping back and he's staring that dig route the entire way. What should the quarterback do? The quarterback needs to look for a rhythm route elsewhere and then reset back to it so he didn't take linebackers or safeties to the dig space. And so we have to understand how these puzzle pieces fit together. We never want to stare at a read route first because it takes longer to develop. Find something I can hit on rhythm or evaluate on rhythm, create space for the dig elsewhere, and then come back to it just before it breaks open. All right, so the second option on progression, they break at 2.2 or 2.6 seconds. They're your chain mover, right? Okay, your chain mover or your zone beater, all right? These are best versus zone coverage. They can still hold up in man, but they're best versus zone. All right, so we have a 12 to 15 yard dig, depending on how you teach it. Some people teach foot, fire, and stick to 12. I would prefer the speed cut to 15 to create more vertical space. All right, drag routes that go across the center line, they take longer to develop. You can't throw them until they mature past the center. So those are classified as a read route. They take 2.26 or 2.6 seconds to get open. Okay, cell routes. Cell routes are broken really at 12 yards or eight steps, and they round to 15. So those cannot be thrown on rhythm, All right? So we classify like a sail, or some people run the scissors concept with that corner that snaps to that cell space. That would be a read route because his stick is going to be longer than, than six steps. All right, curl routes. Curl routes go 12 back to 10. Comebacks go 14 back to, back to 12, All right? Another thing that you need to know about read routes is read routes, okay, are routes that have to decelerate a lot of times, okay? So anytime a route has to decelerate and then redirect space out of the break, it takes longer for it to develop. So that's another um, property of read routes. They have to decelerate or they're a double move, and I'll get to those double moves in a minute. Okay, so a double move route is classified as a read route because it's not going to break open until af after it incorporates the second stick. All right, so again, a lot of, of, of nuances there for of routes that make a read route family. Those are the horizontal read routes in football, the five key ones. Now, there's other ones, but once you understand the properties, you can now know where it fits. I'm just trying to give you the basic ones in football. All right, okay, now let's talk quickly about the vertical read routes, okay, in football. These are the fun ones the quarterback likes to throw, okay? Vertical read routes in football are double move routes, okay? So they're your shot plays against aggressive defenders, 
All right, so all of your vertical routes are those double moves. All right, so routes like a slant and go, okay, uh, corner post, post corner, uh, a hitch and go. We call it a buzz and go, an out and up, right? Those take longer than 1.8 seconds if you're really selling those double moves. And so we never want to stare those down typically. Um, a lot of times in man free, you stare it down, and that free safety will come over there and get in position if he's really good. So we want to try to look at a rhythm first and then reset back to that double move uh, typically. All right, so that's the subfamily of the read routes, okay? Those are the kind of the, the ones we like to throw those double moves. All right, let's get the last family and get to some plays. The last family of routes in football are the rush route family. Okay, let's talk about rush routes, okay? Rush routes, right? What makes a route a rush route? Well, if you look at all of these rush routes here, what I want you to understand about rush routes is rush routes can be a check down, okay, or a hot route. Okay, rush routes are universal, okay, on the timeline. What does that mean? They're, they have universal properties. They can be hit at any point, any point, all right, because they're always going to be there. They're going to break open immediately. So your quarterback needs to understand that I can throw rush routes, okay, any point in the timeline on my last step, okay, on a reset, on another reset. So it's a, it's a, it's a check down or it's a hot route. So what we tell our quarterbacks a lot of times, if you feel – the rush of the defense, okay? If you feel the rush, okay, throw the rush. Throw the rush route. Feel the rush, throw the rush, okay? Know where those are on the play and make it an eight. You feel the rush, boom, throw the hot route, okay? Otherwise, you come to the rush route after you hitch up twice, okay? I'm going to go for my rhythm route first, then my read, and then my rush, all right? So, again, that's the, the five key families of rush routes. Now, there's also a subfamily of rush routes that are run by the tailback position out of the backfield. So these are very important. I feel like, you know, using this is the, the most useful weapon that a lot of teams don't use in their offense. A lot of times they keep their tailback into protection. And I want you to go back and look at the times you keep your tailback into protection and see how well he did, okay, blocking that blitzer or helping that tackle. I would rather, okay, with all these sims and creepers and stuff, I would rather get my running back out as opposed to keep him in. He's the best athlete on the team. Let's get him in space and practice throwing him hot if we feel that pressure. So here's the five key routes, um, rush routes that we run with our running back. We have a swing where he goes to the sideline. The shoot route is a very good one against it outside pressure because it looks like he's going to block that nickel backer off the edge or maybe that will, and then he's going to slip and get past and you can throw him in the flat. And then hook route is a very go in the Patriots use a lot. If you go back to Tom Brady's days, they throw a ton of hook routes um, where he kind of arcs around and then settles at five yards just outside the tackle. The angle route is a West Coast staple. You look at Sean Payton and Drew Brees back in the day and Alvin Kamara, they make a living with those angle routes. Um, you look at Kyle Shanahan, the 49ers with uh, McCaffrey, they do a ton of angles. And then you obviously have the tailback wheel, which is an awesome route in football especially when you get a, a running back matched up on a linebacker. So, again, you have to practice these rush routes as well and get good and understand the timing element of those. They can be a hot route or a check down. All right? Okay, now let's get to some rules, okay? I want to talk about once we establish the five families of routes in football, okay, I want you to think about this. And I'm going to tell you a little story here, all right? I have a four uh, – uh, my son's turning four uh, – tomorrow. So we have a big four-year-old birthday party. We've been working on his letters with him for a year. Okay. And now we're working on his, his phonetic sound. So now you can look at an A and you can say, ah, ah, ah. B is buh, buh, buh. C is cut, cut, cut. And he'll, well, he's working the sounds because we're trying to teach him to read. What I just went over with you is your alphabets. Okay. For routes. It's your phonetic sounds. Your quarterbacks and receivers have to understand the picture. They see a scene. They see a fade. They see a corner on a playbook. Right. They know, OK, the properties, the sound that it makes, the space and time requirements it makes on the field. That's the first layer of getting your players to understand conceptual football. All right. Once they master the sounds, once my son now has mastered the sounds. So like last night, we're doing exercise. OK, I had a word on there. So I had a word. OK, um, I said, Tizer, OK, what's this word? And so he went, buh, eh, t, right? Bet, all right? So he can say that, all right? Now, Tizer, okay, pronounce this word. Buh, 
eh, eh, tch. It's the same to him, but it's not the same, all right? Any time that I put two letters, two E letters, I get a long E. That's beat, not bet. So now the next phase of this, and this is the, the hardest hurdle to jump to teach your kid to read a book, and the hardest jump for your quarterbacks and receivers to get to learn is what are the rules when I pair different routes together? All right, so that's the next layer. So we have three rules, okay, just like you have rules in reading. They're called sight words, right? You have rules that your kids have to learn to understand they make a different sound when they're paired together. So here's an example of how we do that with our football players, okay? The first rule is what we call the two rhythms rule. I have a fade and a seam side by side, all right? My quarterback is inside here. He's looking left. These are two rhythm routes. Well, what's the initial rule of the rhythm route? It has to be hit on the last step of the drop, right? But when you put two rhythm routes side by side, you can treat the next one as a read because if you rhythm the tight end down the seam and he is capped by this safety, you've now held him in place long enough to throw this outside fade off a reset step as a read route, as a read phase. So that's the two rhythms rule. What's the two rhythms rule? Okay, All right, any two rhythms side by side or two rhythms that cross okay like a scissors concept or like a vertical switch all right you can now treat one of them as a read route all right typically we like to treat their inside one as the rhythm and the outside one as the read all right so that's the two rhythms rule and here's common combinations in which those are used Right? It's a very important rule. It's like having two E's side by side when you're trying to pronounce beat. It's not bet, it's beat. Okay, so different words. Okay, so that's one that you're going to want to master. That's used a lot on four vertical, vertical switch, double post, and scissors concepts and floods. All right, let's go to the next rule. Okay, well, before we get to that, let's look at uh, let's look at the concept here. Okay, let's put this together and then we'll get to the next rule. All right, so let's just take four vertical. Four vertical is a day one install for us. All right, so let's kind of put this all together, all right? So we run four vertical. Our base way of install is doing it out of trips, out of three by one, all right? So we want our rhythm route to be the number three receiver, all right? He's the rhythm, right? Why? Because he's tacking the middle. This is our blitz beater. If we get any kind of blitz, interior blitz, we're throwing that hot, okay? We call that the crash route. We always anchor our eyes on that space first, and if it's uncapped, we hit it on rhythm. Now let's talk about the two rhythms rule. Any two rhythm routes side by side, the other one can be treated as a read. So this fade route is a read route for us because it's side by side. So if this boundary safety caps the crash route, I could go to the X because he's one on one with the corner and I can throw that off a reset because my rhythm route is holding him in place. All right. So that's one way that we can navigate that progression. All right. We have our number two receiver. He's the same read. Right. So if you're a seam read, you're not a rhythm route. You're a read route. That means that you could break down the seam. But if you're capped, you can snap it to the dig. Some teams allow him to go to the post. We just give him a dig or a seam on day one install. OK, so our quarterback will always rhythm the crash. He'll read the seam and then he would rush the tailback on the shoe route in the flat. That's our base day one progression. That's all we allow our quarterback to do. And then once we get into different coverages and rotations, we can give our quarterback the freedom. Hey, if you feel this boundary safety cheating across the hash, let's we're always rhythming the crash on four vertical. Always. So even if it's not there, we're holding defenders in place to create one-on-one -on -one matchups elsewhere. Then we can reset to the outside fade. And if I knew I was going to do that projection, uh, that progression, I would probably put my running back as a check release to that side so he has a nice, easy rush route check down if this, the fade is capped. Now, we allow our outside guys, again, to not run into brick walls. So if they're capped on the verticals, they can fall out for comebacks. They're a read route, right? They're a read route. So that means they have the ability to adjust breaks because we're coming to them later in the timeline. So we can read how they're breaking based on the defense. So that's a simple way of how we're putting in the two rhythms rule into four vertical. Okay, I want to talk about two more rules, and then we'll show some film of this, of these clips here, of spring ball for us, right? Okay, the next rule that we want to discuss here, okay, is what we call the rhythm side rule. Remember, we're just, this is the same thing that you would use if you were teaching a, a four-year-old to read, all right? 
And it's the different rules um, in reading when two different letters are paired together. All right. Okay. So what's the rhythm side rule? Okay. The rhythm side rule states that any combo of rhythm, rush, or rush, rush route. So if it's two quick game concepts or two quick game routes, like double slants, maybe a slant flat, that's two rush routes, that can be used as a rhythm side. Or if it's a rhythm corner and maybe a rush route combination, like a quick out or a fade out, those can be treated as a rhythm combination. Your quarterback should be able to drop back and process this space on rhythm. They should be able to see both if they know how to position their eyes we call it anchoring between those two route breaks. Okay. And what that allows us to do, it allows us to gain that full field read advantage. All right. And I'll show you some examples of that when we get to the film, but we call this the rhythm side rule. It allows us now to bring two routes together with one visual scan. All right. So any combination of a rhythm and rush route or a rush and rush route side by side, we should be able to process that space in one picture and hit that on rhythm. And if those are capped, then we reset elsewhere and find a read route, All right? That's the rhythm side rule, okay? This is used heavily in the Y cross concept, All right? We use it a lot in other different concepts, but this, this rhythm side rule is used heavily, all right, in the Y cross concept. I mean, every team in the country at every level runs Y cross. I mean, at least, I mean, it's like the first uh, play in most playbooks, right? Okay, so here's how we, we evaluate and process our progression of Y cross using, okay, the rhythm side rule. We have a fade and an out, okay? So this quarterback knows that this is a rhythm and rush. This is a rhythm side combination. So on the drop, I can drop back and I can process, right, which route I like, right? If it's a hard cover too, right, both these might be capped pre-snap by alignment so I can get off quicker and get back to my read cross route. We give our cross runner, he's a drag, or he can stem vertical down the field and it gets too high safety look. We give him the ability to change right, his break based on the post-snap cap of the defense. So we need time to let that develop. All right, so our quarterback would reset to the cross, okay, or he could reset all the way to the backside dig if he, wanted, if he saw that was better space. So we have two read routes. We have that dig, or we have that cross, and then obviously the tailback's the rush route, okay? So that's how we fit a full field scan using R4 in the rhythm side rule. Right? If your quarterback doesn't like the rhythm side pre-snap, he can just catch the ball, give a little peek to get that safety to make a hold there, and now reset his eyes faster so he has more processing time for the cross route or the dig. All right, that's the rhythm side rule. We got one more, then let's get to film. Okay, the last rule, okay, the last rule for our route families when they're paired together, okay, is what we call the three quicks rule. All right, what's the three quicks rule, okay? The three quicks rule is any group of rhythm or rush routes, okay, that are linked together, that are like all side by side together, all right, can be aligned Okay, in a rhythm, read, and rush progression. All right, the key here is that your quarterback must adjust his footwork. All right, this is the key for the rhythm side rule. Okay, so like a lot of teams run spacing concepts. They'll run a spot route, which is a horizontal rhythm over the, over the center. That's a rhythm route. Well, the sit is also a rhythm. An eight-yard sit is also a rhythm, okay? Well, we can treat that as a read if we speed our footwork up. So a lot of times when we're working a quick game concept using the three quicks rule, we'll just catch the ball and either take a two-step drop or maybe a quick three, and now I can reset and hit this sit route as it's breaking open. Or if I just drop back and took like a normal punch three-step drop or a quick five like I'm throwing an intermediate pass, this stick route or this sit route would already have matured and the defenders are going to be all over it. So anytime I use the three, three quicks rule, three rhythms or rush combinations side by side, I have to speed my footwork up and use a one step or two step drop 
to get through these three routes before they mature. All right, that's the key. So you got to shrink your timeline so you can fit all three in a one, two, three progression, which we call rhythm read rush. All right, so double slant and a flat would be another example. We'd make the inside slant the rhythm, the outside slant the read, and the arrow the rush route. Okay, a stick concept. This is a great one for stick concepts. All right, we treat this as a rhythm side. Why can I treat this as a rhythm side? Well, I have three routes here that are rhythm and rush in nature. So all those are gonna break open in 1.8 seconds or less. So I can now see on the drop which one of these I like and then reset backside to a glance or a wheel, all right? But I have to speed my footwork up. Your quarterback, when he's using the three quicks rule and trying to fit this full field scan in, he has to take a one step or two step drop for the rhythm side and then reset back quicker or else he's gonna be late to the party and the breaks have already occurred. And I'll show you that in film on a day one install. All right, so that's the three families. All right, so again, we've covered a lot, okay? But that's the thing about it is you really got to, and it's just like teaching my four-year-old read. We're really working. I mean, you put a lot of time into it, all right? And you can get frustrated. But I promise you, if you stick with it and get your quarterbacks and receivers on the same page and they can understand the DNA of routes in football, the, the productivity will exponentially grow over time. You just got to work through the muddy water. And this is the, the really the, the key part of that. All right, let's get to some film here. I want to show you some film, and then we'll close for any questions that you have. All right, so let's look at some film. So we're going to go over the four vertical first, okay? So let me, let me pull this up here. All right, so we're working a four vertical concept. Out of three by one. Okay. So again, what are we looking at here? Okay. Here's our number three receiver. He's got the rhythm crash. We always lock in on him first. Here's our seam read. So he's going to have a seam, or if he's capped, he's going to have a dig. Our outside receivers are working fade reads. All right. So if you remember the picture that I showed you, okay, this is our rhythm, right? Our base progression is we're going to go to the seam read as our read, and then our tailback's working a shoot in the flat as our rush route. All right. That's our base day one. Um, progression install and our quarterback actually got to some day two stuff here as well. I want to show this first and show you some things that, that show up on film. So let's watch the clip here. Okay. So we're eyeing on the rhythm route first. Okay. Let's look at the rhythm crash route by number three. Okay. See how he's breaking this route flat. He doesn't understand. Okay. The DNA and design of a rhythm route, the rhythm route. Okay. From a crash route is a locked route. He doesn't have the variability to snap this to different space, okay? He actually will create space elsewhere if he just maintains that vertical path 18 to 22 yards, and we've got to hold that boundary safety. So these are the growing pains they're going to go through. We're going to take Gino right here on film next day. Listen, you're the rhythm crash route. You are locked. You have to at all costs get to this 18 to 22 yard mark, and if you're not open, guess what? Your boy, your boy is, all right? So that's what he should be doing there. The quarterback's eyes, you can see, are already off to the seam read because he sees he's capped by that boundary safety, all right? Now, I want to talk about the next thing that you're going to go with with your kids, all right? I want you to watch the number two receiver here, okay? Let's look at the number two receiver, all right, right here. All right? What we teach our players on vertical routes, okay, we teach them what we call the four-yard rule, all right? What's the four-yard rule? OK, this is how you teach anticipation for your quarterbacks and receivers. If we can get within four yards of a defender and his hip angle is square to the line of scrimmage, we are going to be able to uncap that. This this should be a same. He should know based on the four yard, the rule, we're inside four yards of cushion. Hips are square. If I'm at full speed, there's no way this guy can cover me unless the quarterback throws late. All right. So that's what we should be doing here. This is, again, day one install. Right, so our, our receiver is still running into dig. Now we still catch it, but look how tight that window is. Look if we just keep running the seam. Right, so those are common things that you're going to run into with your kids. So a lot, a lot we're working here. Here's the next play. The next time we run four vertical, I want you to notice the difference now. Okay, so again, let's go through the the uh, play here. Working four vertical out of three by one. So we got a crash, a rhythm crash. We've got the seam read. Okay, now our receiver is going to use that four yard rule. Let's watch the quarterback. It's going to look at the rhythm crash first, okay? Rhythm crash, that's capped by the safety. All right, now he's going to the receiver, all right? Four-yard rule now. Now he's using it. 
okay? We're within four yards. His hips are still square. That is uncapped. So this is a better job of this receiver and quarterback of throwing this seam. I'd like to see that ball down a little lower. We're getting zone coverage there. And so we've got to make sure um, that we get it to splash down a little sooner, but we're able to catch the touchdown. All right, so that's just a quick clip on day one install of a receiver understanding that four-yard rule uh, within two plays. All right, let's look at another four vertical concept. This is where we get to the secondary progression on four verticals. So I talked to you about this um, when we were looking at the slides. Now we have our tight end on the crash. Okay, we have our seam read by number two, right? We have the fade read outside. And then we have our backside X receiver on the fade read as well. Okay, our quarterback now is electing because we were getting a lot of rotation post-snap. They're trying to disguise and rotate. We're getting a lot of rotation and we were getting a hard cap on the crash route. So that ensures a one-on-one -on -one backside with our X receiver, who's our best player. Okay, so let's look at this secondary progression you can go to if you're getting safety rotation there. So there's the safety rotation. The quarterback sees it on the drop. He sees that the crash is capped. All right, so now he's going to reset, okay, and he's going to the outside X receiver, okay? So I want you to watch some things. Here's some nuances we'll do with our really good guys, okay? So with our really good receivers, our veterans, we don't do this with sophomores, juniors, unless they're elite. But this kid's going to be a senior, a three-year starter. So when he's a read route, he knows that he has more time to set up the defenders, he knows that the quarterback's not looking at him first. So now he can change and adjust his stem. So he'll do what we call a 3-5 stem, meaning that he's going to come off in third gear, and usually a DB is going to match your speed, right? So he's going to come off in third gear, and then when he hits five, he's going to burst to fifth gear, and that DB is going to think he's going to try to beat him deep. So he's out of there, and now we come back, and we create more space on the comeback. So these are like next level things that you can get to when your receiver has a lot of experience with the basics. So watch this X receiver up top. He's going to work the third fifth, third gear off the ball, and then you'll see the burst of fifth gear, and then look at the space he creates on the comeback. Okay, and we're able to get that one-on-one -on -one matchup. All right, so again, that's a day one install for us. That's how we use R4 to navigate through a four vertical concept, and there's some rules that we use with our receivers, that four-yard rule to know if we're going to go vertical or if we need to snap that read route off flat. All right, let's go to our next play here. Let's go to our Y cross, okay, our Y cross play. All right, so here we're in two by two, okay, and I'm going to talk to you about how we run our Y cross. We don't use a fade out a lot because we're on a high school hash, and so the spacing is very tight on a high school hash um, in Oklahoma. So we, we do a bow concept. We run this number two receiver, fifth, what we call a 15 by five. He goes 15 yards deep and five yards from the sideline, and his aiming point is to run right through that field corner. He is aiming right through that upfield shoulder, that corner. And what that does, it provides a bodyguard for this five by one. It's an extended hitch to the sideline. We call that the five by one. Okay, we call the two man combo a bow concept. All right, we're going, that's a bow concept. We're bowing into the boundary, right? That's our rhythm side. Okay, that's our rhythm side. Remember, what's a rhythm side rule? I've got a slot fade and a hitch, a rhythm and rush route paired together. I can evaluate that whole concept with one eye fix. All right. So that's what we're looking at first here. Let's look at the rhythm side bow concept, right? The quarterback is reading that corner, right? That corner is backing up. And the reason why he's really retreating is because that tight end, he should be working even more of a path to him. And we're just throwing that off a just one step drop. So you see the quarterback, he knows it's going to be there. He's just taking a sliding one step drop. He's adjusting that toolbox, right? He can see that corner soft. They're playing cover eight or palms coverage. He knows they're going to play soft if number two goes vertical. And so he's just going to catch, slide, and pop that five by one and take the easy throw and move the chains there. Okay, so that's the first clip. Let's look at the second clip, okay? All right, so this is Y cross on the right hash. All right, so let me draw the routes for you. Okay, so we still got that bow concept, right? That's our rhythm side. And then now we got two read routes. We've got the Y cross, and then we've got the big dig behind it and the tailbacks, the shoot route. So we got our rhythm, we've got two reads, and then we've got our rush route. Okay, so that's how the quarterback is navigating through the concept. Okay, so pre-snap, he is looking for the bow. Okay, he doesn't like it because we're getting a hard corner, but he's still going to look at it. 
Okay, what I told our quarterback here is he should have got his eyes off of this faster. So anytime that you see a hard cover two look right here, right, with the safety six, seven yards outside the hash, they have capped those two routes. Let's get our eyes back here to the Y cross and dig space faster so we have a chance to get to the better spacing. Okay, so that's, again, day one. So he's resetting backside, and he's hitting that dig just a step late, right? He should be there a little quicker. All right, okay, so that's how we use R4 for the Y cross concept. Okay, let's look at the last one here, and then we'll close for questions. All right, this is our stick concept, okay? So this would be a three quicks rule, all right, the three quicks rule. Okay, so I got a stick, I've got a quick out and a fade, right? So I'm going, that's going to be my rhythm side, right? So I'm going to look at your pre-snap, where's my best matchup or my best spacing? A lot of times it's the tight end on a mic backer, right? Okay, I have a potential nickel blitz off the edge here, so I basically want to be ready to throw that stick hot with inside leverage on the mic. Okay, that's my rhythm side. My read side is this five-step glance. Now, why do we run a glance as opposed to a slant? Because we are coming back to this off a reset. The quarterback, remember, anytime he uses the three quicks rule, he must accelerate his footwork. Right, he has to use a one-step OK, or a two step drop so we can get backside here for the read glance or the rush will. OK, if we just ran a slant, the slant's going to break too fast and it will already have developed before we can get back there. OK, so that's how we we bring this in, in together. Right. So, again, there's the quarterback he's taking a two step drop. Right. And he's popping the stick route to the tight end. That was our best matchup. We've got nickel pressure off the edge. So we want to be throwing into that feel the rush, throw the rush. You can see if we didn't have pressure, right, we could have reset backside. And now on the reset, we had been able to hit that glance on that seam if we'd had time for that. All right, and then he could have reset to the will. All right, so that's how we feel full field concepts. The beauty of the three quicks rule is I can attack, again, that stick concept design, I can attack the entire field. All right, and I, that's the, the goal for us in our offense. We never want to be pinned down in a hole where we can only go to one space. And if that's not there, we're stuck. And that's what R4 gives you. All right, here's another example of the stick concept, and then we'll close for questions. All right, so we got a stick by the tight end. We've got the quick out by two fade. That's our rhythm side. We've got our backside five step glance and our wheel. So we're going to rhythm, okay, the field side. And then pre snap, there's a lot of processing here. You know, he's looking for his best matchup or leverage, you know, based on those two routes. Very rarely are we throwing to number one, um, but we have a quarterback this year that can make that throw, so we could bring that online. But Typically, he's there just to run him off. And then our backside glance is the read route. The main thing that we got to remember, we're working quick game here using three quick school. It's a one or a two step drop. So we can reset backside before the routes break. All right. So let's look at it here. Watch the quarterback. Okay. He's going to catch the snap. Okay. You see, he's taking that sliding one step. He's looking for the stick and the quickie. Those two are capped. Right. So you can see just by the first step of the drop. Now he's already backside to that glance space. And by taking that sliding one step right now, I can reset and bang that glance right in the pocket there against the seam. Guys, our defense is dropping eight guys every time. So, I mean, if you're completing the ball against the drop eight coverage, right, that's pretty good football. OK, so, again, that's just a quick example of how we do a day one or week one install. So we just finished week one today. And the things I cover with you are the stuff that we cover with our players. And, and hopefully you're seeing some of those uh, benefits matriculate here in the video. Coach, any questions uh, from the guys? I can't hear you, Coach. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Coach, uh, uh, Coach Ball down in St. Petersburg said, great stuff, Coach. Hal Reeser said, awesome, amazing, thank you. If anybody's got anything, put it in. The comments for coach, but you, coach, I've heard you a lot. But this might be my favorite uh, presentation you gave because you're coming right off the field, man. And I mean, <laughs> you're, I mean, you're like you you you're coaching it just like you are with your players. And I mean, yeah. I, I love it. And I hope I hope I mean we're all in the same boat. I mean, you you guys are struggling with the same thing I'm probably struggling with. And so every year you start to see the same patterns of issues. And so I think that's the beauty of the R4 is, is over, you know, we've this for 15 years, we kind of have a process to help you work through all those issues with your quarterbacks and receivers. So, um, Troy, I appreciate you having me on. Guys, if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, you can DM me at Coach Dub Maddox. 
Um, you can get on our website. We have a lot of products available. If you if you thought this was good and you want to go take a deep dive, yeah. all this is online. Um, again, I'm here for you. So appreciate you guys staying on and and hopefully we can see it see you again sometime. Yeah, thank you, Dub. Have a good weekend, my friend. Right, see you, Troy. Thanks, guys. You soon. See you.